Good morning, Mega. <laughs> How's everyone doing today? Good morning. We have 24 people, so we have actually more people today than we did on Wednesday. Oh. I mean, on Monday, because today is Wednesday. It's not Friday yet. <laughs> Almost Friday. So how did how many of you did your goal board yesterday? Raise your hand if you did your goal board. Amelia did, Stephen did, keep your hand up. Adam did, um, Meg did, Nock did. It sounds like most of you did your uh, goal board yesterday. So let's talk about that. Did that give you guys some clarity, give you some inspiration? How'd that go? Yes. Okay, so why yes? Um. So I made my goal board here. See, um, and um, my goal board, um, as I put in my chat, you know, inspired by my son, and then he's the one who drives me to really into real estate because he's so much into, he's, he loves to sketch and then do the floor plans and then play with the light switches. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I, I put a quote here, um, you know, like um, I always uh, ask him to remember that everyone has a mountain to climb and autism has not been my mountain. I It has been my opportunity to victory. Anything is possible. If I can do it, so can you. That's beautiful. Yeah. And I put top producers and then one millions and then never give up. <laughs> never get up relentless. Right, relentless, yes. So did this help you determine or crystallize in your mind what your value proposition is did this help you with your uvp of course yeah i know what i can bring to the table to uh, my prospect clients and everything yes i know what my value is so i'm hoping that for all of you and i want to hear a, a lot more from you from each of you a little bit about your own projects that you've done um that lisa helped you walked you through is to put these on the wall above your computer when you're making your calls. So wherever it is that you make your calls, wherever that is, whether it's in the office, whether it's at, how, at your home, put this above your monitor. So when you're looking up at the wall, when you're gonna make these calls, it immediately takes you back to your value proposition, to your why, why you're in this business, what you're trying to accomplish with your business so that you don't get sucked into a group think of today. So you don't get sucked into a mentality of um, what's going on in today's market or what's going on with the interest rates or feeling defeated because we're going from one market change to another and you really liked the old market and you don't know what the new market's gonna look like and you're mad because we're going through a transition. If you think about yourself as a full-time professional real estate for the next 15, 20, 30 years, let's just say that, even if you're only going to be in the business five more years, you're going to see several market changes because every new season comes a new market. With each new year comes its own challenges, its own opportunities, and we have to figure out what those opportunities are and focus our efforts on them because there's always opportunities. And if we're always looking for the opportunities, then we're focusing on income producing tasks. We're focusing on a win scenario for ourselves and we're focusing on positivity, which is important. We would love to go back three years ago where interest rates were zero, that's gone. But three years before that, the interest rates were seven. So from seven to zero to seven, well, hello, we see lots of changes with the coming seasons. And, and we're in the middle of a season that's changing right before our eyes. And with every single change, we see a whole subset of real estate agents jumping out of the business because they're not prepared to see through it. Sometimes they get inside of a tunnel and they can't see. They're right in the middle of the tunnel and they look in both directions and they can't see the light in either direction. And the light in both directions should be your goal board, your why what you're trying to accomplish with your business. And Michelle LaFortune brings a lot of that to the table with her Buffini class, because we're trying to reiterate in your mind that we're building a referral-based business and our clients are the business. The market's not the business. 
The people are the business. Your clients are the business. Picking up the phone and having conversations with your client is the business. And more importantly, when you're having those conversations with the clients, if we are in a transition, they're looking for leadership. They're looking for guidance. They're looking for someone who can hear, see through the noise and figure out where we are with this market and give them the ability to see through it as well. That's my job to you, and that's your job to them. And so your goal board helps you have more roots in the profession and also never forgetting your why so that you don't get lost in the tunnel, not knowing which way to go and feeling defeated and start looking for an exit strategy because that's not necessary. It's going to be very difficult for anyone to leave this profession to another profession that will earn more money than this one. If you're focusing on the right things in this one, if real estate is conducted properly, it is very difficult to find another profession that's going to earn you more money. And if your goal right now is to earn more money, that option is available to you, focusing on the right things. So I really believe with all of my heart that your goal boards is a very important part of your business. Three things occurred. You sat down and you materialized your thoughts. And you spent a, a good amount of hours thinking about what it is that you want. You grabbed a pair of scissors, you cut this out of a magazine, and you taped it to a board. There is a physical manifestation going on there with your thought and your actions. And now you take this board and you put it on the wall. And now you have a physical manifestation of your dreams and your goals. And as we know from our very famous uh, Mr. Einstein, in everything you do, consider the end. And if you're continually thinking about where you want your business to go, then you're continually building. Remember what I always say about the second law of thermodynamics, everything decays. And once decay sets in, it continues decay. So once building stops, decay begins. So you can never stop building your building, your business. You have to continually be building all the time. And that's business systems, and that's processes, and that's lockboxes, and it's keys, and it's marketings, and it's social media. The moment you stop building your social media a platform, decay sets in. The moment that you stop uh, building your listing presentation, decay sets in. And so we can't just get into the idea that, okay, I like systems and processes, and I can build one set of processes in 1985, and in 2024, I'm still using those same processes. That doesn't work. You will have decayed since then. And so we have to continually be educating ourselves, continually be keeping ourselves focused and on track and prospecting and talking with our people. But the one thing that will never go away, the one thing that's the resounding underline for your entire profession to keep decay from coming to your accounting department is marketing yourself to your clients. And that means having wholesome conversations with your spheres, picking up the phone and calling them. Now, how many of you read the article I sent you guys yesterday? You're like, wait, you sent me an article yesterday? You did? Sneaky guy, I didn't know. How many of you saw my article? All right, Stephen, did you have an opportunity to read it? No. All right, is, did anyone read my article? Okay, it is in our team's group, and it's amazing. It says that right now, the technology that many, many people, more than 50% of people are going after, it's going to blow your mind. What does it say in the Teams group? Stephen, what is this? What is the title? Flip phones. What? What? Read the, let's read the whole title. It says flip phone, flip phone sales are surging as folks seek connection without distraction. I want you to oh yeah, I read that. <laughs> I want you guys to read that entire article because it is so relevant to you in your business right now. It says that people are people need connection right now. People need to feel connectivity and a phone call drives that connectivity 
checking in with someone. People, there is so much noise. There is so much apps. There's so much fake everything. There's so much plastic that people are needing some interconnectivity, but they need people, they, they need that connectivity. And you are in the one profession that builds connectivity. Real estate builds communities. Picking up the phone and calling all your people, how are you, and taking them through the Ford script. F, family, how are you, how's the family? O, occupation, how's everything going at work? R, recreation, I was on Facebook and saw you guys went to Hawaii, how was your trip? And where are you guys going for your next vacation? Dreams. I'm just calling to check in on you. Hope everything is going really well with you guys. I'm just going to call in a couple of months to check in with you guys. And, and by the way, if you if you guys hear anyone talking about real estate, please call me because I want to make sure they get with someone that's going to take care of them. Your, your referral would mean the world to me. And then you're on your next call. And you've all done that. And you all got over the terrifying, uh, scary feeling of picking up the phone and calling that because all of you said, I'm afraid to call the people I know. It seems self-serving to make of those calls. And then as you start doing it and you realize that it's not about extracting leads from them, it's about giving them connectivity. It's about loving on them. It's about checking in on them, which gives them do dopamine and serotonin. And then at the end, and remember, I care about you and your family and I wanna be able to help your family and friends too, because I care about you and all your friends. Send them to me so we can make sure that they're well taken care of and then you're on to your next call. And all of that connective tissue is just deepening that relationship. And no, it can't be text message. And it can't be behind Instagram. Because that's not connectivity. That is a presentation. Because they're not interacting with you in a real way. So your goal board up on your wall every day when you're making your calls. So when you're having conversations with people that we go about those calls in the right way. But also... When we are making those calls, like it says in that article, it says, don't make those calls when you're stressed. Don't make those calls when you're in back-to-back -back meetings and you've got 13 seconds to make a call and you rush them through it because that does no good. All you do is call them and expose them to the whirlwind stress of your day, and that's not going to be a productive call. So you have to have a productive call. Every time I get a mega, the same person calls me. It's like a curse. Um, you have to be able to be in the right mindset and in the right mode to make your calls. So that's why we wake up early, we grab our fingers and we do the 10 things we're grateful for and we do our grateful exercise when we wake up. We do our stretches and do a little bit of yoga, have our cup of coffee, and then we jump on the phones and look at our goal board and with through positivity and positive energy, we're talking to people and then we're extracting referrals. Remember, you have 100 conversations and you have four closings because those conversations are going to bring you leads. So who do you call? Everyone. How many calls a day? 10 in the morning, 10 in the afternoon. This is the connective tissue that will reinvent your business, that will put you on a road for consistent income and make you the, the million dollar producer that you need to be that you've promised yourself that you will be, which is why you got this license in the first place. Michelle. Oh my God, I'm so glad you shared that. It's so important. Uh, the thing I have the hardest time is making my call. But when it comes to end writing note, I'm very good. And what I suggest to people is it's okay to do end writing note because people do not expect that. And you follow up with a call. If it's hard for you to call, you know, that's the way to do it. And I just want to show you like what I did. Uh, obviously, this is, oh, let me on Blair. Like I know I Blair my screen. Um, sorry about that, guys. I really want to share that message. Um, anyway, let me talk because I know we got a lot to cover today. I did a writing note, okay, and it is like, here's to an exciting summer 2024 filled with adventure and a July 4th that sparkle with freedom and firework. And what I did is I, I got like some uh, 
uh, some tattoo for their children. If they are children, I just slide it like right in a note card. That way, when I called, I said, hey, did you get my card? Hey, did the kid enjoy the tattoo? Then you have an open line then, you know, and everybody loves that. And I also, I was gifted by Buffini note card with like uh, the, 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 the picture on the note card was like popsicle with the Canadian flag inside. <laughs> and I was just like, I took all my Canadian because I do have a lot of Canadian clients and I send that with Happy Canada Day and, you know, wishing them a great summer. And that's a, an open line. Thank and you. I also got Canadian tattoo. <laughs> I have to tell you, I find it like on Amazon. But anyway, uh, I'm 100, 100% I agree in agreement with you how important it is to follow up. And I'm very, very strong within writing note, but I need to work on my call. Thank you, Michelle, for your comments. I appreciate that. Um, we all have to hold each other accountable for making our calls. That is a major component of our business, if not the most important component of our business. We are a salesperson. What our what we sell is our service our clients are our lifeblood of our business and if we are waiting for the phone to ring our business will fail if we are waiting for people to come to us and ask us for their help our business is going to fail if we haven't asked someone for the business we don't deserve it and if we are too busy to prospect, then we are going to find ourselves in a business that is not producing income. We can be very, very busy with no income. And that's not a place you want to find yourself because if you're very, very busy with no income, that means your stress levels is going to increase and your frustration is going to increase. If you're very, very busy and you have a lot of income, this business becomes more and more enjoyable because you see and you can reap the rewards from your hard work and that that adds to quality of life and legacy and all the things that you're going after. And I'm going to continue sharing articles with you about the power of communication, the power of conversation the power of voice, and the power of the circle that you have that's the six degrees of connectivity. Every person you know knows someone else, and that person knows someone else, and that person knows someone else. And the more spheres that you're allowed to enter, the more people you're allowed to be uh, in your business because people uh, trusted you with their spheres is going to widen the breadth of your client base and bring more income into your business. So then what are things that we should be filling our time? We should be going to city council meetings and getting that information and sharing it because we are a leader and leaders lead. So if we're going to be on the phone and having conversations with our people, that's part of leadership because they're going to want to know what's going on in the market. Real estate is 20% of GDP. One fifth of our entire economy is sitting on top of real estate sales. That is the biggest um, under mind blowing thing when you realize that everyone has questions about real estate. And if they're getting their information from the news, they're getting the wrong answer because that is about six months ago. Because once it shows up on the news, that's old news. Because the 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 reports that come out for them to come up with those numbers are already we're already in a different market. And we can feel the change real time by how many people are showing up to our open houses, how many people are calling, inquiring on listings. I can tell you what the market is right now today, but the news is going to tell you what the market was six months ago. They're always behind because they are looking at reports based on closings, um, not based on showings at open houses. So we see a different market than they see. So as a leader, we have to be looking for the opportunity. We have to be looking at our goal boards and finding inspiration. We have to have a very good clarity in our brain of where we're taking our business and calling your people. And if you're not calling them every single day, and if you don't have 
hard coded in your schedule for time management for calling every single day. You're failing yourself. All right, I want to see and hear about more about your goal boards. And thank you for sharing. Who else wants to share about your goal board and some inspiration that you got from it? Knock. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, Jack. So hey. my in inspiration is how to do with my family. A everything I do, I my goal is to take my kids have a lifetime travel. My husband and I, we both love to travel around the world. And then we feel that cultures and the impact, it, it, it will raise a better kid to prepare them for the better wars. So everything in my, the first thing that I did, I put family first. I put C for Gandu, Gandu family and then the word first. And after that, I put the rest of the word that filled in. And I didn't know that the more I do it, I said, oh, wow, I can do this. So more words coming out and, and, and I feel like I'm, I'm ready to be the Wonder Woman, take on the word that's, <laughs> that's the person that I can be. <laughs> A million percent. I want to hear from Jamara. I want to hear from Meg. I want to hear from some more of you. Um, Jamara, you did your goal board. No, I did not. I'm sorry. Okay. No. I was working. I'm sorry. Okay, no problem. Um, you're going to do your goal board, yes? 100%? Okay. Meg? Um, I did mine, and yes. I had a lot of fun with it. Uh, but mostly for me, my goal board really... It's time I believe in myself again and my success. And so I made sure I put those words very prominently on my board, believe and success. And then this was just some really fun artwork in one of the magazines. And I think it was like this in the mm -hmm. magazine, but I saw it as me pulling people up. We're gonna get, get through this real estate success all together. And I'm gonna lift you up while we go along. Mm -hmm. So it was fun. We have to believe in ourselves. I had a lot of fun with the, everybody in the um, the boardroom mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. There may have been some champagne and wine involved, perhaps. I'm not sure, but we <laughs> had it. <laughs> um, I enjoyed watching you guys have fun with that. Um, it, you know, it, our business is what we make it, and we're going to materialize a business. You're putting so much work and time and energy into this. Um, and just by making a few small tweaks, you can, and, and by focusing on the right things and pushing some things out of your mind and your business completely, which are non-producing, um, non-producing um, distractions, non-producing income distractions uh, and getting those things out of the way so that we can focus on income producing wholesome things in our business is important, very important. And of course, not to attract a couple of buyers and then focus on those two buyers and stop prospecting altogether and get those to the closing table and come out the other side. If you do that, it is a cyclical cycle that comes in, you get those two to the closing table and it just feels like carrying rocks on your back. It just feels exhausting because you did all of this work to find two clients. You did all of this work to get them to the closing table. And then you got to the closing table and then you look up into the landscape and you got to start all over again. And it feels that way. It feels like you're starting all over again. Like, okay, God. All right. There's nothing in my pipeline again. I don't have any guarantee checks coming in. I'm sure this is all going to work out, but that feeling of stress pops up in your mind where you think to yourself, what am I doing? This is just this is just too much. But if you had just made a small tweak while you were helping those two people, you still sat down and made your calls every single day and you had another buyer that you were working, then as you're closing those other two, another buyer presented themselves and now you're working with them and they're the lifeline, they're the continuity, they are the income stream and the pipelines continually to stack, stack, up, uh, stack up so you never have to worry about where your next client comes from because your marketing department is never closed.
But if Dell computers were to market, 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 and then close their entire company, make one computer, ship it, and then open up their department again, they're going to have a really hard time finding success in that the sales department has to be open all the time. And the sales department is you making outbound calls and making connections in finding the opportunity in your spheres. Yes, leads come in. Yes, you can come in, make phone calls in our in our sales department, which I highly recommend. But your next closing is going to come from someone you already know. That is a statistic from NAR that is very important. Okay, just want to reiterate all that because you guys are doing really, really well. I want to see more representation agreements from you guys. And I know where that comes from. It comes from us calling our spheres. How many of you have made more than 20 calls this week? Sean, good job. How many of you have, uh, Dimitri, good job. Knock, did you have your hand raised? Yeah, good, thank you. Adam, good. If you haven't, how many calls should you have made by Wednesday? 60. Well, today would be, if you, if, if it was end of day today, it would be 60 by end of day. But we should have had, 40 calls done before we entered today. And then this morning, we should have made 10 calls this morning, and we should make 10 calls this afternoon. You have to force yourself. You have to hold yourself accountable. You know, days go by quickly. Mega goes by quickly. Imagine if an athlete was out there on the field, and he's halfway through the training season, but he's only shown up to two trainings. Your time on the field training is your calls. So please take this to heart. I see a lot of people go through mega. They get it. The light bulb comes on. They totally then understand what it takes to be a salesperson and they don't make the calls. That's a choice. You can get through this entire mega experience and come out the other side and if not made your calls, and be in the exact same place you were before Mega. How many of you took Mega because you wanted to increase your production? Okay. If you want that to happen, it's not just, I'm going to hear Jack talk for 84 hours and come out the other side and somehow do nothing different and expect a different result. We understand that we have to have a different set of actions if we want a different set of results. Yes, that's true. So are you encouraged and are you willing to make those calls? Is that something you're struggling with right now, the accountability? Raise your hand if you're struggling with the accountability of making your calls. Okay, all right. So let's talk about that for a moment. Let's spend the next 10 minutes talking about that as a group. What can we do to help you with that accountability? Here's an idea. When you start your week on Monday, maybe you used to try to figure out exactly who you're going to call that week. Oh, the, if you put your people in the CRM, it should tell you already who to call. How many of you have imported all your people in your CRM and loaded the smart plants? Raise your hand if you've done it. Okay. Have you hit the call button on everyone that you've added the smart? Jamara. Thank you. So I I have added everyone into my CXM, but I have no idea about adding a smart plan. I don't know how to do that. So, okay, good. This is important because one step was missed, uh, was left out. Um, Amy McAllister is going to, I get, hey, Lisa, what are you guys doing on your Thursday mega, mega mini? Well, actually, Jack, we're going over the color thing because we didn't have any time left to ourselves to do that this Tuesday because the okay. forms were way more important. So, yeah. Okay, I need to find a way for Amy McAllister to find herself on a one-on-one -on -one with most of you. Because there's simply... Hey, 
one button you have to click. Yes, and he has recorded her video, and I'm uploading it today. Ta-da! I remember back in uh, <laughs> 1985 when the computer Microsoft Windows 95 would turn on and would go ta-da when the computer turned on. Well, that was kind of what I just heard in my brain when um, Katie said that. So we're going to set that out to you because there's literally a single button you click. Once your people are in there, you can turn on the pipeline. You can turn on the action plans based on the pipelines. Do you have pipeline for new attempt to reach last chance incubate nurturing? And when you turn on the pipeline, poof, all of a sudden tasks appear. And you're like, oh, I see. And then you push the call button and then your phone rings and you answer your phone and it's calling your people. Um, and so it's super easy to, to, to operate. You just have a turn on the pipelines because we are not going to be so forward as to turn our pipelines on your people. That's some an action that you have to take. And all of a sudden it will generate the call tasks for you to start calling on a regular basis. So then you have less, it becomes less about who you're going to call and when, and becomes more about, I need more people in my database to call. Because once you've finished and you've caught up with all your pipelines, it's like, okay, I'm out of people. And all of a sudden the light bulb comes on. Oh, I need more people. Okay, I know there's more people in my text messages. Let me go through my text messages and start saving some of these people because I've got five years worth of text messages and maybe 1% of them I saved as a contact in my phone and I need to figure out where I can get all my people in one place. And then you start on that journey. Um, and maybe every day it's, I'm going to call um, five new people and every time I call them, I'm going to add them to the database. And I'm going to go through my cell phone and find these people. So... We have to hold each other accountable for this, um, and I'm going to put some thought into that and bring it to you on Friday. Um, we could have Amy come in the beginning of Mega Minis. I can play that video, and then she could just answer some questions because we'll have the whole Mega Mini for that, not vision boards. We had to split it up this time. So we should start with that because that is super important, and then do the color thing as a icing on the cake. I love it. Um, okay. Did someone say cake? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So here we are. I mean, when you look at this, what do you think? We, Mega is almost done. When, <laughs> we're going to have Mega today and Friday, and then next week in Mega, we'll be in the rear view mirror. Um, and so we have just a couple more megas to get through. Um, so I'm hoping that you guys are um, really, really focused on your um, making your calls. Let me open this because we're not going to do this quiz. Is there anybody in class right now that would like to do your paragraphs? your uh, 23 paragraphs. By the way, Camille did it at Mega Minis yesterday. In five minutes or less, who's gonna do it? No stress. <laughs> Anybody? The one is I did, we don't need to do it again, right? No. Nope. Okay. Anybody wanna do the Code of Ethics? Raise your hand if you're ready to do either the Code of Ethics or the 23 contract paragraphs. No takers. Okay, um, Adam, I see a thumb up and then a hand up. Are you ready to do it? Which one? Uh, 23. Let's Let do me it. Get my headset. I'm, I'm super excited about this. This is very cool. Hello, hello. Okay. Hello, hello. We hear you. Awesome. Hey, so if we do it backwards, do we get extra points or? I have not. We do, Jack. Is that a yes this time? <laughs> yeah, yes, it is. We're going to give the people who do it backwards an extra 500 points. What do you think uh, of that, Lisa? Okay, then I will go back and give some of you that have already done it backwards. <sighs> that so if I, if I do it both forward and backward, is it extra on top of that? Uh, if you do it forwards and backwards, you'll get the points for forwards and backwards. Thirty-five. Awesome. There you go. Negotiating right there. 
but you can't do I'm I'm gonna say no about doing them at the same time. Oh, you can't do the same time. Oh, okay, I was about to do the same time. I want I want some <laughs> distance between those two so we can hear them twice. So let's do it forwards now, and then tomorrow during your mega mini, you can do them backwards. How's that? Okay. Oh uh, yeah, that sounds fine. Or Friday, it doesn't matter. Okay. All right, I'm ready. Let's do it. All right, let's go forward. So one is parties, two, property, three, sales price, four, leases, five, earnest money, and termination option, six, title policy and survey, seven, property, new property conditions, eight, brokers and sales agent, nine is closing, 10, possession, 11 special provisions, 12 settlement and other fees, 13 prorations, 14 is, what is 14? I just remembered it. 14 is, let's see, let's see, let's see. I just had it. Let me think, let me think. Um, 13, 13 is prorations, 14 casualty losses, 15 default, 16 is, uh, was it mediation, 17 attorney fees, 18 escrow, 19 representation, 20 federal tax requirements, 21 notices, 22 agreement at parties, and 23 consult an attorney before signing. Nice. All right. All right. So, yeah, we're going to give you the points, um, but I'm going to ask you just to be perfectly on point for each one of these. Which one uh -huh. is 12? Say it again. You're cutting out. Well, one more time. Settlement and other fees. What do you think? It's pretty close, don't you think? Wait, wait, wait. Settlement and... Uh... Oh, it's settlement in something. Yes, it is. <laughs> you're you're absolutely right. Settlement and other. It's a synonym for fees. Uh, uh, other uh, expen expense, other expenses. Cheater, Lisa. Cheater, cheater. <laughs> She's throwing out the X there. All right. We'll give it. <laughs> settlement and other expenses. Uh, settlement and other fees is not incorrect, but I do want us to be technically accurate with them. So um, gotcha. you did a very good job, actually. So thank you for that. Awesome. Thank you. Woo! I said, give him a big hand. Your class is very proud of you, Adam, and I am very proud of you, too. It's always mm -hmm. very proud as a broker to see my agents memorize the contract and go through the paragraphs because I know there's no other agents out there unless you're an instructor that can do that. So it's elevating you guys to a class of real estate agent that just doesn't exist. So I am profoundly grateful for the time that you guys are spending on this. It's human nature for us to have a blind spot for ourselves. People change over time. And we have to be looking at who we are today and who we identify with. And that's important because we have to be able to self-actualize. We have to be able to determine where we are with things. Are we, are we looking and believing we're over here, but actually we're acting and treating people over here. And sometimes we think that we're doing one thing, but we're actually not. And so we need to be able to connect those things. And sometimes a little bit of yoga, a little bit of retrospection, a little bit of checking in with yourself. Um, when you get angry about something, check in with yourself. When you're super happy about something, check in and start asking yourself, why am I feeling this way much more? Um, when we stack on additional layers of things that we've never had to do before, those things are going to have a reaction. We have to make sure that if we tack on making calls and showing and doing a whole bunch of new work in our business, that we can balance that so that we are in our mind creating all of that space that we need to be able to be productive and not end up crashing and burning, which I see a lot of agents do. The color wheel that you guys are going to do is very important. Um, Stu, uh, the book that we sell in our store, the four colors you should know. He had there's a video that says you really want to know why your customers buy and how they buy because how they buy matter because how they buy is how they make the decisions to purchase. 
And when you can look at the different colors and realize they go about making decisions differently, it's not about us trying to force them to make a decision or in and psychologically try to disrupt their path to manipulate them to making a decision. It means that we can have more empathy on their path and we can help them through that path when we understand how it is that they make decisions. If they're someone who really likes numbers and we push back on numbers and want to show them the esoteric, but it's the dream of owning a home. Isn't that amazing? We'll be talking a completely different language to them and it's not what they need. They need us to give them the numbers. So we need to understand how our customers buy so that we can provide them the information that they need to make a decision so that they feel comfortable moving forward or feel comfortable terminating. We can't force people to do business the way we like to do business. We have to understand how it is that they do business and then build a road for them so that they can make informed decisions that make sense to them. And there is an entire book written on this, which is the four colors you should know. Stu uh, has 40 years in business and sales. He is a sales expert. He brought that sales to real estate. He lives in Dallas, Texas. His book is very entertaining and so is his video. And I'm gonna be sharing with you guys um, a video about him. We talked a little bit about um, your reputation, how important that is uh, on Monday. Uh, we saw a couple of people out there that maybe didn't do a good job with theirs and they've been indicted. Um, we did talk about the things that you should never post about, uh, which was one of our very last slides in that class, which is when you are on your social platforms, stay away from the top five, which is income, taxes, politics, adult content, talking bad about the other guy and anything you can't verify yourself through Snopes website. Snopes website is a website that will take um, something that you've heard that you're about to share out to your, uh, your spheres and determine whether or not what you're about to share out is real or not. Um, and if Snopes is not understanding or if it says false, stay away from it because you're perpetuating uh, bad information and that's not what leaders do. And if you want people to look at you as a leader and as a source of information, then we have to make sure that the information that we're sharing out there is accurate. So again, positive things, going to your city council meetings, putting that videos out there, having testimonies of clients that have worked with you and putting those on your socials, and then uh, having having dialogue about what's going on in real estate right now to your people and so that they can look to you as an expert in the field and myth bust all the stuff that's out there. Okay. Today is a day that is consisting mostly about your buyer and seller presentation. This is the nuts and bolts of what you're going to do. We talked a lot about prospecting throughout Mega and how important it is to be reaching out to your spheres and getting those prospects in your hands. But then when you have a prospect in your hand, what do you do with them? How do you conduct a buyer presentation? How do you conduct a listing presentation? And what should the dialogue be? What dialogue do we have with our buyers and our sellers um, to get the representation agreements that we signed, which means that we've been hired? We have to get hired to do the job. You can't show up at someone's house and install a kitchen and a bathroom and then say, okay, and by the way, I'm going to charge you this. And then them look at you and say, well, you didn't talk to me about what your fees were. You just did this work. And yes, your work's amazing, but I didn't get to decide what I wanted to charge or a fee. We didn't have that conversation. We get to have a conversation about hiring someone. How many of you would let a plumber start working for you and not ask them how much they charge? How many of you would drop off your car at the mechanic and let them start working on it and not get a quote? How many would you take your car over to discount tire and have them put tires on it and not ask them how much they are? How many of you would show up at a property and start working uh, for a buyer but not find out what they're going to pay you? Or vice versa, you be a buyer and start working with an agent and not ask them how much they're going to charge. And what happens if you did that and the agent looked at you and said, oh, my services are free? Are you going to respect that person? A lot of people get ghosted because they never formalize the relationship in the first place and have a understanding of what it is that they do. How many of you would go into an attorney's office and sit down and say, I need help, 
and let the attorney start them, but having no idea what their fees are going to be, no idea what the contract is. So the buyers and sellers out there want to know what our fees are. And a lot of agents are afraid because they get into the business and they look at these numbers and these numbers look scary to them. Well, if I, if I tell them that my fee is 3% of $500,000 and I'm going to charge them $15,000 for most agents, $15,000 sounds like a really big number. And they're afraid. They're afraid to even say that number to their client because they themselves sometimes don't even feel like they're worth $15,000. And then they're afraid. What happens if this person says, why would I pay you $15,000? What am I going to say? Because I already don't feel like I'm worth $15,000. And if I say that and they, and they ask me to discount my commission, of course I'm going to discount my commission because I don't care what they're going to pay me. I just want them to pay me something. And that's not how sales work. You guys jumped into the sales profession that you're selling the most expensive items in the United States. We'll just say that in the sales, we, we deal with the, the highest purchases of most people's lifetimes, more than the wedding rings, um, more than the weddings sometimes, more than just about everything they buy. This is probably going to be one of the top three most expensive things they will ever buy, and you're the salesperson on that. And so, yes, there are some numbers, and the numbers are stacked into a transaction, and so it's not It's not that I would like you to sit down, okay, let's go ahead and write me a check, and I'll begin working for you, and my fee is 15000 You guys work on contingency. Before Mega, how many of you really put thought into you being working on contingency? So Meg, Jamara, some of some of you, how, have you had a mind shift thinking about now that you work for contingency and what that means? How has that mind shift affected your your frame of mind and how you're approaching your clients? For me, it's definitely. Um empowering me to say hey you know like I'm not a discount kind of person I'm taking all of the risk all of the assumption doing all of this work for you to get this sold and I'm not getting paid until the very end so why would I want to discount anything yeah that's that's just hey, not I don't hey, want to be cheap Hey, Meg, it's Mary Beth. I want you to tell Jack what you did on that first listing on that property when I told you about his six, seven, and eight and what happened. Oh, so I went, I brought the forms and I, it was my first time doing it. So I brought the forms printed out, even though I was going to have them e-sign it anyway. Um, we went through everything and I told them, you know, I can take this listing six, seven, or 8% and I will work very hard no matter what number you choose and i'm actually the one who chose six because they didn't really say anything at that point but at the end of the presentation he actually asked me to please go back and circle the eight instead of the six so that we could get it done don't you love it jack don't you love oh it? my god i love it i love it class dismissed <laughs> <laughs> thank you mary beth thank you meg you know the fear is false evidence appearing real, real. There's so much fear out there that agents are, are just so afraid often to have a conversation about compensation because they think that people are going to push back and say, no, no, I don't want to pay that fee. But in the reality, we're not giving our, our customers the option to give us a bonus. We, we often don't even have that conversation because our mindset is so discount so that they're going to want to pay less, they're going to want to pay less. And we approach it and we find out that there's actually fewer people that are wanting to beat us up about commissions than there are people that want to pay what we ask them to pay or even more people that want to give us a bonus. There are people out there because they realize, all right, I'm going to sell this home and this person standing in front of me, they're going to squeeze out $350,000 worth of equity in my home. And I want to give them a bonus because I want them to squeeze out every single penny. And I know that they can squeeze out another $15,000, $20,000 of equity if they do a little bit harder. 
I want them to bring me recommendations of what I can do to my home to sell it for the absolute most. And that difference probably is $20,000 or more. And if my commission extra percent is an extra $3,000 and they're going to squeeze out $20,000, yes, I want them to do that job. The three professionals that you want in your life is a good CPA, a good attorney, and a good real estate agent. And if you think that's expensive, hire a bad one. Thank you for sharing, Meg. Jamara, how has your mind shift changed? I think prior to taking this class, there was a lot that I was not confident about because I just felt like I didn't have the right answers. I didn't have all the understanding. And so <clears throat> my one of my greatest fears in relation to real estate was that I was going to come across a bunch of people who were going to say, hey, I'll let you represent me, but I needed it at a discount. And I had zero argument about that. And so after taking this class, class, I've learned, I've learned why I'm going to say absolutely not. Like, I want to give you a good service. I'm going to work hard for you, but I am working on, you know, at, on contingency. This is a risk for me. And knowing how to explain um, why I'm not going to do it for a discount gave me so much more confidence than I ever had. Like, I'm ready to jump into it now. Good. I'm glad. Anybody else have anything you'd like to share before we jump into the nuts and bolts of today? Michelle. Yeah, one of my best stories about that. First and foremost, this is a different language and I just love it. Like I'm in love with this language. I have one time husband and wife who purchased twice and sold twice with me and they became very close friends. I mean, they moved to the East Coast and waiting for me to fly down there. Anyway, during a conversation, you know, like the wife said like, oh gosh, you know, the last house was 600,000. Anyway, and she goes like, oh gosh, we gave it so, we gave you so much commission. You know, and I took a deep breath, obviously, you know, and the, then the husband jumped in and he said, he said to his wife said, hey, we are walking away from Texas with $350,000 worth of money we made with Michelle. I don't have an issue with that 3%. I was just, <laughs> anyway. So let's not discount our services. Let's not discount ourselves because when we discount our services, we're discounting ourselves. And that's the light bulb that comes on. Um, and, I, and I love the new rules that are coming out. I love the new practices that are coming out that are forcing real estate agents to get this right, forcing them to go about formulating a, a relationship with their client before uh, they uh, get into the throes of, of representation and have that conversation up front. It's so important. It is so essential for us to be doing that. And no one out there was doing it. And that's disappointing to me. Um, and it should be embarrassing for our entire profession that, that that was even allowed. And it's not what we, that's not our practice, but now it's forcing everybody else out there to conform to the practices that we have been uh, employing since the very beginning, which is the practices that NAR has been pushing to, uh, to formulate and sign an agreement with your client so that they can hire you to do the job. Once you're hired, you do the best job you, you, you can. You're going to go to links to wow them. You're going to continually be looking for ways to outpace them, outthink them, get them the answers before they ask, and to lead them through the transaction. And in every transaction, learn a little bit better about what you can do to the next one so that you're continually growing, you're continually building, so you're not decaying, and you're providing the very best service possible. And there are people in here that I see that live that in every day. Mary Beth is a very good example. Mary Beth is a fantastic agent. She's been doing this for a really long time. And she could continue doing business the same way and continue doing well, but she's continually learning, continually taking classes, if not for me, other people, and building into her business so that her business gets better and better and better and it's growing. And she's continually selling more business. And right now she's so busy. She's like, Jack, I know you got all these little projects for me, but I don't have time for them. I'm sorry, I can't. I got to sell real estate. I'm too busy. And it's and 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 I'm like, you know what? 100 percent. 
I'm not going to interfere in anyone's game because she is out there. And she's like, Jack, I just want to tell you, I got another listing in my neighborhood. And that's what I want to hear from all of you. More of that. More of that. I'm so busy. That is exactly what I want to hear. Okay. So I'm proud of you, Mary Beth. Yeah. Um, so what did Mega do for me? Um, to not because I was definitely a discounted agent for sure. I used to always um discount my commissions because of the fact I've worked with investors. But what I took away from this training is definitely learn teaching me like I have values and how I can use my expertise, my knowledge not just for um, DC and Maryland, but in here to educate people who are mostly in the flip business because there are a lot of things I learn in DC as far as flip is concerned. Um, I can walk into a project and estimate how much the renovation can be. So I just um, learn a lot of things by being here and just boosting basically my confidence level. Um you are definitely, there is no reason for you to be discounting those services. Those are premium services that you're providing. Um, not only are those not discount services, they are premium services. You are helping someone else build wealth. So investors know that they have to spend money to make money. And if they find themselves a good real estate agent who's going to really go to links to try to help them make money, that's premium services. Um, that is certainly not discount services. So thank you for, for that light bulb and thank you for the mindset. Today is about us wowing our clients. So if we're going to make the promise that we're going to hit the home run, we have to hit the home run. And if we don't hit the home run, due to all, no matter, you know, it's our fault if we don't hit the home run. If you are on the uh, step up to bat and you strike out, that's no one's fault but you. It's not the pitcher's fault. It's your fault. It's not the weather's fault. It's not the bat's fault. It's our fault. So when we make a mistake, we have to take ownership of that mistake. I can tell you there were a lot of salespeople go wrong is they always want to point the finger to someone else. And accountability is really meaningful in a professional. And I don't trust people who don't take accountability. Um, I don't trust people who's always pointing the finger at someone else because they don't have the security to be able to say, you know what, that's my mistake. I own it. I'll do better. Dimitri. Was there actually a scenario when you had to or wanted to discount your services? I have done, I have two scenarios in my past where I've discounted my services. I don't ever discount my services. I either do it pro bono, which means for free, or I discount my services. I had um, a client, a family, actually it was grandmother, husband and wife. I sold them a home about 2008. Um, there, she was pregnant when I sold them the home. I'm literally tearing up right now. I sold them the home in 2008 and she was pregnant. And four years later, her little girl drowned in the pool. And they were so excited to buy that home with a pool because they always wanted to have a house with a pool. And when I got that call, I mean, I was devastated because they had been trying to have a baby for like 15 years. And she was um, probably 43 when she had her baby and they've been trying for a while and it was just one of those miraculous things. And so I sold that home and I charged zero commission. And another one of my clients, uh, I knew her when she was uh, told me, I knew their parents. I sold them a house and she went off um, to the army and she was killed um, in Afghanistan. And the husband, I got that call. And in both, in both situations, that house needed to go because they were surrounded in a toxic situation that they needed that house out of their life. So in those two situations, um, even if they wanted to pay me a commission, I wouldn't take it. I wouldn't take that money for all the work, for all of it in the world. No, I don't discount my commissions, but there are times where I will not charge someone. Does that make sense? Okay. Hitting the home run, securing a listing appointment, 
set the appointment, you want to make sure that all the parties will be present. Do not make the mistake to show up in a listing appointment and only one of the parties are there. It's never going to go well because now all of a sudden you're going to have the exact same listing appointment over the phone all over again. And you lose the impact. You lose the whole thing. One party totally got it. They were excited. They wanted to move forward. And then the other person, well, what about this? And what about that? And what about this? And they start putting doubt in the other person's mind. And now it's all over the phone and it just doesn't work. So there are scenarios where you're going to find out that the other person can't be there. And if that's the case, then I bring my iPad. And they're there on the iPad, just like if they were there, and I have a conversation with all three of them. And I'm very cognizant that they're on the iPad, and I make sure that I'm talking to them, and I'm talking to both of them, and not trying to um, focus on one person, and then the person on the iPad is sort of a little detail. I pretend like they're sitting in that chair. And my talking might be a little bit more slow, because sometimes there's just going to be a little bit of a delay between um, me talking and them talking. So make sure that when you set the appointment that everyone who needs to be there is going to be there. Drive the community and preview the competition ahead of your listing appointment. That can be the same day. It can be um, also uh, a couple of days before, but also drive the amenity center. If you're not familiar with that subdivision, um, then definitely drive the amenity center, figure it out. Is there a pool? Is there walking trails? Learn about that community. Don't show up to a seller's house and have not even learned about the community you're about to list a house in. Whether you get the listing or not, you've got now more ge geographic competency in that neighborhood, and that will help you in your overall craft. So if that, if you're not willing to do any of that, then um, you may ask yourself if you want that listing in the first place. I like. Uh, Mary Beth. I would like to add something to that just for the uh, newbies in there, because I just closed one on Friday and I knew when I went to the appointment that the wife had already been put in um, memory care. So she was not going to be there. So I got my ducks in a row ahead of time by calling my title person and knew what I needed to get from him as far as for him being able to do a power of attorney. And so for agents who've probably never done a power of attorney or done a probate or any of that kind of stuff, you may need to um, have that knowledge at a time. And that's why you do the research before you ever go on the market, you know exactly what you need. So then you're prepared. And so thankfully I had three or four weeks from the time that he moved her from here to California and came back and then we got it listed that we got everything we needed for that. So just FYI for others, thank you. Thank, thank you. People buy homes for pain or pleasure. So we kind of have to figure out what that is. And if we know why they're selling, then we can we can help them better. Um, if they are empty nesters, if they're if they're getting married, if they're getting a divorce, and each one of these presents its own problems and challenges where experience matters. And if you've never done a if someone has died and the property is either intestate or testate sale. These are things that you should probably sit with Cindy Bell, your sales manager, and, and get a little bit uh, geared with the information that you're going to need and how to approach the sale. I always like to have a conversation with my title people, uh, but we can't open title until we have a listing appointment, but our title people will bat, bend over backwards to answer any questions that you have before your listing appointment um, if you have questions about net sheets and all that kind of stuff. So um, if you're yeah. taking a listing and there's a new situation that you've never found yourself in before, then get with either a mentor or a manager so that they can walk you through that stuff. Thank you, Mary Beth. Um, yeah, because that's exactly what I did was I made sure she was going to be available for a phone call. So while I was sitting with him, got her on the phone, she told him what she was going to need, and then we could proceed with the listing. So you're exactly right. Just be prepared for what, what's next. And that's powerful because, you know, in that moment, Mary Beth knew that there were some challenges that that was going to present itself and she put um she had it she she put all the plan in place to be able to make sure that the questions that were going to come up were answered by not herself but a third party who was actually going to be the one that's going to do that and that showed value that showed that the 
consumer after that meeting had zero questions about Mayor Vest's ability or her commitment or her ethics. She underscored all three of those walking out of that listing appointment, and they're not going to choose someone else. I'm like, okay, this person has already got me in touch with other people who's trying to solve my problems. I don't trust anybody else anymore. We always want that person who know that we know that they've got their back, um, and that's that's super important. I like to go into my active comps before I go to my listing appointment so that I put eyes on it, especially if I've got a couple of really good comps. Uh, I'm going to call. I'm going to have a conversation with the listing agent. Um, do you guys have any offers coming on on these comps? What's going on with them? Um, and I want, I've got a listing coming in the market and I was wondering if I could just uh, walk the property. And I have a similar situation with the pendings. I very honest and upfront about that because I don't want a seller to clean their house and get it all ready for what they think might be a backup offer. And so I'm going to tell them, look, I just want to walk the property. You don't have to prepare those like you normally would. If you would let me in in that professional courtesy, I would really, really be grateful. And I've, um, I almost always, they're like, no problem. We'll, we'll let you in. Um, because they know themselves that um, professional courtesy and us out there doing that type of research does nothing but raise the bar of professionalism in our profession. Delivering a pre-listing packet to the subject property is powerful, but don't leave your comps because you don't want to give your comps to another agent. Your comps is less about the paper and more about the interpretation, which is the interpretation of the comps is your CMA. And a lot of people forget that the one page grid view quick CMA is not a CMA. And the fact that they call that in the MLS, um, I, I pushed back pretty hard on that when I was on the MLS committee. I told them this is not a CMA. This is just aggregate comps. This is the an aggregation of your comps. The interpretation of that is the CMA. You guys shouldn't be calling this quick CMA. It's going to send the wrong message to new agents. They're going to print that out and give it to their clients, and they're going to think that's all they have to do. And that's not the case. And so we teach you differently in Mega. We teach you a little bit more about how to prepare your comps and what comps is versus what a CMA is. When you are delivering your pre-listing packet, I like to leave the RPR at the door, which is a tax record. There's a little note inside there that says, hey, guys, here are uh, here's uh, the, what can be found in the public records about your property. Please take a moment to review that because if there's inaccuracies here, we would want to make sure that we address that before uh, the property is listed um, and be prepared for that. I, I let them know that I'm bringing a pre-listing packet because they're going to see me walking up to the front door and their ring doorbell, and I don't want them to think, I called you for a listing appointment that was a very private thing, and now you're just kind of showing up at my house. Um, what if what if my kids were there? Uh, what if my spouse was there because I haven't told them yet? What if my neighbors were there? This could have been embarrassing. So I let them know that, hey, I'm just going to be driving your neighborhood um, that morning and just because I want to make sure that I look at some of these active comps in there so I can see what your competition looks like ahead of our listing appointment, and I'm going to drop off some documents about your uh, property, if you don't mind, at your front door. And then they're going to tell me something. They're going to tell me, oh, no, 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 don't do that. And now I'm like, okay, uh, no problem. Uh, and then she's going to say, okay, look, Jack, I haven't told my husband. I'm thinking about getting a divorce and I want to meet with you. I have had this, I, so far, there's been about three agents who have brought me this scenario and I've been able to save them from themselves because they were about to go out to that appointment. Do not meet with one of the spouses behind the other spouse's back. I'm going to tell you it's going to backfire every time. You're not going to get the listing. The other spouse is going to think of you as the person conspiring with their spouse that they knew before you. They're going to hate you. They're not going to want you to have anything in there about about you selling that home because it's it's about um, it's not about us getting the home sold. It's an us versus them in a very serious us versus them and you're the them and you're not going to get the listing so if you want the listing you have to go about it differently and say all right i've been in this scenario before many times and uh, th this is the this is the situation i would really want to meet with you guys together and this is why um if they find out that we've been having this conversation they are never going to want me to list this property but more importantly they're never going to trust me representing them. 
and I need everyone to trust me. In a scenario where I have a potential uh, separation going on, my approach is to create a group text message, and I uh, everything I share with one person, I share with the other. Every email is shared as a group, and I make sure that everyone is communicated with at the same time, um, and that all of our phone calls are um, as joint as possible, because I don't want someone to think that I represent one of them more than the other, because I'm going to take sides on whatever got us here. So be very cognizant about that. If you go on a listing appointment where one person is considering getting a divorce and both of them own the house, you're not going to get the listing 100% of the time. So wrap your head around that. When I print the subject when I'm going to the property. Of course, we talked about this a little bit. Yes, on, on Monday, I've got the tax records that I bring along with me, my prior MLS listings that I bring with me, and then the, and the, and the uh, all of my comps. I call the listing agents for my pending properties that are on the market. We talked about this on Monday. Why do I call the pending listings? What am I trying to extract and what's the value when I'm going in a listing appointment for me to call the properties that have already gone pending. That's how the market is trending. Yeah, information on if you have any offers yet. Uh, well, you pending know. means they already have gone pending. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, you, you, uh, you're trying to extract information about the deal uh, so that you can make an accurate account for your clients. Okay. Input, um, Amel Amelia. Yes. Um. Uh. To get uh, how many um, you know, how many um, how many uh clients uh, uh send offers, and it means that the possibility of of the prospectus uh, uh, it's out there. So as Laura said, I'm going to give them a little bit more information. So that's very helpful. Amelia said to find out if there are other. If there were some alienated buyers from that multiple, if there was a multiple offer situation, which means there's more buyers in that one house, which means you need to know that there is a demand for that neighborhood right now. That's also helpful. What is another really important factor that I would want to get information for? Mike? Uh, see if uh, the contracts were list price or above. Mm -hmm. uh, would you mind sharing uh, if you met list price? Because that would be very helpful. So why does that matter, Mike? Well, it, it it helps you to know the trend of, of the uh, property and. Um, Are you on market yet? Mm -mm, no. No, because we haven't gotten a listing agreement signed yet, right? Right. But they're pending, right? So let's say it. Let's say I get my listing agreement, and it, well, let's just say it takes me ten days to get that property on the market. And then let's say it takes 10 days to get that buyer, uh, find a buyer now. And so, and then another five days, and now the appraiser comes out. What's likely to happen for that property that was pending when I was on my listing appointment? What is likely? That it's closed. And if it's closed, is that now going to be a new comp for me? Yes. So it's all to my benefit, Mr. Mr. or Mrs. Listing Agent. I'm prop I'm going to be listing a property in your neighborhood. By the way, did you have multiple offers? Um, if if you were representing any of those buyers, uh, I would love for you to bring them over to mine uh, when we get this listing. I, I'll share with that with you more later. Um, would you mind letting me know if because now maybe you can work with them and they can bring the buyer. If someone came to the open house and they had an unrepresented buyer or a represented buyer inside internally. Um, that was interested, so maybe you can help them earn more business. But also, um, if they they're going to be your best comp, very very likely that they will become your most relevant comp, because an appraiser is going to look at the most recent comps. And if you are at the listing appointment and you're looking at comps that are 30, 60, 90, 180 days old, and you're using that information to derive price for asking price, and all of a sudden you have a pending one that's probably going to be your best comp, 
you want to know what's going on with that because the only piece of information that you have right now is what it was listed for and how long they were on market. And so if we want to know if the market is trending up or down, we need to look at the active competition to find out what they're listed for so we know what we're up against. But the pendings, those are going to be most likely making into the closing table because only 5% of contracts fall out. There's a 95% chance that it's going to make itself to the closing table. And if that's the case, if it's the most similar, because I'm not calling ones that are not comps, I'm calling comps, which means it's similar to mine, that most likely be the most relevant comp, which means whether it met list price or not, whether they took a hit, closing costs, all of these things, the more information they share, the more value I provide at the listing appointment and and prove to myself that I'm committed to their success and looking at things that others aren't, but also I can make a better decision on our approach to how we're going to market this property and at what price. Mary Beth. Yeah, I want to add to that because I've, obviously I sell a lot in my neighborhood and I had one, what, we closed the end of April. And when you make those calls, you make connections with people and you usually, if they do business in the neighborhood, you do business with them again. So this particular agent called me because he had a listing that had been on and off the market for over a year. The, the sellers were set on a certain price because later I found out it was a divorce. And anyway, that his listing did go under contract and he called me because he was in a, a pickle that it did not appraise. So the buyers, and of course he's representing the listing, the buyers got two appraisals trying to get it and then his seller ended up having to come down. Boy, that was valuable information for me because in the meantime, I had another listing and then another listing and now I have one that just went today. So, um, you know, to know that stuff about where stuff is appraising, what condition they're in, how much they're updated or not updated, you know, they're all factors. And so very, very helpful information to talk to the other agents because if you develop a rapport, they will tell you stuff that you need to know. Yep. And this stuff isn't confidential. You can share the merits of this stuff. And so just know that um, this is what we call professional courtesy. Most agents out there don't know where the where the confidentiality is. If I were to ask you guys right now this particular question, which of these is confidential? The seller attracting an offer or the seller having a contract? Which one is confidential versus which one is a mandatory disclosure per direct? A lot of agents get caught up with this and they're foggy on the answer. If you're brave and willing to share, raise your hand if you're a little foggy on the answer to that one. Not uncommon and that's okay. If you've attracted an offer on a listing, the seller has to provide you written authorization to disclose the fact that you have an offer because it's confidential because we don't just get to tell someone, hey, yes, do you have an offer? I've got three. Or yes, I do have an offer. Track is smart enough to know that you can attract an offer that's a lowball offer and tell someone you have an offer and that person say, well, fine. If you've already got an offer, you guys work that out. And if you come back on market, then I will submit an offer. Because the seller may have a lowball offer and they don't want to scare people away. So the seller gets to be in the driver's seat of whether or not they're going to permit you to disclose whether or not you have offers. That doesn't mean you can lie. That doesn't mean that you can say, oh, Trek says I can't tell you. So no, I don't have any offers. That would be lying and that's a violation of the law. We have to do it a little bit differently. I haven't been authorized by my client to discuss whether or not I do or don't have author offers. And you have to say that more, sometimes twice. I'm, I've not been authorized to disclose that fact. I'm sorry. I wish I could. Um, that's where I'm at right now. But we would love to receive an offer from you. Okay. Separately from having an offer that turns into a contract, that's mandatory disclosure. Code of ethics say that we're going to paint a true and accurate per, uh, portrayal of the listing uh, status at all times. And the license access that you can't lie about the existence of offers. It's a mandatory disclosure. So once it goes from offer to contract, you can't tell people, oh, yeah, yeah, bring me an offer. I'd love to receive it. We don't have one. That would be lying. And you also can't sell the same property to two people. So they would be trying to attract a backup offer. So polar opposites. One is a mandatory disclosure and the other is um, a confidentiality situation until your client uh, uh, approves that. 
So, Jack, is it okay on that seller's authorization to release and advertise if when you're doing the listing agreement and they agree, yes, you can disclose multiple offers, can they sign that ahead of time or do you want it to be signed at the time you're getting offers? That's a really good question. So, uh, Trek says it has to be in pursuant to the actual term of the after offer because of the listing appointment we don't know if one of those if, if they're going to get a low ball offer so every time we receive an offer check says that we have to get authorization to be able to disclose that situation out in the world mm -hmm. excellent yeah. question right. and i'm sure that they needed to hear that question so thank you okay so so look the reason we call the pending comps is because we want to make sure that we're extracting all the information that we can so that we can advise our clients of the most valuable pieces of information at the time. I, there's about four agents at this brokerage that have really focused on their spheres, focused on, not their spheres rather, but their farms, their geographic location of where they live, and they sell a lot of properties in their geographics. I have found the most successful agents have focused on a smaller territory and became a neighborhood expert. Trek really wants that. Trek really wants geographic competency. They want you to know your neighborhood better than anyone else and be an expert, not be all things to everyone. There's a saying in real estate, a riches in the niche, niches, uh, meaning that when you have a farm or you have, I'm a condo expert downtown, whatever your niche is, and you get really, really good at that and get known for that, that your number of transactions will far exceed trying to put out a message that I sell everything everywhere. Um, when you're talking to your spheres, of course, if you know anyone looking to buy, sell, or lease a home, call me because your referral would mean the world to me. We're trying to get those referrals. But when you have a niche, that's a really important niche to be um, focusing on because you will become known for that and you will do more business in that niche than anywhere else. So um, very important to call the listing agents. Number five on this list, call the list agents for pendings, inquire for offers, and if over asking. I'm going to take you to break in a minute. Number six, ascertain the most probable list price versus negotiated sales price. That's two different things. Look, I'm looking at your comps and there's clear evidence that your property is worth this. However, we have to look at our competition and our pendings and those are telling a different story. So although I do think that you would look at an appraisal and your property would likely appraise for this much, the reality is, is that if we go on the market at this price, there are three other homes that would be competing against us that's gonna cause us some grief. This property here offers the buyer, um, it's got hardwood floors like yours, it's the same year built, it's within 50 square footage. And so we, we knowing how important it is that the first 10 days on market is how you're going to generate the highest price ultimately, if the strategy is well, let's come on market and wait for those three to sell and then ours will sell, there will always be another listing that hits the market after that and another one and another one. And those properties will continue cycling off the market while you're sitting there aging on market. And then you have more and more price reductions going on. So the strategy is come on market strong, try to outprice them, which is usually $1,500, $2,000, $3,000, something like that. Try to outprice them on the market. Um, and let yours be the one that sells in two days while they stay on the market for longer and they do the price reductions and they're the ones not selling. We go back in the last six months to see how many homes have sold, five homes have sold on average, there's five properties on the market. So there's an absorption rate here of 30 days or more. It's going to take an entire month for that inventory to cycle off, which means you're looking at 45 days. That's that's not a successful listing because after 30 days, the market has rejected the price. So we have to come on market and we have to be very be strategizing on not just what we think the what they will praise for, because that's only part of it. We're more than what an appraiser does. An appraiser is trying to figure out, is this home sufficient collateral for a loan? That's all that they're there to do. We're trying to figure out what price we should market this property for for a successful close, which is not what an appraiser does. Appraiser doesn't care what you're going to market the property for and what you're going to get under contract for. They were going to look in the past, but you're looking in the present and the future. There, so I want you guys to be very careful uh, and be thinking about ascertaining the most prob probable list price versus a sale price versus what your comps show as value, because those are three very different things, three very different purposes. I showed you guys how to print a CMA, the sales trend graph. How many of you did the sales trend graph in class and found that useful? 
All right. So that is a very important tool for you guys to have to show the historical how the prices have changed in that neighborhood over time so that you can go back to when they purchased it and see how close they were to the average price in that subdivision at that time versus today. And it tells a story and it double checks the math. When you show them that graph, here are my comps, here's what the sold comps are, here's what the active competition looks like, and by the way, here's what went pending, and these are going to be our comps most likely uh, in 30 days from now when your appraiser uh, is going to be uh, doing the buyer's lender appraisal. These probably will be sold by then, which means these are the comps, and I spoke to these agents, and this is what it's going to say. That's super important, um, but now let's look at my graph. And my graph shows here, here's when you purchased it. When you purchased it at 305, four years ago, it was right here on the line. It's very similar. And then today, here's where it is. Um, and it just reinforces your numbers and makes them have more confidence in you having the knowledge to be able to help them. And they start believing in your numbers more. And then I calculate their loan balance doing the amortization schedule, although they're probably going to pull out their phone and say, oh, yeah, let me give you my loan balance from my app from Wells Fargo, from Chase, from Mr. Cooper, because most of them have apps and they can give it to you. I usually am letting them know. OK, so it looks like you purchased it for 214 on this date and the, your original loan balance was 145. I did some math to extrapolate what I figured your loan balance is. Is your loan balance 138? Yeah, it's 138.6. Got it. All right. So uh, pretty much on the money there. All right. So based on that, if you were to sell for two fifty five, minus your payoff, minus your closing cost, this would be your net. Do you remember that my 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 percent that I multiply the list price by to get their closing cost as a rule of thumb? Eight and a quarter percent. Yes. You take the sales price, multiply by 0 0.0825, and you're going to get the closing cost, and that's always within 1%. It's so accurate by doing it that way, as long as you've taken a 6% listing. If you've taken an 8% listing, you're going to have to do the math, adding that extra percentage to that multiplier. Because the eight and a quarter is your 6% commission plus the 1%-ish title policy plus 1%-ish prorations uh, for where you are in that year. And then the incidental fees is the 0.25 and it comes very, very close. Um, I, I, if I will usually, before I go to my listing appointment, have sent my title rep all of my numbers based on my price and I have a net sheet. Sometimes I have it, sometimes I don't, but it's very, very accurate. And Monica was laughing at me the other day because it was less than $200 that I was off from my 0 0.0825 from her entire spreadsheet. And I really believe had I tried to forecast each one of those costs, I would have been more incorrect than I was by doing the 0 0.025. So very, very helpful. So how to, how to get them their net and calculate their loan balance from the amortization schedule from last class. Prepare your IABS, your listing agreement, your addenda, and your disclosures. I do like the 678 in the listing uh, in the list amount, but I don't fill out the list amount. I don't put the list price in there. I do 678, I let them circle the commission, and I don't put the list price in, I let them write in the list price. And I, it's a conversation that I have with them. If I've already written the listing price in the listing agreement and I haven't even seen the inside of their home, they're going to feel suspect with that. People don't like it when you show up to their house with a CMA with a number in mind already and you've not even seen the inside of their home. And if you've put that number on the listing agreement and you have to cross that number out um, up or down, you have not sent the right message to your client. So I fill out my listing agreement with all of the information except for... I don't circle the commission and I don't enter the list price. I let them write those in with ink every single time. Then the addenda and the disclosure. So I have that packet put together and of course, get a good night's sleep so that you're prepared, do your yoga, dress to impress, arrive on time. And if you're going to be a couple minutes late, what do you do? I like that. Um, oftentimes I will send them a text um, I will have Siri, I will do a text, talk to text. Hey, I am in route. Um, and when do I tell them that I'm going to be a couple of minutes late? Before, Tom. 
That's right. So if I'm going to meet them at four o'clock and I get stuck in Austin traffic and it's and, and the road is closed and now there's a truck, um, there's a fire truck in front of me and all of this stuff, which happens, I'm supposed to be there at four and now I'm looking down, I'm going to be there at 408. I'm not going to message them at 402 and tell them I'm going to be five minutes late. I knew that I was going to be late long before that. So the moment I know that I'm not going to be on time, I send them a text message as soon as I possibly can to let them know, hey, I'm stuck in traffic. I'm going to be about 10 minutes. Um, and I don't try to underestimate the number that I'm going to be there. I'm telling them my GPS is telling me based on the traffic that I'm going to be there, that I'm going to be over there about 308. And I message that or uh, 408 and I'm giving them that at 350. The moment I find out that I'm going to be late and I realize that's going to be the case, I let them know because now I'm not late anymore. I've reset that expectation and I've let them know when I'm going to be there. So it is just as disrespectful to knock on someone's door 10 minutes early as it is 10 minutes late. Set the expectations, let them know what's going on real time, communicate with them and try to be there on time. But again, oftentimes when I'm showing up to a listing appointment, they are still putting in the last few things together for me because they feel like the house needs to be perfect for me. I don't know why I always tell them, don't do a lot of preparations for me because I'm going to walk the property and tell you guys what you guys need to do and give you my suggestions on to bring it on market. Um, but they still do that anyway. In the last five or six minutes, they usually need to preparing. And if you show up and you steal that time from them, they're going to be a little bit stressed. And I don't want to start my listing presentation with stressing them. So if I have an extra five minutes, I'm going to spend that driving the neighborhood. Okay. Meet the seller at the property, walk the property, explain your marketing plan, and get your 6% listing agreement signed, your 678, and let them circle it in. We're not going to have a conversation about discount real, real estate unless they want to have a conversation about, well, I really want you to discount it. I really, really want you to discount your commission. The script that, I'm, that I've am that i geared agents with lately that they have really, really liked is, okay, well, it, I mean, if... If the only way that you're going to hire me is for me to discount my commission, this is the thing. I work on contingency. My fee is 6%. A lot of my clients actually pay me a little bit more than 6% because they really want me to have an entire marketing budget in order to market your home because the marketing for this property comes out of the commission uh, that you're paying uh, the broker. Part of that is all of my marketing expenses. But if you do, and that's very, very important to you, um, then I require that uh, you pay that up front as a retainer. The entire commission is up front. If you want me to reduce my fee, I would like you to, that our, our policy is that you go ahead and pay that up front and it's a retainer. Um, but if you want to do this on contingency, my fee is six, but I really recommend seven. So I really have the budget to be able to hit a home run with marketing. That is the productive conversation that you have. And they're not going to want to write you a check that day. And they're like, oh. and the light bulb goes on in their brain. Oh, how disrespectful am I being right now? I've got this person sitting in my house and I'm asking them to reduce something that I may never give them in the first place. And I think it gives them a little bit of a reality check as well. All right. So we are going to send you off on break. It's 1130. So when we get back from break, we are going to now dig deeper in each one of those even more. Um, 1130, you come back uh, at 1140. And I saw a couple hands going up. So I'm going to stick around and answer a couple of questions that you have as you have. And the first one is ever. Did you have fun yesterday ever? You look like you're having fun in the in the boardroom. I was, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm still a little hungover from that one one cup I had. No, I'm oh, just no. kidding. <laughs> uh, hey, I I got a um, I am trying to. Oh, I'm sorry. Give me a second. Let me pull up my notes of what I was going to ask you. Um, real quick on, on the trend graphs, that so that that steady line, the bottom line, the long term one. How do you come up with that? Did you just when we did it here with the in Mega? I mean, you you went into your your Excel and you just inserted the line. Is there any graph where it it, it already comes with that? Because I feel like I'm just winging it. I'm guessing in, in putting that line. So I don't know if that's correct. You, you know, I put the line uh, for several different reasons. I'll, I will share my screen and I will show you. Um, 
because you shouldn't feel like you're you're winging it. Let me just grab. Oh dear. Hold on. Okay. I'm going to throw in a couple of these. I'm going to show you one where I've already inserted the line. And give me a moment because I need... So, uh, I'm playing broker at the moment. Okay, so you shouldn't feel like you're winging it on these graphs. They kind of tell the story and you see this trend line here is the story. When you have a trend line like this from 2013 all the way to 2020 that's showing a very consistent um, trend, then I just grab the line and I try to figure out, um, I want my smart art, no, shape, line, grab the line and follow this trend line. Somewhere like that. And then we see where this trend line ends up. And it's kind of like that. That would be the average in, uh, increase. And then we've, what we've seen is this has now come around the corner and met up with this trend line. And so then I take this, you can double click in Excel and you can make the line bigger if you'd like. Then I'm going to copy and paste the line and I'm gonna make it a vertical line this way so that I can see where those two have intersected here. And then I look at this line here and where it is. And then you can see where this trend line, had it continued on, we're actually higher now than had this not happened in the first place. So all I'm using it to do is to show a point that the market's not crashing, things aren't falling apart, and actually things are progressing all along quite well. And we're in 2024 now, and I can continue, I can do the same one, which is um, all properties in a single story in the entire marketplace, um, and it tells that story. So that's all I do. Okay, that makes sense. Mary Beth, I see uh, your hand up. Hi. Yes. Hi. So yesterday I had to leave for an 1145 appointment. So I think I missed the end of it. And I am planning to do the three hour um, Thursday, but I'm trying to do this listing appointment and on these forms that are changing on the 24th. Mm -hmm. I'm currently, you know, in already have a listing agreement on one going to have a listing agreement on another. What do you want me to do with these forms? Should I wait till the 24th to have the next one signed or what do you recommend? I, I never recommend waiting to get your listing agreement signed. Um, I would let them know that there will be an addendum that you're going to have to send them because the language in the promulgated form is changing and set their expectation. And then on 24th that you're going to send them a, an addendum, but the addendum is not changing any material information on it. It's just changing some of the language. It's not changing the compensation or anything else, but that the form itself is going to expire on the 24th and we have a new set of forms coming. Um, and that there will be a one sheet that will just correct that language so that you can move forward after the 24th. Okay, All right. Sounds good. Thanks. Yeah. Congratulations on your listing.
Hey, who can advise a really good uh, commercial agent in our Realtors Texas family? Um, hey Dimitri, you should go to Cindy and for that. Cindy um, is a person that um, will help you with that. Oh, sorry. That's her advice. Every time um, someone asks me about a commercial, the, send the it to her. She is the one handling that. For when they go to okay. Yeah, because she wants to know is what type of commercial, where the property is located, and all of that's going to determine who we give it to based on the location and the type of commercial. Mm -hmm. So I, I wouldn't be able to work on that or learn that. We would have I would have to refer that to another agent. Um, if you want a mentor, she can help you with getting a mentor. If you want to do commercial, what we always recommend is that you take the ninety hour commercial course with Texas Realtors, because commercial is so different than residential. It's not at all the same business. It's a completely different business. It would be a little bit like a dentist wanting becoming a neurosurgeon and asking just all of a sudden just winging it. So we have to go and get that extra compensation. I mean, extra education, especially as it pertains to the math. Uh, calculating nets and triple nets and uh square footage that's rentable square footage and it, it's just there's a whole different animal so it's not that we say that you can't do it it's that you'd have to have a mentor go through the education and determine if that's a practice that you want to add to your business okay thank you so much Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome Like maybe I lost my. Hmm. Got it. All right. Participants. I don't know why Zoom has been doing this, but sometimes I lose my window and I can't see anybody like right now. <laughs> hey, Katie, can you have Miguel come here for a second? Did you say it? Okay. All right. I love that you need Miguel like we all need Miguel. We love Miguel. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes when someone signs into my account, they take over my rights. And then we have to find out who saw, logged into my Zoom under my password and figure out who that person is in the staff and get them out so that I can have my administrator rights back again because I lost it for a moment and I had no rights. Okay. We do love Miguel. Miguel is um, the saving person around here that just takes all this chaos and brings it organized. So what would we do without Miguel? In this market, in the market that we had a year and a half ago, we wanted buyers. Maybe. Or did we want listings? A year ago, a year and a half ago, we wanted a listing because we knew we put that thing on the market. Bam, it was going to be sold in multiple offers. You had a buyer, eh, maybe not so sure that you can get them something. But now we take a listing and we're not so sure we're going to find a buyer for it. And so we're getting a lot more listings right now as the listing inventory is going up. But what we're really trying to find right now is buyers because buyers are driving this market. 
And so you get a buyer that's qualified, um, it's much more guaranteed income than a listing in this market. Now, say we don't want listings because we want them, but we always have an ideal client. And right now our ideal client is moving to buyers versus listings. Where can we find listings? Where are some places that we can go to increase our listings? Well, advertising, yeah, okay, social networking, videos, postcards, radio, TV, print, all kinds of stuff works, but so does door knocking in your farm and getting on your HOA board and learning what's going on in your community and becoming known as a neighborhood expert, probably one of the best ways. Geographic farming has historically been the very best way uh, to attract listings into your business, having lots of uh, open houses in your neighborhood, um, if you don't have any listings and you're trying to break into your neighborhood, calling all of the vacant listings and finding out if they would authorize you to do an open house at their listing, if that's something that their broker allows, and you're going to have to get something in writing to allow you to um, have some kind of sub-agency situation going on. Now, I'm going to tell you that right now, my brain hurts when I try to uh, think about how these new rules are going to affect our day-to-day Yesterday, I told you that the reason that you don't have to give the IABS and the representation disclosure to people who walk into the property is because you represent the seller. But if you're doing an open house for another broker's listing, what do we do? We have to give every single person who walks in the door the IABS and the representation disclosure. But we technically don't have to give them the representation disclosure. Or do we? Well, we would because we only have to give them the representation disclosure if we represent someone, but they may think that we represent someone. So now we're going to have to give them the representation disclosure to tell them we don't represent someone. So if you're going to do an open house on another broker's listing, I'm not going to tell you no, but I am going to tell you talk to Cindy so that we can make sure that you're not out there putting your license at risk 500 times in a row or 50 times in a row or however many people come to your open house. So you want to make sure you get it right. But getting yourself into that community on the board, maybe on your HOA board and getting uh, as many lessons as you can, talking with people. If you don't have an, uh, an HOA, maybe you create a volunteer um, neighborhood watch uh, and have host meetings, have neighborhood events, do some of the events that we've talk, uh, talked about over the last a few courses on Mega that Lisa shared with you and that I shared with you about things that we do in our own neighborhoods, like little 4th of July parades and big parties on Halloween and, um, you know, being the Easter bunny running around the neighborhood, uh, uh, talk, you know, with your neighbors. Um, these are all really cool things that you can get known for and being a leader, being someone who's respected, endeared, loved, and people knocking on your door saying, or texting you or whatever, or getting on next door trying to find you because they're thinking about selling and they're going to you first because they trust you, your ability, your commitment, your ethics, and your knowledge of the neighborhood. Past buyers is a great source of listings because eventually they're going to sell. We know every five years right now on average, people are selling. So keeping in touch with your past buyers, um, I'll tell you one of the biggest mistakes real estate agents make is don't keep in touch with their spheres and finding out, oh, I sold my client a home four years ago and they and they sold it. I, I, I helped them buy that property and they didn't call me and they feel devastated. And I always say, go, go check out a mirror and look at it and, and ask yourself whose fault that is. Because if we didn't ask for the business, we didn't deserve it. If we didn't stay in touch with them, um, that's on us. And I think we all know that and we get it that it's, a, it's on us. But that still doesn't um, that still doesn't rise to the level of forcing people to make their calls. So a class like this helps reinforce that message. If you haven't contacted every single person in your past, it is a absolute requirement that you get that done before mega for your business, not for mega, but for your survival of your business. Referrals from all sources everywhere, every single person you know has to know that you're mar that you're open for business, that you are excited to receive referrals, that that's something that you would appreciate, um, that referrals is a big deal to you. And maybe they haven't even thought about that. They're not salespeople. They don't look at it that way. And they don't realize that that's something that you would really appreciate. And then when they do give you referrals, 
you send them a little box of candy that we talked about online or a car, take them out to lunch on a Friday, not for getting that person to the closing table, but for them giving you the referral in the first place. And then your spheres of influence. So if you want listings, we have to be looking at all sources. One of the scripts that I employ on the phone, because I get a lot of calls. Um, I get a lot of calls on the phone for people who want to, to list their home. And every agent has their own approach. Some agents are going to ask a million questions on the phone. And that's not a bad thing. You know, I want to know everything I know about the property so I can learn as much about your property before I get to the listing appointment. Um, that's an approach that a lot of people have. But also, there's also an approach that sometimes agents just really want to make it as simple for them as possible. I would absolutely love to list your property. Um, I would love to meet with you guys. When are you available uh, on Thursday? Cool. Well, thank you so much for reaching out to me. Um, I'm going to put you on my cal calendar for 3 o'clock on Thursday. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to drive the neighborhood. I'm going to look at some of the comps to see what's going on in there so that I can refresh myself uh, on what's going on in your neighborhood. And then I'll meet you over there. Here's a script that I put together that I'm going to ask for a volunteer. I would like an agent and a consumer. And I want to hear you guys walk through this, um, this script, because it can be as simple as this, setting the appointment. If you set the appointment, then um, that's if they've called you for a listing appointment, you set the appointment, and then now you're going to do all the research and you're going to show up prepared for that appointment super prepared for that appointment. You will have called the pendings. You will have done everything you can to get inside all of the active comps and done a really strong CMA um, and also knowing why they're selling is important. All right. So Laura, I see your hand up, but I'm also soliciting for a agent and a consumer, someone who will read. So um, Laura, let's, how, can, can you, you enlarge the screen? I mean, I, 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 I'll be the consumer now that I can read it. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. Um, Laura and Jamara. Okay. Ring, ring, ring. Hello. Is this Mega Valedictorian? Why, yes, this is Mega Valedictorian. Who am I speaking with? Wow, thank you for answering your phone. I can see why you were the, mela, the mega valedictorian. My name is Easy Peasy. I am interested in listing my home. I saw your amazing video posted online and your value statement resonated with me. Are you available to come out and meet with me? It would be my pleasure. I'm available after 4 p.m. today or tomorrow at 10, 2, or 6. I can do tomorrow morning at 10. Excellent. What is the property address? 4305 Chestnut Meadows Bend, Georgetown. Got it. Is this the number you're calling me from ending in 1120 yourself? Yes. Perfect. I'm going to do a drive by this afternoon, tour whatever your competition looks like, and I may leave something at your door for you to look at ahead of time for our meeting tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Great. I have you down for 10 a.m. tomorrow at 4305 Chestnut Meadow in Georgetown. Call my cell if you need anything in the meantime. See you soon. Okay, see you soon. Bye. Setting your appointment for your listing appointment can be this can be this simple, can be as um as simple as this. What we have found statistically, um, and I know a lot of you are gonna ask a lot more questions and you're gonna dig a lot deeper. But what we have found is consumers appreciate setting the appointment because they have not called you and said, will you list my home and I've chosen you to be my agent? What have they invited you to do? What was the invitation here? To sell yourself. No. What did the What did the consumer ask us? Me with you. To list their home. No, they did not. No, they want to meet with you. Just That's meet right. with us. That's right. They are. They've asked to meet with you, and so we want to be very respectful of what they requested and make that easy. They asked us, "Would 
you meet with me. Um, so I'm interested in listing my home. I saw your amazing video posted online and your value statement resonated me. Are you available to come out and meet with me? That's what they're asking for. And we want to go out and meet with them. But right now, all they're trying to do is check off a box. And what box are they trying to check off right now? Sign a listing appointment? No, what is it? Who they're going to actually work with. Mm -mm. It's someone it. he, they, they can trust. No, right now they're trying to check off a box and they're on the phone. What is it? They got kids screaming. They got everything going on. They they just made a phone call. What were they trying to do? What box are they checking off on their list? They just they, they just made to take an appointment with an agent. agent. How much money can they Let's get? give Diane the floor. <laughs> I think they just are interested in meeting with an agent, and that's it right now. That's right. So let's do that. Let's not infer. Let's not jump over a bunch of steps. Let's not. Hey, would you like to go on a date? I can get married on Thursday. <laughs> so let's not just jump all the way into the future. Let's now, of course, we want to have inclusive language and I would love to meet with you and, and all of this inclusive language when we get there about us and us listing your property. But the listing presentation is down the road. The listing agent is tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Today, the box they're trying to check off is I need someone to come to my house to talk with me about selling it. And I can, I'm going to put that meeting at that time. Right now I've got kids. I've got to go deal with this and this and this. And I've got 14 other things on my list right now. I'm trying to set an appointment. And if you add a whole bunch of things onto that phone call and you make that phone call a 30 minute phone call, what happens is in the mindset of the consumer, whether you want to admit this or not, they're thinking you're difficult to work with. And that it, the longer you keep them on the phone, the less they appreciate the call because they're trying to check off a box. So asking them, have you done anything to the home? What are you, why are you looking at selling this home? And asking a whole lot of questions they haven't invited you to ask those questions. And some of that might be infringing on privacy that they don't want to talk to you about over the phone for a lot of reasons. So my recommendation is you make this phone call short, super positive, extremely professional, and you make it all about setting the appointment. Now, if you add a couple of other questions in here, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, uh, push back on that. But if you ask them every question you possibly can think of on the phone while you have them, you're not doing yourself any favors. That is statistically the truth. When I get a call from my people, I always get my listing and I make it as quick as possible for them. It's, do you have any other questions? Anything else you need from me? Okay, cool. Well, I will see you tomorrow at 10 o'clock. I'm looking forward to meeting with you guys. Thank you so much for calling me. And I make it very simple. And then in the background, I'm getting on Google Maps. My client, when I got out there, like, how did you know we had a pool? I got on Google Maps and like, their mind were just blown. They're like, oh, oh, <laughs> they're thinking, you use a satellite to, 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 to help prepare your listing appointment. I, I am going to get all of the answers I need. I actually don't really need to ask them anything um, before I get there. And when I get there, there's nothing that they can ask me that I can't handle. And I tell them that there's nothing that, come, that, that, that can come up on your listing that I can't handle. There's nothing that we can't handle. We, so make this as simple as possible. So clarification, that's the appointment for the listing appointment? No. Yes, that's, your, that's the appointment that they just called me and said, hey, will you, uh, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about selling my home. Um, would you be willing uh, to come meet me with, meet with me? The answer is yes. What's your address? What's your phone? Is the phone number that you're calling me from? Because let's go by. There are some questions that we can't just not not ask. Why did I ask them? Is this your cell phone number? And by the way, this isn't a referral from someone I know. 
This is, I saw your amazing marketing online. I, I saw your value statement. It completely resonated with me. Uh, would you come out and meet with me? Why would I ask them, is this phone number ending in 1140 with me having such minimal questions and every single thing on here being so calculated? Why did I ask that question? To make sure it's not a home phone number? Mm. To confirm right. the phone number? That's confirmed. I can we can text them if we need to, if we're running late. We can, that's a... You can't text the line line, so I'm guessing maybe it gives you permission to call that number back. So I can tell that what happened to me like 10 times has never happened to you. And once this happens to you, you would have added this slide and you'd have a whole lot to say about this. Think about of a scenario when someone calls you and you call them back and you can't ever find them again. Thank you for calling Amazon. How can I help you? Thank you for calling Baylor Scott and White. How can I help you? Thank you for calling Dale Corporation. How can I help you? And I can't wow. find them because I call them back and I'm getting a company because they called me from their office. And this isn't their direct line. And I try to call them back. And now I'm like, okay, what was their name? What was that? Okay, Mary Stevens. Can I, can I talk to Mary Stevens? Uh, I'm sorry, Mary Stevens not currently in the office. Can I take a message? I need to talk to her. Okay, can I tell her who you are? I can't tell her I'm a realtor selling their house because that's confidential information. I could, I, uh, you, so you see, I can avoid all of that by confirming that the phone number is her cell phone. Oh, no, no, here's my cell phone. Let me give it to you because I'm calling you from my office line. That's happened to me like five or six times. Um, so I learned. So I'm trying to depart into you in wisdom so that you don't fall into the mistakes that I made thinking, okay, I'm going to save their number because I have it. Because maybe the number that you save for them, you can never get in touch with them again. All right. That's one of the reasons that I asked that question. I also let them know I'm going to leave somebody in their front door. Is that okay? Why did I slip in that little nugget? In case they're getting divorced? No. In case they don't want you there. And for who knows what reason, but I'm I don't want to be the the creeper creeping around their property coming at a time that they didn't ask me to. That would be a huge invasion of privacy. And people, you might freak them out. All of a sudden now they're just like, okay, if you ever call that person and all of a sudden they just sort of just like show up out of nowhere, like it, you know, maybe you go on a date, and next thing you know, they show up at your work. Right? A little freaky, you're like, what are you doing here? That's just not cool. So we're not going to just show up at their home uninvited at a time that's not even just to drop something off. So I let them know like, oh, what are you going to drop off? Well, actually, there's a report from public records about your property. It's an RPR report. And I was just going to drop that off because I'm going to drive your neighborhood and I was going to check out all the comps. And for another reason, there's about 10 percent of the time I go to a listing. And there is mail and newspapers that are three weeks old sitting at the front door and all kinds of Amazon packages sitting in their front door because they themselves haven't used their front door since 1982. They go in their garage. And so if I leave something in their front door, they're not going to see it because they're not going to even know it's there in the two days before my listing. Uh, Laura, I saw your hand up. Oh, yeah. And also, I just wanted to mention they have those sneaky little, you know, uh, doorbell cameras as well. And it's like, you know, when that rings and it, and it alerts them on their phone, oh, who's that on my door? Because sometimes mine just rings just because the wind blew it the wrong way. Yep. And it just kind of startles you. Um, and so for all those ring doorbells, they can see the creeper walking up the door like, what is he doing at my property? <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to let them know ahead of time that I'm going to drop something off. Jamara. Okay, so... We've talked about RPRs. We've talked about CMAs. Um, there's a lot. So I'm just trying to make sure that I understand and narrow it down. We are leaving them in RPR. I mean, it's their home. They kind of know what's been happening with the taxes. Can you help me understand why we leave that with them? Yes. Let's let's go. How many of you, have you ever printed an RPR report and gone through it? I'm, 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 have you, Jara, have you printed an RPR and gone through it? Um, I just printed one yesterday because we talked about it in class, but I had never used it prior to yesterday. Yesterday. Okay. Let's go and let's find 
there is a little thing here where I can see all my prior reports. I, there we go. We're going to grab this one. Okay. Um, where is the actual report? Previous. Let's grab this one. Where's the doorbell? Ding, ding. I don't understand why I'm not finding my reports. Fine. You know what? Fine. We'll do it this way. We're going to create an RPO report really quick. I want a property report. We can do a seller report or a property report. I usually do the seller's report 81 pages long. So I you can do either one, but property report is what most people do. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, you put your name on it. And it takes about 13 seconds to generate. It used to take like six minutes. Your computer will go ding, ding, and then your dog starts barking. And thank you. I'm going to download my RPR report. And voila. Now, in the RPR report, it grabs your photo, grabs a picture of the property. You got the property address on top, puts the Realty Texas logo in all of your email address and contact information on the bottom. Page two, we've inserted into the RPR report about information about Realty Texas, why choose us, the realtor pleasure performance, three differences between a real estate agent and a realtor, our listing timeline, and then the RPR report. Talks about your refined value, the list price, the RVM versus AVM. So here we have an RVM versus an AVM. But the reason is, is because as we get to the end of this report, we see property history in terms of the statistics and all of the data for your engineers who look at this stuff and they eat this data up. A lot of times people are asking me, where can I get more information about my property? And there is nowhere you can get more information about the property. Now on the seller report, which is 81 pages that I did not print, it has a his history of every time the property was ever listed in the MLS and all of the photos and all the public records, which I probably should have done the seller's report. Anyway, I will run that report and I will send a link to you guys. It is a everything in one place and it's a massive amount of data and they look at this report and they think my goodness this must have taken a lot of time and effort and energy for this person to put this report and it's very well presented and it's incredibly professional and my gosh Jamar, i was incredibly impressed by this report no agent has ever given me anything even remotely similar to this that's phenomenal People don't use this tool like they should. In fact, it is a very underutilized um, report. So when I use the RPR um, tab from the MLS, it does not look like this. No, so I'm going to go. Mm -hmm. It doesn't because I'm going to go and I'm going to do the seller's report. So here's the seller's report, and this is the 81 pager. And what I like about the 81 pager is, and it's still trying to load all the pages, in here are all of your comps, the market activity, your side-by-side -side comps of where it thinks your comps are going to come from, and then the uh, photos of the comps in each one, where it is on the map, and what it thinks it's it's going to do a small CMA for each one of the comps to determine if it thinks that those comps are going to sell. And each one of these is very powerful. You can bring the one page out there, but this is all the information about that property, what they listed it for, and what RPR says it's worth, which is really cool that it does that. And then I want to get into the listing images because after all the comps, it gives you a list of every time the property was ever listed in the MLS and all of its photos. 
So do I send this to him in color? Yes. Do I put this on the front door? Yes. Can you put it in a in a binder for them? Yes. There is so much data here and so much comps, and you can refine these comps and you can play with this report because it's giving you the active comps, the pending comps, the sold comps, and then what's going on in the neighborhood and the statistical information. How long did it take me to generate this report? A nanosecond? It's amazing the amount of information that we put our partners at the end of it because these are all of our Realty Texas partners. And it all starts with you on the front, personally prepared by. So, and also the main customers, they will eat this up, right? They always do. Um, they're going to be so impressed that you bound this into the plastic insert bounder and you left it at the front door for them with a little note that says, thank you so much. I'm looking forward to meeting with you. Um, I wanted to prepare this report and have it ready for you. So you could look it up, look it over ahead of our meeting. And now they're a lot more educated on what's going on ahead of your meeting with them. And they will, have, um, and if you have, you know, give you an opportunity to get uh, to go through this and um, let me know what questions you have about any of this information when we meet. They really do appreciate it. If you were listing a property and someone dropped off a report like this ahead of your meeting, you would think, okay, this person's trying to prepare me. And wow, this report's impressive. Meg. Where, where on the RPR do you go in and change, add the Realty Texas pages that you, you were showing? They're already there for everyone. It's not it, that... Uh, you are connected to RPR through the MLS through Realty Texas. And so each one of your RPRs are already configured this way. Okay. Mine's not, but I can. Uh, it, it, up, it up. Up. So then, so then Meg, I would get with, um, can you, can you go into the MLS for me and click on the agent search and search for your name and send me a snapshot of what it says for you. Sure. You want an actress or. Okay. Yep. Can do. Thanks. Okay. So I confirmed the appointment with them. I, I sellers often schedule multiple appointments. Um, sometimes now, most of the time I don't, there's, they're not interviewing anyone else, but once in a while they are. And I want to make sure that I have, I, I told them in the message that I'm going to follow up with the text, letting them know what time we talked about. Now that's two, two things have happened. I have it in a recorded conversation in text of what our meeting time is, because sometimes agents forget, or sometimes the client forgets. And sometimes the client makes two or three appointments and they know one person's coming at one time, one person's coming at another, and one person's coming another, and maybe they're not very organized and they don't know who's coming and when. And I've had a situation where I showed up at a listing appointment and someone else showed up at the same time as me. And the other agent's like, no, no, this is my appointment time. Absolutely. And I was like, I know I'm not wrong about this. And so I learned from that and I send a text to the seller right after we get off the phone. I'm like, oh, okay. No, I, I, we confirm nine in our text message. Um, and so that doesn't happen to you. So as soon as you get off the phone, send a text to the seller with the time so that you have it memorialized in a text message right after you got off the phone and add it to your calendar so you don't get back to the office and think, oh, no, what time did we say? Oh, I don't remember. Was it three o'clock? Was it five o'clock? You call back. I'm so sorry. I forgot the time. That's that's rookie, rookie, rookie stuff there. So don't ever let that happen to you. So if you send them the confirmation right after then there's no question you can go about but you can even go back to your text message thread and you've memorialized it yourself and then put it there it's a record that you can go back to if you need it later and yes do this i know you're probably it's not clear what's on my screen right here but what i'm trying to get at here is you guys need to add this to your phone immediately like immediately the, the moment you get off the phone, you take the this, the, the, the missed call or the, the call that you, you, they came in, you open it up, you type in their name, 123 Main Street, Seller Sam, and click save. 
get their name and their information as this thing saved in your phone. Now, did you know that when you set up your phone correctly, when you save their contact in your phone, then it shows up in your Outlook and your contacts? Did you know that? Because your Office 365 is all interconnected. When you have your contact on your phone and you have your Outlook set up correctly, Outlook on your desktop and Outlook on your phone, all the contacts in your phone will show up as part of your out address book. And if you set it up correctly, your Gmail address book, your Yahoo address book, your phone address book, all of that shows up in your Outlook and you have access to all of that. Makes it a lot easier to e export everything to an Excel spreadsheet and upload it up to your CXM. But in any case, what you should not be doing is leaving them as a unrecorded seller and going through all your calls to try to figure out which one of these people was the conversation that you had. So make it a standard business practice to save them in your phone. I am going to send this out as homework. This is your phone. How to set up your phone correctly, both for iPhone um, and for Android. So also, how many of you have are syncing your iPhone with iCloud if you have an iPhone or syncing your uh, Google with Google Play Store or whatever the cloud is on Google? Who is not? So if you haven't synced anybody yet, what is the big danger with that? Think Boat and Lake Travis. You lose your purse. You drop your phone in the lake. You, your phone just decides to, to die one day. Sure. And what a scary concept that is that your contacts could be in an isolated place that could be lost and never retrieved. Mm -hmm. That would be a massive, massive problem for you as an agent. And it's also, it could be a huge, huge issue if someone, if Trek subpoenaed your records and you can't provide them. Because Trek requires that if Trek asks you for your records, you have to give them your, your text messages, your call log history, and all information related to you and that customer. And so by setting up iCloud, everything's backed up. So if you lose your phone, you go to your next phone, you type in your password, and all of that data installs on your phone immediately. So as you're upgrading from one phone to the next, you never have to worry about it. So... Um, this very excited individual on your screen is going to show you how to set up your phone to properly back up your contacts. I'm going to email that out to you guys as well. And if you have any issues with that, um, either um, Lindsay or Lauren can help you with that because they are our resident experts at getting your phone set up correctly using Office 365 and backing your stuff up into the cloud. Now, when you set up, when you back up stuff into the iCloud, that's your own iCloud account. Your photos can be, you can set up to send what you want, your contacts, your email, your photos, your apps. You get to control what items you want to back up. You certainly want to back up your iMessages, and you certainly want to back up um, your call log history. Those are two things that are very important that you have backed up. Okay, so, and then I follow up, like I said, with the with the text message, hello, easy, I have you down for 10 a.m. tomorrow at 4, 4305 Chestnut Meadows, Ben's, see you soon. Okay, see you soon. Now, I did that for myself just as much as I did that for them, because now I can go back and I have it there. If I need to go back to it, it's like, okay, what was the address? Okay, I wrote it down, it's in my text messages. Again, um, we already told you why we told them why you're going to do a drive-by in the neighborhood, but... Remember, you got to prove your ability, your commitment, your ethics. You want to stand out, you want to impress them, and you want to show your commitment. You're not a discount agent. You're going to go far and beyond to make sure that they squeeze out every single penny you can in their cell. The difference between a real professional agent and, and that's trying to help them get the most out of their sale is that you care about getting them the highest net. Discount brokers are not hired to get them the highest net. And that's the difference. If you want to sell your home for the most, you hire a professional that has that competency. If you want a discount agent, you're not asking for the highest. And when they hear that too, a little light bulb goes on. They're like, oh yeah, I don't want that. Sense of urgency. This is your full-time gig. 
you're going to meet with them. You're going to come out and have a, 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 a conversation with them. Why are you leaving something in the door? Why are you going to drive the neighborhood before you meet with them? For all of these reasons, you're taking them seriously, um, that you're also learning that this isn't a secret from the spouse. So, because uh, if you show up at the front door and they tell you, they ask you not to do it, you're going to find out some information there as well. And they may tell you why, and so you don't freak them out. And why are you driving the community? You want to learn to see if their property has conforming curb appeal, learn the subject properties, number of stories, because sometimes that's hard to determine online if it's never been in the MLS before. Sometimes it's hard to tell if a property is two stories from Google Maps. You can see from Google Street View, uh, but sometimes it's unclear if you're looking at the right property on Google Street View. So there's no replacing you driving the community and actually seeing it. And it gives you an idea of what's going on in that neighborhood and giving you an opportunity to look at the comps. Okay. Uh, we've already shown you how to print an RPR report because Jamara asked that question, but I actually had in our class a couple of slides ahead of this video of walking you through um, printing an RPR report, but we're not going to show that because we just showed you. Now, we are going to show you this video about a pre-listing packet. Um, Dimitri. Yeah, just to add to that, driving to the communities really quick, um, a lot of the times, especially as, as my past as a cable technician, I've been driving to different cable communities all over Austin, and they are very often not on Google Maps or on other maps. So it's it helps to, first of all, if you can find location or, or address uh, to use different maps and try. And second of all, it's definitely a good idea to go there in advance and make sure that you see the neighborhood before. It should absolutely be part of our normal business practices to do just that. All right, so let's watch. Thank you, uh, Dimitri. Are you using one of these? Do you even have one of these? Happy listing day once again. I'm Matt Benelli. Thanks for watching. This is a pre listing packet, and if you're not using one, you should be. So, what does your perfect pre listing packet look like? If you don't know what a pre listing packet is, it's a packet of valuable information that you share with a potential seller before you meet to conduct a listing consultation. If you're conducting a one step process, you want to deliver this packet ahead of your scheduled meeting. If you are conducting a two-step process, you can either deliver the packet ahead of time or you can bring it with you when you preview the home. To clarify real quick, a one-step process is when you preview the home, explain your value proposition, and have your discussion about pricing analysis all in one visit. A two-step process splits that into two appointments, the first one being when you preview the home and the second when you discuss your pricing analysis. Okay, so what's the point of a pre-listing packet? You like to do research before you buy a product or service, right? So why not help out your future clients and provide that research for them? You want to provide them with everything that they need to understand the home selling process and what it will be like to work with you. Here are some things that you should include in your perfect pre-listing packet. Your biography, of course. Testimonials from your clients. Information about your brokerage. Your complete marketing plan. And this is very important because it details exactly how you're going to help them sell their home. Your affiliations and distributions, identifying how you're going to expose their listing to the market. Examples of your digital and your print marketing materials. Market statistics, of course. A list of questions that they should be asking their realtor. An introduction to any additional services like transaction management and title services. A listing agreement completely filled out with the exception of price. Homework for the sellers, including any type of property disclosure forms. And anything else that you want to include that differentiates you from the competition and helps the seller get ready to market their home. A quick side note here, also make sure you're sharing any required state or association disclosures as appropriate. Make sure you customize this packet for each seller. This is a great way to demonstrate the value of working with a proactive real estate advisor. In addition to exceeding expectations with potential sellers before they even sign a listing agreement, the pre-listing packet will allow you to do a little bit of due diligence on the seller's motivation. If you go through the trouble of preparing and delivering this information, you're hoping that the sellers take the time to read it. To encourage them to do so before delivering the packet, tell them this. 
I have prepared and I'm going to deliver to you prior to our meeting a packet of information that has everything that you need to know about the home selling process and what it's like to work with me and my company. Now the seller knows that this is important information. So when you meet with them, you can ask, did you have the time to take a look at the information that I prepared for you? Do you have any questions? The seller may or may not have questions at this point as they may want to have a continued discussion first, but if they didn't take the time to review that packet of information and they don't know anything about you or your company, they either aren't that motivated to list or they just want to hear your number. Any type of reaction from the seller regarding your pre-listing packet should help you adjust how you may or may not need to guide this seller. So if you're not using a pre-listing packet, start using one. If your current pre-listing packet doesn't have some of the items we talked about here, add them in. And if you already have the perfect pre-listing packet, that's awesome. Keep using it. I would love to hear from you all some success stories or non-success stories that you may have had with using a pre-listing packet. I would also be interested in hearing what your favorite items to include or not include in a pre-listing packet are and why. Feel free to drop a comment on the blog or the video or just send me a note. For now, good luck with your listing consultation and helps the seller get ready to market their home. A quick side note here, also make sure you're sharing any required state or... Okay, um, super cool guy. I actually see him uh, when we go to the NAR conferences because he is um, in leadership with NAR and actually a really good real estate agent. So pre-listing packet, this is a thing. This isn't just an idea that we throw at you. This is a the professional trend. What happens if you are up against someone who left a seller a pre-listing packet and you didn't? That's the danger. That's the real danger. And now all of a sudden you look like the person that doesn't have a high as a commitment to someone else. And that's not where I want you guys to be at. You want to make sure that you up your game and impress them at every step along. And if there's someone out there that's doing more than you, you need to know that. But we're certainly going to give them a pre-listing packet. Now, the other document that I like to put in my pre-listing packet, and I, I do this often, is the RPR report. Behind it is the Realty Texas Seller Guide, and then behind that is the Realtor Code of Ethics. And I put those three things inside uh, my pre-listing packet with a note, and I leave that at the front door. Um, if, if you're not doing it, I definitely recommend doing it. I already showed you guys how to print the prior MLS listing, so we don't have to go through that. I showed you guys how to print the MLS and tax records, so I'm not going to walk you through that again. <laughs> now, I talked to you guys about calling the pendings. I put these slides in here because you guys can follow suit in this, but yes. Um, hi, Jack. This is Lisa with Realty Texas. All right. So I want someone to be Lisa and someone to be Jack. Uh-oh, everyone's afraid. Meg, okay. you want to be Jack? Sure. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, cool. All right. Uh, Steven, I'm electing you to be me and Meg. You can be Lisa. Let's do it. Ring, ring. Hi, Jack. This is Lisa with Realty Texas. I see you have a pending listing in Terra Vista. Hi, Lisa. Yes, we went pending last week. I'm about to go on market on a property where your listing is going to be my best comp. Okay. How can I help? I was hoping you, that you could share with me if you went into multiple offers and if you got over asking. Yes, we have 15 offers and we are 20K over asking. That is super helpful. Thank you. Congratulations on your listing. Thanks. You too. Okay. So it could be a super quick conversation like that. That's kind of how these things usually go. Professional courtesy. People are always asking, especially if you know each other. Um, sometimes if I don't know who this person is and I get a weird vibe from it, I'll be like, no problem. Text me your email address because I don't want the neighbor or the employer or the jealous spouse um, calling me, you know, to try to get information about that. So if I don't know them or I get a weird vibe from it or they're not talking realtor lingo, I'm going to be like, hey, I'd, I'd be absolutely going to help you. What's your email address? And I'll email it over to you. Uh, fuzzybunny at gmail.com. Okay. What's your, what's your office address? Uh, fuzzybunny at gmail.com. Okay. What's your name? And then uh, look them up to see if they're a real estate agent.
because I don't want to give the wrong information to the right people. But outside of that, I do want to give as much information as I can to my fellow real estate agents because this information is going to be in the MLS. This is not secret. We all have access to the MLS, and this is all information that we share. And so this type of information helps our profession. Maribeth. Yeah, but aren't you concerned or are you concerned um, if what happens if that deal falls through and then you've told, you put it out there and then, you know, maybe they had a buyer that were one of the offers or something. Well, all so. they know is that I had a listing that was $20,000 over. And so how is that going to hurt me coming back on market? I don't know. I guess reverse that. What if it wasn't? Was it wasn't oh, multiple offers? You're in at twenty or 25000 under. Do you want to be telling that? Yeah, so I, I, that, that's not what my slide said. I know, but I just needed to know. Do you always tell it? Yeah, we took a horrible hit. We could, we, we sold it five hundred thousand under asking. I would never do that. Um, and okay. typically, my question is, I'm just curious if you guys met or exceeded asking. Um, no. Okay, got it. So you're going to be remarking sold. So are you guys through option? And I'm asking, you know, more questions, but no, I'm never going to ask them what their number was, but I do want to know if there were multiple offers and whether or not they met asking price. Okay, uh, perfect. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And if it's the other way, if they're over asking price, there's no harm in sharing that. But if they took a hit, no one's going to tell you that they took that big of a hit and like, nope, we didn't made it. We, they negotiated us down a bit. Got it. That's going to be helpful because... If you're going to be my best comp, I need to know that. So now I'm thinking, uh-oh, they're going to hit the closing table. And I do want to know a little bit more about that. Um, because if it does fall apart is one thing. But if it doesn't fall apart, now I'm impacted by that. So Right, uh, because I did call about one for this listing that I told you about. I texted you about last week. And we were waiting for it to close and it did close instead of at 515, it was 475. So that is a drastic difference, which is why I wanted to see that what it finally closed for that they didn't want to uh, tell me. And I get it. I know why. Now I know why they didn't want to tell me. So. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Because they're going to drop a bomb on you uh, and that's going to affect uh, your plan for sure. Lots of hands here. Kay was first and Laura. Yeah, I mean, I'm just a little concerned about telling them that I'm over, we were 20K over asking because to me, it can lead to um, a big deal because if I, it's like um, advice. So if I take the agent's advice and list my property at a highest price, then they end up having issues with appraisal and don't close, it can put me into a big shamble because the reason why it affect me a lot, I went through a situation like this in Northwest Washington, D.C. when we had a lifting, the list, uh, um, a flip. My husband and I uh, had the flip and it was in a great area of Northwest, but the problem was their comp and our comp was just like, even though the square footage wasn't much different, like 500 square foot above, but we ended up getting foreclosed because we couldn't sell our property because the agent said the same thing. Oh yeah, we had multiple offers. We're like 30,000 above asking. And I just, you know, heard what he said and my property was, <laughs> oh, and then I listed it and we ended up not ever selling that property and the bank took it from us. So this kind of, who brought back bad memories for me. So I don't know if I would do the 20, like tell them how much it was over asking, but definitely will appreciate to know they have this multiple offer. So I don't know. Okay. Just so let me, assist, let me help you with this because you're partly on the right track and then partly you're completely off the rails and rolling down a cliff. So let me get you up back on the train tracks again. First of all, we are trying to get as much information as we can to share with our sellers. I called this pending one. It's listed at 475. They got multiple offers and they're selling it for more. That doesn't mean that I'm going to price my listing $30,000 more. I would never do that. This is telling me that Mr. and Mrs. Seller, now let's look at what they listed for. 
If we list for this price, it's very likely that we're going to get more. It's not that I'm going to list the price for $30,000 more. It's this price is attracting multiple offers. So this is a very smart price to list for. Because if you price for what they're asking, you're probably not going to sell your home. If you price what they listed it for, it's likely to go into multiple offers. That piece of information is incredibly valuable because this price is driving success. This property hasn't closed yet. It's not a, it's not a comp. We don't know what's going to happen, but this is telling you what your market is trending right now. You have an obligation as a real estate agent to, to tell your seller everything you've learned about the, the, the community and present that as, as information as part of the entire marketing plan that you're putting together. Here's the solds. I called the sold and got as much information as I could. I called the pendings, got as much information as I could. And I called the active and got as much information as I could. And here's the story. Now, let me extrapolate that story and let's put a plan together. This is not about, I see that the property is worth 450 and they got in multiple offers and they're selling theirs for 575. So dang it, let's list it for 600. That is so far away from what my message is to you guys that it's in a completely different stratosphere. It's the exact opposite. It is, hey, this price that they're listed at right now got them in multiple offers, and that's exactly what I want for you. I want to list it at this price and get you in multiple offers because when the buyers are competing against each other, it puts you in a very powerful situation because the buyers are negotiating against each other instead of against you. So the more information that we share with each other, the better chance and the better our outcome is. I will never, ever list a property for more than I can support in my comps. I will tell the seller, I'm sorry, Mr. Seller. The code of ethics says I can't do that because I won't be able to defend it when someone says, can you send me your comps? Oh, I talked to one of the pendings last week and they said that they're going to probably close for $50,000 over. So that's why. That's not supportable by anything. So I have to have a supportable number, but also tell a story about how I'm going to hit a home run for them. And the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior, especially when that past behavior is happening imminently. So I thank you for that, Kate, because it's very important that we make sure that nobody else heard that message with the intent that thinking that I'm going to list the property for more from what I learned. So thank you for asking that question. And I still see a bunch more hands and Laura, you're up next. Well, I'm just, I, I, I call the pendings as well when I have a listing and, and also I, I do it on the buyer side when I have a buyer and, a fall, and, and, it, and it went pending and back to active and I call that previous agent. I'm just surprised on how some of the agents all differ because, I mean, you know, I've gotten the tight lipped ones that wouldn't tell you a thing, just we're under contract. And then I, then I, then I, then you would get the gab, the, you know, the gabbies and they tell you everything so it, it, I mean, there's, there's no standard, right? There is a standard, but there is no professional standard. The thing is, is that the agents don't know where their confidentiality begins and ends because they're so confused because they don't have the mentorship. They don't have the training and most of them don't have the experience. And so they think when someone asks them a question that they can just say, and just keep talking, I'm going to tell you, as a professional standards chair for Texas Realtors in 2020 and have been serving in professional standards now for over 20 years, the one resounding thing that I've learned how agents get themselves in trouble is by being too helpful. Now, I started this conversation by, by reminding you guys what is confidential and what is not confidential. In all of these conversations about what's going on in the MLS, it's not confidential. Now, the idea that one you that one agent who's properly that's going to be listing a property in that in that subdivision um one of the, one of the 40,000 agents in the marketplace um asking you about comps so that they can bring their property to market i am as sure as sure as i can my my previous slide that i had i always let them know yep we were in multiple offers and we exceeded list price in fact i had that conversation three times just last week so be helpful but also, make sure that everything about the seller is kept confidential. Now, about the transaction, it's not confidential. Who the clients are, confidential. If it's about the people, it's confidential. If it's about the transaction, it's not confidential unless it's an offer. 
But if the offer is turned into a contract, it's a mandatory disclosure. Now, we don't have to tell them the price. Probably not smart to tell them the trial price. But whether or not they got asking or over asking is not confidential. And in fact, it's a mandatory disclosure to the MLS. You have to report your sole price to the MLS. We're not talking about confidential stuff. Okay, thank you, Laura, because I think that pounds at home. And I see a couple other questions too, Mr. Mike. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, if somebody said that uh, the, it sold for $20,000 over list, you don't know that that doesn't also include that the seller also had to give $20,000 of seller concessions. So the, the data drove you to the list price no. And to try to take somebody else's word of a, a big price increase and just get you in bad trouble. Who's talking about a price increase? Exactly opposite of my message. An absolute opposite of my message. So if you guys are hearing that I'm going to price my home based on what a pending comp has done, you're not hearing my words. No, I, I heard your words. The girl that talked before oh, oh, that oh, said oh. that she got foreclosed on, that was what she had done. I apologize. I, th I thought I thought we were back on that comp top again. Yeah, no, uh, it's just very important. I want to make sure that no one walks away from this thinking that we're going to list a property for more because someone told me something on the phone. Um, it is absolute, for, for all the reasons Mike just said, 100%. We don't know the number and we don't know the data, but we do know that they the pro the property sold for over asking or it's under contract for over asking. And that is a very important nugget of information that we now have geared to have a conversation with our seller. And Mr. and Mrs. Seller, I've talked to these people and they're telling me that they're going to be getting to the closing table um, over asking price. And so that's good. If we've got that kind of activity going on in the market, then the expectation is that we would do that same thing. And so it's even more important that we price for the right price, that we come on market strong, that we properly prepare the home for market, and that we don't have anything that is going to stop us from having that same experience, which is attracting multiple offers and letting the buyers fight and get and drive the price up on their own. It's the most important thing that we can do because if they are willingly bidding over, we can ask them to address the appraisal concern that's going to happen because it's not going to appraise at that price. And we don't want to be one buyer, one seller, and in an appraisal crisis because then it's a renegotiation of the whole contract. And I don't want to see you in that position. These are the types of conversations that we're having. Productive conversations, good conversations. And when you're having these types of conversations with the seller, they're going to be impressed because no one else is having conversations with their with their sellers like this. They don't know what those pendings were because they don't even have they have no idea who the other agents are. They've they've got the comps written down. They did their quick CMA and they maybe they just clicked the quick CMA button and drove out there and they got the quick CMA and they don't even they haven't even done enough to look at the photos let them know what's going on in the neighborhood. And here now you're talking about conversations that you had with the listing agent. Um, and how that you're going to take what you've learned from all of this and you're going to put a plan together to help them have the best success in their sale. That's what they want. They want someone to care at that level. They want someone that's doing the research, trying to find out as much information as they possibly can that's going to guide them for the absolute best outcome that they could possibly have. So the more information you extract, the more information you provide them with the listing appointment and put a plan together for them, the more they are going to be excited about listing with you because they trust your ability they trust your commitment they trust your ethics and they know well, i don't want anybody else because i don't think anybody else is going to care as much about this transaction and do as much research to make sure that i sell my home for as much as possible i'm paying this person a premium to make sure that they sell my home for as much as they possibly can because i got one house and i got one opportunity to squeeze out every single penny and i want every single penny and i'm not going to take a chance uh, letting a rookie come and mess with the equity that I have in my home because I need that equity to go to my next house. We talked about this a little bit um, and then we're going to jump into properly preparing the home for market. My listing packet, the listing packet. Now we've talked a lot about comps and what's in my comp packet, but I haven't shown you guys this, but uh, this is an dog ear one that, that put in here. Your folder, your MLS listings, tax records, RPR, you have this from the last one. 
um, than the listing documents. This used to be really important. And I used to tell you guys to dog ear this, but do I tell you to dog ear this page number eight anymore? Porque no. Because your packet system and the dot me does it for you. You don't have to worry about what forms you need because the system is telling you what forms you need. This was me telling you what forms you need. The system now tells you this for you so that you don't have to worry about that. And the people who are working hard for to make sure that that's a thing for you, because I don't know that anybody else has that, um, is Miguel and Cindy and then uh, the tech department making sure that all of that's working for you guys. Okay. Once you've done all your work, you've done all your field work, you have all your conversations, you got your listing appointment call, you called your pendings, you drop, you you told them you're going to drop by the neighborhood, you talked a little bit about what goes in a pre-listing packet, we talked about what forms you need and how to prepare those forms, and we're going to talk about how we fill those forms out a little bit on Thursday, tomorrow, aren't we? But also uh, in our last, second to last uh, mega class, which is our bulletproof contracts and our financing and negotiation classes, then we want to get ourselves in the right mindset. We want to get a good night's sleep. We really do so that we can show up fresh and our mind is working out on all cylinders and we get there and we are prepared to get them excited about our listing presentation because that's critical. But we're going to show up for the listing a presentation a little bit early. We're going to walk the comps. We're going to walk the amenity center. We're going to arrive on time, not early, not late. We're going to park across the street from the property. Are we going to park in the, in the, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten calls from sellers, from agents doing this. Are you going to park in their driveway? The answer no, is. No, we will not. No. A capital N, capital O, a couple lines under it, and about 10 exclamations. That's me yelling. No, we're not going to ever park in their driveway. What is the three reasons why we never want to park in their driveway? Oil leak. Also, you you might have people who come for. Uh, oh, sorry. There was people who get their hands up. But no, yeah, no, oil. Dimitri said oil never leak. oil leak. Yes. Not always safe. Why? And it's their private property too. What if someone comes home and you park on their driveway? It's just rude to me. Okay, who's this guy going over to her house? So first of all, you got the you've got the oh, oh I'm gonna the real reason is what Mike said, and we haven't even talked about that yet. Dimitri is right. Um, you don't park in people's driveway because who knows what's gonna come leaking out of your car, get on their driveway, and I'm not gonna let that happen. Number two, the perception of what people are gonna think parking in your driveway, because you're not a family member and you don't park in people's driveway unless you live there or you're a family member. But number three. If they park their car in the garage and you've blocked them in their driveway, they're not going to feel safe. Now, there are some streets where there is absolutely no parking and the seller will have told you how to handle that. And if there is no parking, you may have to address that. Uh, but before that, um, being on time shows that you're respectful, a person of your word. Punctual means you're dependable. Punctual, uh, punctuality demonstrates that you're reliable. And if you're not punctual, then people can't depend on you. And if they can't depend on you, they're not going to hire you. So if you just show up 10 minutes late and didn't call them to let you know that they're going to be late, they already don't like you. So if you're trying to prove your commitment and your ethics and your ability, and you can't even call them to let you know that you're going to be late, you're probably not going to garner the amount of respect necessary for them to hire you. So if you're on the way and you know that you're going to be late, you're going to tell them. We're going to play a game. We're going to call it 10 things in 10 seconds. If if I were to show you this property and you were to arrive at this property, what is the first thing you see? Trees. The trees. Trees. Ta-da! I'm a tree. I'm a big, big, beautiful tree. But are we selling a big, big, beautiful tree? No. 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 So it's literally overshadowing the house. So we're going to talk about the 10 things in 10 seconds that a buyer is going to judge the property when they, so I don't want you to be thinking about the seller right now, because right now for the rest of the day, we're going to be talking about properly preparing a home for market, because if you can't get that right, you're going to really hurt your ability to sell. 
We're going to talk about the listing appointment from the open house, from getting the listing all the way through getting your first offer on Friday. We're going to dig deep to every single step. But today, now it's let's get our listing appointment. Let's go out and talk with the, tell them about our listing appointment. But a lot of what you're going to talk to your seller about at the listing appointment is preparing the home for market. But I want you to think about the eyes of the buyer because that's what we're trying to be conscious of. So when we pull up in front of the property on your listing appointment and you look out, I want you to be thinking, okay, in some point in the next 30 days or so, this is going to be on the market. There's going to be a sign in the yard. And what is a buyer going to see when they get out of the house, when they get out of the car? They're going to judge the home from the moment they see it before they even get out of the home, before they even get out of the car, they're going to judge the property. They're going to judge the property as they're walking up the walkway to the path, the front door. They're going to judge the front door, whether it's stained or the hardware is rusted. They're going to judge the home based on how old it is. Then they're going to judge the property when they walk in the front door, whatever smell it hits them as they walk in the front door. They're going to judge based on the temperature of the, of the house and, and on and on and on. A judgment is being made every single step of the way. And 90% of the objections that are being added to the buyer's brain, we can mitigate for a very, very reasonable amount. I'm going to liken it this way. If you have a car and you're going to sell it, are you going to have it professionally cleaned inside and out before you sell the car? Or are you going to try to sell a dirty car? Why? Why Why not? Why not sell a dirty car? It's going to cost $200. That's going to take away from your net. Are you going to earn more is that $200 going to pay itself back to you by cleaning the car? Yes. It will. And it's the same thing with the house. Unfortunately, that $200 is going to be a little bit more, but we're not talking about tens of thousands of dollars. Not usually. If you have a home that's dilapidated or functionally obsolescent, or it has so much deferred maintenance that there's no way that it's going to be brought up to market value, there are some options that they can do for third-party companies that will come up and, and, and put money into the property to sell it, but it's unlikely that that's going to be the case because they're most likely going to have to sell it in a time frame that's much sooner than that. So oftentimes, if I see some stuff where I know, you know, we could put new countertops in here, swap out the floors, paint the house, do the front yard, and probably looking at about 18000 bucks or less to do all of that, and if they were to do that, they would drastically change the position and the and the and the sellability of the home and the price of probably 2x maybe 3x and so sometimes i'll just ask um what what kind of budget do you guys have to prepare the home for market because i'm curious because i think if you guys were to spend a little bit of money to do a few things that it would double your money or triple your money based on your what you're investing in selling the property um we don't have any money at all Got it. Not a problem. Just wanted to, to throw that out there. Okay. And I'm not judging them. And my judgment, my, my, I'm very careful in how I speak to them because this is their home. This is their situation. Um, one situation is not better than another. It's just, I need to find out what I'm working with so I can build a plan. Whatever the plan is, I don't care what the plan ultimately is. I don't have a preferred plan. I'm not going to judge them based on my plan. I'm just trying to get as much information as I can so that I can put a plan to make sure that they have the very best outcome with what resources that they have. And I saw Ever first and then Jamara. You answered my question. Thank you. Okay, Jamara. So what do you do if their house looks like the picture you just showed and the tree needs to be trimmed and God knows what the house looks like behind the tree and they say that they don't have a budget? Yeah, to so, do repairs. So we're going to talk about that. Um, there, if they have no money at all, no budget, they can't borrow money from anybody else, and there's a few things that need to be done. Then it's called sweat equity. And if they don't have the ability to do it themselves, then I do have some trades that will delay payment to closing. However, they have to understand that. They can't overprice this property. We can't put money into this property and then it be not priced right and us not being able to sell this home. And now they've incurred debt, both in terms of maybe defaulting on a commission debt and the debt that they have to my suppliers and to my trades. So we have to be very careful. But I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about what we have. 
because a lot of what I'm going to be suggesting is things that they can do themselves in a list. When you're walking up to the property, I want you to take notice of the tree, first of all. Does it need to be trimmed? Has it never been trimmed? And is it distracting? Are you going to be, even be able to get a photo of the house? If the photo of the house is more about the tree than the house, it needs to be trimmed to raise the canopy and bring in more light. Are the shrubs too high? Does anybody know how high a shrub should be or how high it should not be in front of a house? There's a rule. Does anyone know Below that? The window? Below yes. the window frame? Exactly right. Below the bottom of the window frame, not the top, right? <laughs> if your shrub is six, seven, eight inches higher than the bottom of the window frame and behind it, you see all the, it, it makes the room look dark on the inside, that shrub was never supposed to be there. You need to get that shrub out and make a cute little shrub that's one or two feet tall to give yourself some color inside the flower bed. But if the shrub is blocking the window in any which way, it's not supposed to be like that. The window screens, at some point they start fading into gray and you rub your hand over it and just you can see all of the fibers coming off of it. It makes the house look older. It also makes the house look darker and it makes the house look dirty. I always ask my sellers to remove all of the window shades. I do. On the front of the house, I have them taken off and I have them put them into the garage, especially the solar solar shades. The solar shades. The make that house. Yes, the screens, Laura. Okay. Yes, the screens. It makes a huge difference when you take the photo from the front. All I have them turn the lights on for inside the house when we take our photos. Turn the lights on outside too. And when we take that photo with the screens turned off and the shrubs removed, the windows glisten and sparkle and the entire house glistens and sparkles. And there's <clears> something <throat> that you can't even, even realize it. Now, I don't have them throw them away. They take the screens off, have the windows washed, and they put them in the garage labeled. There's a company called Windows. It's Windows with a G. This is something that I do that absolutely costs nothing and makes a huge impact on uh, on on the photos. The entire house is glistening and they can't even put their finger on it why it looks so shiny because all the windows are shining. When the screens are there, you don't have that shiny effect. You take it off, all of a sudden it shines and it looks like a whole different house. Just that one thing. So here's some things that these are pro tips that help a home have a whole different look that you can't even articulate or really, really. And I'll tell you those homes that you're on property tour and you look, you're like, my God, that's a beautiful home. 90% of the pro tips is they did little things like this to really begin bring impact. It does two things. It brings more light into the house on the inside and it glistens from the outside. The um, outside of the outside fixtures, rusty, dirty, have bugs and have the little spiral light bulbs inside of your light, inside your uh, light fixture in the garage. Have you seen that? Walking up to someone's house and they got the spiral little white light bulb inside there. It doesn't look good. And you can have your three hundred thousand or your two hundred and fifty thousand dollar property, and you look up there, and it just detracts from the beauty of the house. How much is a light bulb? We're not talking about a whole lot of money, but washing the glass and the light bulbs, getting those all of that out of there, and cleaning it up actually improves the curb appeal. Now, these are small things that we're talking about here that actually have a big impact. Again, these are pro tips. Um, light fixtures. Okay. Does the house need to be painted? Is the garage door dented and scratched and dirty and look, um, you know, sometimes they can pop a dent out from the inside. Uh, sometimes the garage door is just a mess. It can detract and make the house look dirtier and older than it really is. So can a driveway that needs to be power washed. A power washed driveway completely can transform a house. Imagine for a moment you have a house that's got shrubs, that's got a grass that's overgrown. There's some stuff in the front yard that shouldn't be there. The light fixtures are all dirty. The garage door is dented and you power wash. You fix the garage door situation. You clean up the bulbs and clean up the fixtures. And then you have the, pro the grass properly trimmed and then the tree properly uh, trimmed. All of a sudden, the entire house has been transformed and a little bit of money has been ex expended at this point. Not a lot, a little bit with a big impact. I 
I'm talking about the 10 things in 10 seconds because I'm walking up to the front door and I'm looking at all of this. I'm looking at the garage door. I'm looking at the pavement. I'm looking at the tree. I'm looking at the grass and I'm not spending five minutes in their driveway. I am quickly walking to their front door and I'm not gawking around because I don't want them to see out the window and see me rubbernecking their entire house. I am looking at the shingles because sometimes you can see the top of the shingles as you're walking up the front door from the from the garage. And I'm looking really quick to see if I can see evidence, um, if the shingles are multidimensional shingle, if they're a flat shingle, if they look like they're worn, what's going on up there. Just take a, take a look and to see what I'm dealing with of whether or not I'm going to recommend if they have their insurance company come out and take a look. I'm trying to determine whether I'm going to have someone come power wash the property on the, on the cement. I'm looking at the tree to determine I'm going to recommend that or not. I'm looking at the front yard determine what my recommendation is going to be there because I am making a mental list of everything that I need to do to prep this home for market because I know a lot of little things can make a huge impact. And what are we trying to do? Properly prepare our home for market. When we get back from lunch, we're going to talk for the rest of the day about this. We're going to slow roll from getting out of the car, walking through the front yard, walking through their house, having a conversation with them at the kitchen table about all that needs to do, all that needs to be done, and your team of people who can help them prepare that because they always ask, okay, what do I need to do to prepare my home for market? I'm glad you asked. Okay, so there's some, some things I think you can do that has a huge impact. Your job is to take a, a house and turn it into a home. It's the agent's job to turn the home and turn it back into a house. And I can give you some pro tips on how to do that. And then we start with the pro tips. We will do that at two o'clock when you all go back from lunch. And Adam, I see your hand up. Hey, Jack, I had a quick question. Hey, so before I went to real estate full time, uh, I was doing the, the power washing like professionally. And I was trying to see if, you know, if you guys need to do like, uh, like make home ready cleaning, like pressure washing, window cleaning and gutter cleaning and all that. Um. Miguel bought a power washer and he does all uh -huh. my power washing for a huge, <laughs> huge dollar amount of zero. Uh -huh. uh, and so, uh, I, but that's not to say that he's going to do that for anyone else because he does that because he's part of my team. Yeah. I know that our agents are constantly looking for power washers. Um, and so if that's a service that you're offering, um, for those people who want to offer services like putting up signs, putting up block boxes, uh, filling up flyer boxes, uh, cleaning windows, um, power washing properties, all of that stuff, if that's something that you offer, let us know so that we can put your name in our vendor list on the RealtyTexas.me and put that out there because that's a service that we are always continually looking for. So thank you for letting us know. Shoot Lisa okay. and, you know, or even Katie or Miguel and they can help you with getting that out to your dot me okay i'll bring some business cards for them for them to have thank you yeah thank you oh. that's super cool <laughs> lisa's like what's your phone number right i got your phone number i got your number i got your number i saw two other hands go up sean mm -hmm. was one of them hey jack are you um dismissed for lunch i just want to i don't want to hold up everyone i just want to ask questions if you have a little bit of time before you take your lunch or do you have time Everyone has already been dismissed for lunch, so their their lunch is already ticking away. Uh, please ask your question. I do have a packed lunch schedule, but I always have time for you, Sean. Thank you so much, Jack. So I was um, I just want to thank you. I love the way that Mega has been. It's also it's been transformed. I guess it's, you're doing things different every one every Mega. So I'm glad that I joined because I've learned so much more than I did in my even my first Mega, which was phenomenal because my income did shoot up <laughs> tremendously but um it's really good you know what you're teaching um these are definitely all the information and things that i have been scouring the internet for and i feel so much better to get it from you <laughs> than other sources so because I, I bought these little boxes uh from daiso uh, my daughter got them for me to kind of set up and establish my pre-list packet and i still was just very uncertain and unclear about what all is going to go in there. You know, I had an idea of some things, but you putting this into perspective, like showing us top tier, like I'm so excited to, to get that information. That's exactly what I needed. But also I noticed, you know, you're talking about the 10 things in 10 seconds. I drive around Colleen all the time and I see all of these people taking these listings. And just like you, you can literally see all the things that they're doing wrong 
why the house is not selling. And I'm like, why can I not get that listing? You know, but then it takes it back to all of the other things that you just put in place to kind of show us, you know, the conversations and how you're having and all those things to get the appointment. But um, I see so many bad listings and I'm like, why do they get that? And then the agents, they don't even pick up the phone when you're trying to set appointments. And I'm just like, why can't that be my listing? <laughs> so, but I just wanted to thank you for the training and just tell you that, you know, I see that a lot and I really want to get past that. Um, I just spoke with a lady that I made a call to, or I actually met her brother um, because I was doing some circle dialing from Zach being suggested. And as I'm getting off the phone with the people, I'm asking them, you know, well, you know, if you don't have a need right now, I completely understand. Thank you for taking my call. But who do you know that does have a need for my services, you know? And so he gives me his sister's phone number. And um, he said, she lives in Harker Heights. And I said, okay, great. So I've been calling her. Um, she didn't answer. I text her. She did answer. And then she says, you know, where's your company located? I told her we were in Round Rock. I sent her my digital business card. I followed up with her, you know, to ask her if she got a chance to view, you know, information about me and my company. And she says, yes, I did. But I'll be using a realtor. When I do decide to sell, I'll be using a realtor in Harker Heights. And I did explain to her, I was like, well, I'm a local resident to Salado. I live near Harker Heights and I work in Harker Heights very frequently, you know, and I'm just like, I asked her, I said, well, do you, um, whenever you have the opportunity, whenever you find the opportunity to begin to interview agents, I would love the opportunity to earn your business. You know, I don't know where to go with it because it's just like, I feel like I'm, I can't get past that. Another thing is also most of my clients have not reached that five year time to sell mark, but they have some refer, some don't. And so I'm still going after new buyers until I can get a, a sale. Yeah, so your buyers that you sold in neighborhoods are going to get to know their neighbors and they're going to be finding out about listings in their neighbor's home. So when you call them, always asking, you know, if you find out your neighbors are selling, please let me know because um, I really want to make sure that I don't mess out on any opportunities. Um, that's a, a nice little drop that you can put on them. If you're really looking for listings, farming is the way to get them. Okay. I have a farming group that I personally I want to get in that because I really want to do my community. It's like perfect. I was sharing with Lisa. It's probably 105 homes here. And it's well, like, perfect well, do, you, do you have an HOA? We do. Okay. But All it's right. very minimal. They don't they don't really ding us for lots of things. We only pay two hundred fifty a year. No, not where I was going with that. Where I was going with that is that I would like you to get run for a position on your board so that you can up the communication, take over the community newsletter, and be the one that's sharing everything that's going on with real estate in their community, everything that's going on with the management company, what days are trash day, watering day restrictions, uh, what schools they're connected to. Um, having community events for different for different holidays that are popping up, and you being the voice of everything that's not that for that subdivision. Part of being a community a neighborhood expert, though, is that doing a CMA for the last eighteen months and seeing how many homes sold in that community. Because in a, in a smaller community like that, if you're not having at least a twenty percent turnover rate, and fifteen to twenty is is pretty normal for a community. Mm -hmm. If it's a community that hasn't had a home sold in three years, you're going to be expending a lot of time and energy for not a lot of benefit because nothing is turning over and they do have those communities. So before we really determine of whether we're going to attack the community and make that particular community your farm, it may be a farm that you do, but then you also have a farm in a neighborhood that's nearby that has a much higher turnover rate that's going to allow you to have the income that's going to generate that makes farming and the expense of farming a reality. So, but let's just say that you do a CMA in the last 18 months and there's a 15% or more turnover rate, which means every year 20 homes sell in your neighborhood. If that's the case, then you can own 50% in the first two years. What, what I call a 50, uh, you own 50% of the neighborhood, meaning that 50% of the listings you'll get. So if they have a 10% uh, uh, 
the turnover. There's 20 listings. You're going to have 10 listings. That's nearly one a month. That's one listing a month that you're going to be getting from your neighborhood. And then it just propagates more and more and more from there because as they're selling, you're going to help them on the buy side. So those 10 are probably going to turn into 15 transactions for you. Yeah. It starts by getting on your board, running for a position on your board. And if the board um, if they if they don't have any board seats and maybe they're looking for a chair for a community, a, an events committee chair, because we get a hold of your bylaws, read your bylaws carefully to find out what it takes to run for a position, how someone can be appointed for the board, and then uh, what committees are there and get involved on that level. And then start doing open houses every weekend on listings if you can, knocking on doors getting in charge of the community newsletter and sending that out. Next thing you know, you are the voice of real estate, which means I also want you to go into your city council meeting there, which I believe you already are, sharing that information with your community newsletter, getting on Nextdoor and uh, be running ads for that community on Nextdoor. So when people are on Nextdoor, they can see you. That's all part of the marketing that I do, uh, all part of my farming group. Okay. Thank so, you so much, Jay. Jump into that because I would love to see you in there. I know I want to. Thank you. Enjoy your lunch, Jack. Thank you. Welcome back. Ooh, the God, we need Jack here. Where we need Jack here. Where we need Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Still waiting for a couple of you to make your way back to your computers, turning on our videos. We're going to be going into a breakout session very soon and have you guys looking at all of this. So when I'm pulling up to my listing appointment, I'm trying to look at a property to mitigate objections. I want to figure out what can I easily cure that's going to make the home look better, that's going to give a buyer an emotional attachment to a home. Buyers are going to go from house to house to house, and they're going to see everything that's out there. You have one opportunity to bring a home to market. You can try bringing your 2002 Honda Accord to market and put it on auto trader and then get it in front of the buyers who would want it, then come out and check a look at the car and then it's dirty and it looks worn and there's things that you could have fixed that you didn't fix. <clears throat> well, if you go and clean it and wash it are they gonna, and they come back and see it again, are they going to willing to pay more? They already have an idea of what they were worth in that home. They already valued it. So we have one opportunity. A home doesn't have unlimited buyers. There's typically just enough homes for buyers in any given market. So it is so important that we do it right and not take it by chance. Properly prepare the home for market. Properly advertise it. Every step is very important. And this is today is about the properly preparing it for market. So we want to make sure that we get this right. It's not something that, well, and some of this isn't necessary. It's just extra things. I'm not giving you any extra things. None of this is, are things that, well, it would be nice if these are things that if you want to bring the home to market and be that one home that sells in the first 10 days, these are the things that you need to do because other listing agents are doing them too. And so getting a home in multiple offers is a good goal, but it's not, it's not the goal. It is the outcome. It's proving that what you did worked because you want to get that emotional attachment you want to get someone interested to buy the home and imagine themselves living there. And you did that and more people were able to do that. So you got it right. It went into multiple offers because 
out of all the homes on the market, this is the one that they imagine themselves living in, and this is the one that they submitted an offer on out of all of the competition. And you can do that on a very slim budget. In fact, you can do it with no budget at all. Some of this is going to be just sweat equity stuff. So let's go back through this list again. As I'm getting out of my car on time for my listing appointment parked across the street, I do, how many of you have a horn or um, put it this way, how many of you have a lock on your car that when you lock your car, your horn beeps? Okay, Elizabeth, if if you're getting out of your car and you're going into your in, into a listing appointment and you lock your horn and your and your car beeps, what did you just tell your seller? That I am here. <laughs> okay, what else? Um, well, that I part closer to their property. Uh huh. What else? What is a, What does locking your door mean? Oh, that I. Maybe I don't trust on the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. You want to send that message to your seller? Uh, no. Probably not. Have we ever put thought into lock on? They're like, oh, okay, well, got it. <laughs> right? Because as soon as they hear that horn, you just told them a whole big story. They're you can here. just hit the lock button on your door and then it'll lock it. And that's exactly where I'm going with that. So if you're walking across the um, driveway and you go beep and then beep, you have just sent a net message to the entire neighborhood, I have arrived. And maybe they don't want that either. And then you've also sent them that maybe you don't trust the neighborhood. So as Mayor Beth said, we've got two options. We can turn that feature off, which I don't recommend because I think it's a good feature for you guys to have, um, especially if you're in a parking lot late at night, um, having that button is there. It's not a panic button, but it's still there. Um, but from the inside of your car, you can hit the lock button and then you can hear all the locks go lock and then close your door and off you go without making that noise. So just put some cognitive thought in here because I'm going to tell you all of the things that um, perception is important. Even these subliminal ones are important. So on time, we pull up in front of the property across the street, not in the driveway, lock the door from the inside. So when you close your door, you didn't make a big mm -hmm. horn beep. And then now you are looking around the landscape as you're walking to the property, not rubbernecking, but you're just taking a mental snapshot, 10 things in 10 seconds as you're walking up to the front door. And it's probably not even 10 seconds. It doesn't take me 10 seconds to walk to the front door. So it's probably 10 things in five seconds. But I look at the tree, look at the grass, look at the garage door, looking at the fixtures, looking to see if I need power washing, looking at the shingles, looking at my uh, screens, looking at the shrubs, looking at the lock to see if the if the front door is faded, um, if there's no trespassing signs that are not very friendly <laughs> around, all of these things. And I'm making a mental note of it because my my thought is, what is it going to take my landscaper to fix all of this? Because my hand, landscaper, my handyman, who's very affordable, can fix all of these things in a very low budget, easy thing. So here we have, Trees, shrubs, window screens, light fixtures. Does a house need to be painted? Let's take a look, quick look at the shingle and see. And if you are not, if you can't look at a shingle from the ground and get an idea about them, you should take a roofer out to lunch and have them whip you up to speed because you, there is a lot just from visually inspecting the shingles. Um, it tells you a lot about the age and the condition of the shingles just by one quick three second look. Now, I'm not telling you that I can tell if it has hail damage, but I can tell you if there are concerns or not based on just looking at it. And then <clears throat> driveway stains, power washing needed or not. Is the door stained? Is it faded from the sun? Is there issues with the door at all? Um, is the doorknob rusty? Why does that matter? Because if that's a, these are first impressions and first impressions are so important. You're walking up to the property. Everything looks fresh and clean. You get to the front door, nothing, no concerns there. We're trying to mitigate objections on every step of the way. A security signs are also not very friendly. No knocking on the door signs are very, uh, friend, not very friendly. And then of course, wasp nests, uh, in the, in the front need to go, um, Anything that's, you know, debris that are up there that just shouldn't be there. Too much clutter. Um, a faded door. No. What's that? Oh. And then uh, 
maybe the doorbell being burnt out because we see that sometimes you know the the light in the doorbell burn right through um not that that is a big issue but um just something to take into consideration that could be you know nine dollars to fix um and that is the mental snapshot because this is this happens on its own this is a naturally occurring thing this is organic as it gets but it's not what we're looking for and it's not just the tree that i'm looking at here what am i also looking at what else do you see if you look past the tree the bushes mm -hmm. the american flag is blocking the entry i think huh so do you see this whole thing going on over here? Yeah. It's touching the roof and lets um, penetration of insects and it's just blocking the curb appeal. Mm -hmm. And we've got all of this over here. We've got all of this going on here. All of this is lush and green and beautiful. However, if we were to just simply raise the canopy and mow the lawn, it makes a big difference because in here, and this is an actual situation, all they did was raise the canopy. Now you can, oh, there's the house. Peekaboo, right? Now you can see the house. That's all they do is raise the canopy. They're not killing the tree. They didn't destroy the tree. They just raised the canopy so you can see the house. That would have been step one. Step two here is going to be, now they did tra uh, a tree, uh, uh, trim this tree. All of this should be gone. This shrub should be completely gone. And you should have maybe two shrubs in front of each one of these windows and open up the front yard so that you can actually it and maybe the pink maybe the pink flamingos are not necessary just throwing that out there just maybe um and in this case they did get rid of the garage uh the flag okay which i'm obviously i'm a huge proponent of having the flag because uh i have two of them in front of our office during business hours at all times. And recently our Texas flag bracket broke and I had to go to links to getting a new one as fast as possible. So obviously I'm a proponent for, for that. Okay, what do you notice? What kind of light bulb in here? Do we like that light bulb in this lamp? No, it's not an outdoor light. That's an indoor light bulb. Mm -hmm. It's yellow and it's it's got the white spiral and it's just the wrong light bulb for the use and people see that and it just kind of looks tacky and when you walk up it just it's not what we're trying to accomplish in selling a home and we're talking about a very very low ex uh, cost type of thing. Now I you got to look at the house because I can tell you that this at one point this was <clears throat> some kind of brushed nickel. Then they went to oil rub bronze and right now we're seeing more of a polished steel look right now that's going on so i don't think oil rub bronze will ever go out completely because it's classic but what we don't want to see is rusted and faded we want to and for a three dollar can of spray paint and a little bit of uh dish soap and a new light bulb um, you have made the fixtures look appropriate and acceptable so that's what I was talking about with the fixtures outside. It doesn't have to be perfect, but these light fixtures themselves are like $29 at Home Depot. So we're not talking about an expensive light fixture, but we're also talking about the overall overall uh, situation of the house. If you have a house that the, the shrubs are a mess, that they're not going to do anything, there's debris all over the front yard, obviously fixing the light fixture is not going to solve your problem. So we're going to look at this holistically and we're going to stack all of these things on top of each other. Um, I list homes every week. I'm continually taking a snapshot of the front yard and having quick conversations and putting lists together to whip the thing into the very best shape so that my home sells. And I have the record sale and most subdivisions that I leave by helping them properly prepare it. And they just don't know. And 90% of this stuff, they don't see it. They literally can't see it because they're blind to it, not because they're blind to the situation, but because that's not, they're just so used to seeing it, they don't even see it there anymore. Laura. Okay, I, I had this situation once. How do you handle um, realtor versus bird wanting to create a nest on the front door? Uh, yeah, I mean, 
because generally, you know, I mean, when it's when it's my house, of course, you know, you put a snake or you put an owl or whatever, but you can't do that when you list a property. So how do you handle nature versus realtor? Well, hopefully I don't have nature affect my listing in the 10 days I'm on market. I'm talking about, you know, uh, you know, because I was I was at this house one time and the, and the bird just continually wanted to build their nest over the doorway. Um, I, I don't have much comment on that. I really don't. There is special, uh, services that you can call and they'll come and remove uh, your, uh, remove the bird to the safer place from your, it's the same with a bee nest, with many things. I, I think that what I would probably do if it were me, I would probably go to an outdoor nursery and probably find a cute little bird box a cute little bird house and probably put a bird house somewhere on the property so that the bird will find their way to the bird box and live there versus somewhere that I don't want them to be, I guess. Um, because the, of course, if you put a cute little bird house, they're going to, they're going to go and move in immediately because it's just the, the, the less work for them. But um, best advice I could give with that. But I will power wash and I will spray down the sidewalk to make sure that there's no bird droppings and that there's not debris anywhere else. There are cultural situations with birds, especially in good luck and having a bird nest next to a front door, um, especially uh, in Eastern cultures. Uh, it's it, it's a sign of good luck. But uh, it, it's uh, in on the west on the Western culture, it's uh, it can be more of a nuisance. But uh, I think that that is um, many different ways to approach that home curb appeal ideas couple couple hundred dollars couple thousand dollars um things that you can do both of these by the way are are acceptable and um, they're talking about two great looking front doors upgrade uh, upgrade dated rusty disclosed uh, discolored hardware or having a door guy uh, or gal come and help you um mike falks my handyman I don't, I can't tell you how many times he has refinished a wood door for me, um, sanding it down and refinishing it or painting a door for me. Um, refinishing a door is about $800, which is expensive, but that's if it's a wood door because they have to take it off the hinges and sand it down and replace the hardware. But if it's just painting a door, it can be considerably less than that. Do not paint over a wood door with paint. Um, that's not what we're talking about here. If it's an actual like solid wood door and it's been stained from the sun and there's cracks in it and it just looks old, that's going to be one of the first impressions. Now, again, we have to look at the entire house holistically. If the house is in pretty good shape, but there's four or five things that you think that you can do to whip it into shape, well, overall, the house looks good, but there's these three things. Let's see if we can mitigate those three things. Usually the houses have a couple of things that are in need of repair, but there are also those houses that you show up that everything's in need of repair. If everything's in need of repair, we're not a flipper, although I've helped people do that before, where they've replaced all the flooring and painted the entire house and had and, and done a lot of work, um, depicting on the price where I can help them with that. And I do offer those types of services where I turn myself into a semi subcontractor where I have my people coming out and meeting them at the door and helping them whip in, into shape. Recently, I, I mentioned it wasn't too long ago, about a month ago, we brought a property to market. We had the house painted. We had a landscaper come in and completely do landscaping in the front yard, in the backyard, epoxy the garage door, paint the, paint the house and three of the rooms in the house. Um, we had to have a small mold remediation happen under the sink. We had to have, um, bunch of things happen, uh, including having the water softener taken off site and some other things that we did. So uh, I walked the property and this was a beautiful home in the 600 thousands that had a couple of issues that I could mitigate. And my client was happy to mitigate them to sell them for as much as they could. And we immediately went into multiple offers and sold the home clearly for more. Um, it didn't appraise and we had dealt with that up front. So Things, light things you can do, upgrading the porch, lighting fixtures, creating seating areas in the front, walking area, potted plants are great, new, always a new doormat. My stager that I use often, um, she is a huge proponent of always buying a brand new, fresh 
mat every time you list the property, um, especially if it's three or four years old, buying a new mat is makes it just look a lot more welcoming as you get to the front door and painting trim. And uh, like you said, adding some bird houses or bird feeders is really great. Um, trying to get them away from kind of what Laura was talking about. Now, hey, Jack, I'm going to chime in real quick and tell you that I had a client who was having trouble with that and they were big bird proponents and wanted all the <laughs> natural whatever in the yard. But they found out that if they put wind chimes on the porch near the door, mm -hmm. birds don't like that and they won't nest there. So that's, there's that's an brilliant. easy, simple fix. I, <laughs> brilliant. I also found out that armadillos, squirrels, and all animals absolutely hate cinnamon. So sprinkling cinnamon around your brush and around things keeps them away. They also, uh, mosquitoes don't like it and flies don't like cinnamon either. So there, there you go. There's um, lots of remedies like that. I didn't think about the chimes. That's super brilliant. I love it. I will add that one to my slide. Here is a house that's not uncommon in, in anywhere USA. Downtown urban areas will see this home that was built somewhere circa 1945, 1955, even into the 1960s. You've got just a 800 square foot home. Maybe grandma lives in this house. Maybe she's owned this home since 1960 and she's just kind of kept up with it and doesn't know what to do. Maybe she's got a little bit of money to, to fix this up. But when I say fix this home up, I'm seeing a $5,000 or, or less. Even with $1,000, you can do a lot. With $2,500, you can do a lot. And with $5,000, you can do it all. So I'm going to put you guys into groups. And I want you guys to discuss um, what you would recommend on a no-budget scenario versus what you would recommend on a $2,500 budget scenario and we're going to stop there just those two what are you going to recommend on a no budget scenario versus a $2,500 budget scenario and just talk as a group there's going to be different variants of experience in listing so listen to your fellow agents and when we come out we're going to talk to the group breakout sessions and then I'm going to give you some advice as well breakout groups are being created for you now I'm going to put five to six people in the group so we'll have five captains. Please remember to elect a group spokesperson for your group. You will have a full 10 minutes for this one. I will see you back at 2.34. How was our discussion? Productive? Fun? Very fun. About <laughs> have enough time. Feel like we had enough time? Yes. We right. did. Oh, sorry. I'm not on. I think so. All right. Who are my captains for group one, two, three, and four? Group one is who? Captain. All right. Amonti. All right. I am going to spotlight you. For some reason, my spotlight. All right. And then who is my captain for group two? Who is my captain group two? Joyce. Joyce. Thank you, Joyce. I, 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 this just got very difficult. Okay. Well, we're not going to do it that way because teams just pushed an update and I can't, I don't have control that I had before. All right. So, all right. Oh, Monty, group one, what did you guys come yeah. up with? So for the no budget, we said that we would do the windows and the landscaping and clean the house. Pretty much. Okay. When you talk Every about landscaping, let's do some, let's, let's dig a little bit deeper there. So when you say windows, what are we talking? Windows, the windows, the screens, we would uh, probably redo the windows. Okay. And then the landscaping, the lawn needed to be mown, the mowed, and then there was some uh, weeds as well. Mm -hmm. Pull the weeds. Okay. And then, okay. I mean, what stood out to us were, were the stairs as well. We could definitely do something with the stairs. 
Uh, a lot of what we came up with, we do manual labor. We do the labor ourselves. So, do you guys agree that this is this could be a really cute house? Yes. This has a lot of potential. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, just the architectural design of this house. There is a lot going for itself here. So there's a lot that we can do with for this, this little house to, to flip it around, depicting on what's going on on the inside. And um, assuming someone's been living in it and it's a habitable home, there's a lot we can do. All right, Amati, gr group one, anything else group one want to add? All right. This is with the this is with the no budget, right? With, yep. We now have a budget. Now we're going to go to group two. We'll come back to you guys uh, with the with the with the other budget. Let's go through this first. Group two. What did you do on your no budget? For our no budget, we said mow the lawn, clean out the flower beds, uh, clean the front door, clean the windows, remove the screens, sweep the front porch and the walkway. If the home is vacant, make sure that it's cleaned out and clean the air ducts. Okay. Nice. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you, group two. Group three, what did you come up with? Ditto. <laughs> um, no, I'm teasing. Um, on a no budget, we came up with power washing the house, um, trimming the lawn, the, um, the basic cleaning that you can do on a no budget kind of thing. <clears throat> Manual labor. Yep, which is the most expensive part about anything that we do in terms of the make ready in the house. The labor is always the most expensive part. Mm -hmm. So knowing that the labor is the most expensive part on a no budget income, we have to figure out who's going to be doing that labor. Um, <clears throat> so we have to factor that in. Who on your team is going to be able to assist you with us? Okay, we've got group four. Who is my captain for four? What are you doing with the no budget? I'm the captain for four, and we were talking about if uh, our first question could be, hey, do you have any resources or people that could help us clean the house? Um, because, you know, we were talking about we would be doing part of or almost everything that we're talking about. So first asking for help, hey, can we do this? And then having a list, um, like wash the windows, remove the screens, as you had said, new light bulbs, flower pots. Uh, we even said something about asking the neighbor for some flower pots. I mean, if you talk to the neighbors, if they talk to the neighbors. So that was another idea. Paint the trim around the door frame and around the windows, a doormat and mandala. That's yeah, some of the things we talked about. Thank you, Lupe. And group five. Group five is Katie, Elizabeth, Marbeth, Matt. Matt. Do you, you, you're muted, Matt. All right. Yeah, that's me. Okay. Um, let's see. So the um, zero budget. We said um, uh, do some power washing to the siding uh, and the roof with a borrowed washer, maybe from a neighbor or, or if you have one. Um, remove the screens. Uh, yard maintenance that you would be able to do, like <clears throat> mowing, pulling weeds. Um, we said uh, remove curtains and clean the lights. Okay, so lots of cleaning going on. And I also want to add, Jack, that for those people in Round Rock that don't know it, the city of Round Rock has a tool rental center that is free. You just sign up online and you use an app and you can use it 24 seven and go in there and get any piece of equipment you want, a lawnmower, a blower, a weed eater, a power washer. A, you wouldn't believe the equipment that they lend out for free and it doesn't cost you a thing. They will fill it up with gas and you do not have to fill it back up when you bring it back. So use that resource. Yeah, that's super cool. Um, for those of you who live in the city, because that's uh, you got to be in the city for that. Yeah, but lots it, of municipalities that are bending over backwards to try to help keep their curb appeal and keep their values in their neighborhoods up as high yeah. as possible. Thank and you. And when Guadalupe said about plants, I picked up potted plants off of my back porch or front porch, and I've carried it. When people have no money and I want to oh. sell that house by God, I just haul it over there. A million percent. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> lots of things around that we can borrow um, that that uh, is not does not become real property at sale that we can do to help make things just a little bit cuter. And you know, right, just mowing this lawn is going to be a game changer for this house. Just getting the front yard in its place, and believe it or not. Just opening the, the window shades on the inside also is going to do a huge, uh, make a big difference. Just those two things. Just those two things alone will give the light some, give the house some life and make it no longer look like possibly an abandoned house. Because you may have that question. I wonder if this home is habitable. And those op lights on the inside send that message that this is a habitable home. And then mow the lawn. Just those two things alone will be a huge difference. But there's a bunch of other things that we can do on a very, very low budget um, that we as agents can also kick in to, to have a huge impact. All right. So let's talk about the $2,500 budget, because in my opinion, you don't need anything more than that for this particular property. So group one, El Monte, what does your group say for the $2,500 budget? Oh, the gutters at the roof at the top. We'd redo those. Um, we'd redo the, the sidewalk coming up to the house. There's like on the side, the, the concrete looks a little unleveled. We're going to continue to mow the grass and redo the porch, uh, re refurbish the porch basically. And the windows, redo the framing on the windows and pull the, pull the screens through. Well, I think you're going to possibly get one of those quotes and find out that it's exceeded your budget. So that's going to be really tough to squeeze $2,500 to do all that. But I like where you're going with all of those things. Um, we got to be very careful about every dollar spent in a situation like this when you have a finite budget. So you have to figure out, number one, what is the biggest impact item? Start my budget there. And then whatever I have left over, waterfall. Um, and see what you can do to get people to chip in to assist as well. So thank you, Amanti. Thank group uh, one. Joyce, what did your group talk about? A little budget of 2500 to whip it into shape. Uh, we said do matching curtains or blinds, um, paint the front door, add some new hardware, light, uh, put new lights that match above the front door. Also, if that is an extra light on the left-hand side, to maybe take that out. Um, power wash the house in the gutters, add some plants, flowers in the, in the flower beds, add a hose on the hose hanger, um, paint or power wash the, uh, chimney change or paint the lattice underneath the front porch. If money is there, maybe some new stairs or fix them up a little bit. Cause they kind of do look a little unsafe. Add a modern, add modern house numbers, update the mailbox, and maybe add like a little color to the trim and the doormat. Okay. Thank you. All right, group three, Ling, what'd you guys come up with? Lean group three. When you're muted. I'm going to click the, there you go. Thank you, Lane. Sorry. Um, changing the door lock, um, adding address numbers, getting a doormat, doing the washing the house, like the stuff you would do for free, but also adding to it the, the landscaping. We said to add some walkway lights. Um, like the solar ones that they have for like 15 bucks, you just stick them in the ground. Um, some planners, uh, maybe remove the fence because it doesn't look that great, I guess. Um, fix the trim on the windows, repaint that. Paint, we just, we had a long discussion about you You have to, I we wash it, but you can't paint. If you can't paint the whole thing, then try, then don't paint it at all. But paint the trim. We could repaint the trim or something, um, but you can't just do the front of the house. Um, no. um, <laughs> it would be interesting if they paint it sets on a corner lot and you painted two sides of the house. Probably not going to fly, right? <laughs> and basically, it was a lot of just. Um, I think what we were trying to get at is just aesthetically add color just make it pop against a white house and just bring that to life a little bit. 
Well, at least I haven't heard what I heard in Mega 13, which was paint the shingles, which is, by the way, not a thing. Okay, uh, group four, Le Lupe. We pretty much, um, obviously, we would do what we did, for example, number one. And then other than that, power wash, a house number, cute one, uh, landscaping and solar lights on the walkway, like walking towards the house, uh, shrubs, uh, redo the steps in the porch, uh, paint the trim, paint or redo the mailbox, uh, lighting fixtures and underpainting around the porch. Okay, I love it. Thank you. Um, and Matt, last but least. Group five. All right. All right. So we were looking to um, repair the stairs. And uh, with that, maybe elongating that por front porch where the stairs are um, with some decking. Um, let's see. Uh, replace the door fixtures. Uh, we'd also add some plants and shrubs. Um, looking to paint the house, um, obviously that could be pricey. So, um, I agree with not painting, if you can't paint the whole thing, then just paint the trim or something like that. Um, let's see, oh, replace the porch lights and the numbers, uh, do some window washing and adding a nice little wreath to the front door. Yeah, I like that. I love it. So maybe paint the front door, paint the trim, then just spray paint the house, little fascia board on top, light, um, and here you go. Now, um, are you going to do all of this on $2,500? No, but if you look at the transitions between these two properties, it's the same thing. It's just a little bit of life been brought. The shingles haven't been replaced. Um, we just painted and put in some shrubs. Now, what can you re reasonably do to really help this home out as much as possible? We can spray the house with a water hose. Not a, We're not going to power wash the house because it's going to remove the paint. And now you're going to have a bigger problem than you had before. So we're going to basically clean the house. Then we're going to paint the trim. Um, I think that repainting the front door is something I absolutely would recommend here because it's going to make the house pop. Figure out how you can get the house, uh, get the grounds mowed and at least all on the same level and then uh, replace the light fixture outside like I heard you guys um, talking about. Um, and then if you have one handyman, sometimes you can grab one handyman and say, look, I need a transformation for $2,500. What can you do? And if they are a good painter, sometimes, sometimes they're like, look, all right, what I can do here is I can paint the house the same color with a sprayer. Changing a color of a house is very expensive. Painting the same color is not and can brighten it up. You can brighten up one side of the house. You can actually do that. But you try to change the color of the house, you've got a problem on your hands. So here are just some ideas of what you guys can do because you're going to be doing this on every single home. And I'm going to tell you, we talked about value proposition. We talked about the value proposition of the realtor and the value proposition of the real estate agent. This is one of them. This is huge. This is gigantic. Because guess what we do? We evaluate the property for the seller and we give them tips on how they can bring their home up to the best proper, best condition possible with their budget so they can sell their home for the highest amount. Who doesn't do that, by the way? Is that what Open Door does? Is that what the iBuy program does? No. What do they do? Put it on the market like it is. Mm -mm. No, actually quite the opposite. Exactly the opposite. Let me buy this home today from you for as little as I possibly can so I can put a little tiny bit of my money into it and fix it up. And then I can equity skim and I can take as much of that equity as I can. That's a fiduciary failure. That is a fiduciary 101 failure. It's let me sit here, you're listing, you, you brought me out to uh, have a listing presentation on your home and now I'm changing this into wanting to buy your home from you, looking out for my best interest 
and flipping this house and trying to squeeze out as much equity as I can from you. And by the way, it's going to cost me, what, $20,000 to bring this up to market value. And then I'm going to have costs. And you try to get them to sell the home to you as far as little possible, which a lot of people are doing. A lot of companies out there have begun to do this. Now, I'm not going to say that it's unethical because that's their business model. As long as you tell them what your business model is, there's always a need for that. Someone that just wants someone to come write them a check for their home, no hassle, just be done and walk away from it and they get the money today. But that's not what the real estate agent is supposed to do. We're not supposed to be an iBuyer. We're not supposed to be out there as under the guise of an iBuyer and say, yes, I'm a real estate agent. I'm here today to talk with you about listing your home. Oh, well, you know, I can buy it. And then them flip the home for the seller. Instead, the value that we bring to the table as a profession, you know, those people saying that real estate agents make too much money and real estate agents, they just, they don't work up very hard and they, and they just steal people's money, uh, steal people's equity. That's not what the, the average good real estate agent does. We do quite the opposite. We go out there and we help them, A, oftentimes clean up their mess, get their home into a marketable condition, sometimes using our own sweat. Sometimes having the village where our spouse is, I don't know a real estate agent that hasn't enlisted the help of their spouse out there doing stuff for their clients. I'm getting these homes in the best light possible so that we can then sell it and they benefit from that. Do we benefit because the sale happens? Yes. But when we're improving their equity, are we putting that equity in our in our pocket? Well, Maybe you could argue 3% of it because as the increase the property's value, it increases our commission ever so slightly, but not at the rate that we actually would be compensated if we were actually out there being paid as a general contractor. It's not a hundred dollar an hour kind of work. It's more for the benefit of the seller. And that's a huge service that we provide. And it's not supposed to be here, let me get my trades out here and my trades are all going to get rich from, you know, following me around offering services. I have to jump through hoops to get affordable, uh, quality, affordable handymen that appreciate me handing them the business because it's guaranteed business. And they're willing to give me a discount because they're not marketing, they're not advertising, they're not dealing with accounting issues. I make sure they get paid same day as the appointment. And I have very clear instructions of exactly what to do so they don't get out there and realize it was the wrong color or some miscommunication somehow. Show up, do the job, done. A couple extra bucks for you guys and it helps keep their team together and they appreciate that. That is one of the value propositions that we have as a real estate agent and a lot of sellers and a lot of buyers, they know that we do that, but they don't realize to the extent of how much work and time and effort and that that's actually not part of our overall responsibility. That's not part of the ethics. That's not part of NAR's requirements. It's not part of the License Act requirements. And it's certainly not part of your listing agreement. Your listing agreement doesn't say that you're going to put any sweat equity into bringing their property up to value. It's just something that a lot of agents do to help themselves get the property sold. And you know, there's a thing about when I take a listing, it's going to be in my portfolio and people are going to see that. And if I have horrible photos on my listing and that's out there, people look at that as a reflection of my work. So I I want to have a good reputation of listing properties that are that are nice, but I will take whatever listing I get because I'm not going to I'm not going to tell a seller that. I'm too good for you because there's no seller that I'm not willing to help them sell their home and get as much out of it as possible. But I also don't try to put people in a hardship situation and try to sell them on getting their home prepared for market if they don't have the cash and putting them in a bind. So I'm very delicate. I'm very careful with my words, very respectful for my words. And tell them, you know, you're right at the cusp where a lot of investors are going to be looking at this property and they're looking at a spreadsheet. They're not they're not owner occupants that are going to have an emotional attachment to the property, which is what we're looking for. If we can sell this uh, this property to an owner occupant, you're going to make a lot more for it. And I think that there are a few small things that we can do that's going to help improve the emotional attachment that a buyer would have when they walk into the house or when they see the home. And I think that that would equate to probably or two or three times the investment in putting into it. And the kind of investment that I think that we would want to put in a curb appeal here would be somewhere between two and $2,500, somewhere between 2000 and 2500 
Um, is that a budget that you guys can work with? If so, I've got some trades that I think that can do some really great work. Or do you have someone that can do some of this? And here are some of the things that I recommend. Um, if possible, I'd like to see if we can't get the house painted the same color, just one coat, just to freshen it up a little bit, paint the trim. Um, that's probably going to be your biggest expense. Your second biggest expense is going to be landscaping, put in some flowers um, and, and get the get the property mowed and trimmed. Um, and then there's some other things that we can do on a very small budget, like a floor mat and a light fixture, um, freshen up the numbers so they can see it from the street um, and adding to the curb appeal. And if we can do that, this is a really, really cute house. And if we can accentuate this house, I think you'll uh, you'll really see that in the ability to sell it for more. If I was sitting at your kitchen table having a conversation with you exactly like that, using those words, would any one of you be offended by what I just said to you? No. I would say you're hired. <laughs> there is a very easy way that I could have said things differently that could have been offensive. No one's going to want to buy your house. You're going to have to paint this thing because it's just, it's not what people want in this market, right? That is even a light touch that most agents would be on their light touch that would be offensive to the seller and the seller feels immediately defeated. You're not on my side. You're judging my house. We have to be very careful with our words because that's not my intent. My intent's not out there to disparage people or, you know, I mean, this is their home and we have to be very respectful of that. But there are things that we can do that can make a huge impact. We just have to be empathetic, respectful and kind and explain to them what we can do for them. And either they have the ability to do it or they don't. Let's talk about our marketing plan. We're almost a break too. Getting the seller in a multiple offer situation is always my goal. It doesn't matter what market. In fact, you know what? Even in the foreclosure crisis, there were times where I would I would get a multiple offer situation. Unfortunately, back then, there was a saying that I kept hearing over and over again. And I heard this saying so much that it actually elicited an anger response in me that I had to mitigate. I'm not getting in a multiple offer bid and war over a house. I heard that so many times that made me angry. And then all of a sudden... People were throwing money at sellers like they were crazy. So, I mean, the pendulum swings that you have is just unbelievable. But in the foreclosure crisis, there was a lot of people that were angry at the world. And there was not there was not a day that they were going to give a seller 50 cents more than their house was worth. So, but even in that market, I still did attract multiple offers. Because people always want to buy the house that's going to offer them the most um, for the same reasonable price. Now, I'm not talking about discounting homes. I'm not talking about dis discounting the price of the house. I want to be clear with my words. How you bring a home to market really matters in terms of how the, the how the buyers are going to respond to the market. We want to explain the difference between the 30% and the 70%. I'm going to explain that to you and then we're going to go through it because you guys have to understand this so, so well. And we're going to explain the 70% and 30% and I'm going to explain to you exactly who those people are, but we're not going to do that yet. We're going to do that after a break. First, we I like to get a stager involved in my transactions. Lately, I've just been kind of doing that on my own, uh, but I have had a stager in the past that's HDT quality full of energy, exciting to go out there and talk with them. But that's the same thing that you can do as well by going out to the property and having the same kind of words and the same kind of conversation that I had with you just now. Things like depersonalizing the home, refrigerator magnets off the property, the um, all the photos of family all over the place, like they plastered the house with photos. We have to tell them this script. And this script is worth a billion dollars if you can get this right. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, your job is to take a house and turn it into a home. It's our job to take the home and turn it back into a house because we need to be able to get the buyers into the home and imagine themselves living here. And if the home is so personal to you, then they come in and they're endeared by your family. But in time, in, instead of them imagining themselves living in your home, they're endeared by your family. But that's not what we're looking for. We're trying to sell the house. And it's really important that we can get that emotional attachment, which means in their mind, when I'm doing open houses and I see people come in and I start seeing them say, well, our couch would go here. 
and our armoire would go here, it's telling me a story about what they're going through right now, that they like this house so much they're trying to figure out how they can make it work. And that's exactly what we're trying to do when we get people in, is imagining themselves living in the home. So that script, if you can get that right, the light bulb goes on to the seller because if you start telling them you need to take your family members off the wall, they're like, well, what's wrong with our family members? Well, of course, nothing wrong with your family members. There's two issues. One, if you've got kids in the photos and those photos show up on the internet, we don't want that. And number two, um, when a buyer and their agent comes into your house to show it and they see all of that, sometimes they get this weird feeling come over them like they're in somebody else's house and they're not home. And it gives them this really weird feeling. And that feeling has come over to me a few times in real estate. And we walk into a house and they're like, oh, no, no. I Especially if there's like a radio lightly playing in the background and things don't look quite put together perfectly, you might think, oh, someone's home. Is somebody home? And all of a sudden this fear kind of comes over them, like someone's going to come out and of a bedroom or and all of a sudden it's no longer, let's look at this pretty house and imagine myself here. It's, are we going to get shot? So we are going to be careful with our seller. But again, our job here is get the property prepared for market, do everything that we can to get the condition of the home inside and out together. We're going to talk more about inside in a minute. Then your photos, your Matterport virtual photos. You want to get the best video and the best photos that money can buy. My client raved this last week, and they always do, about the photos and the, and the video tour that we put out for them. They were just blown away. How many of you saw the Matterport tour videos for the listing that I had in Salado? How many of you have ever seen Matterport at all? Okay, so we're going to we always do that in this class, and we're going to show you what it looks like right now. We're going to grab my branded, and we're going to share the screen. Unfortunately, that's the wrong house, but it's still good. Actually... I have it at the bottom of this, my other properties. Yeah, okay, fine. We'll just use this one. Let me share my screen. Voila. Okay. So, Matterport. Uh, the invoice that I paid on this is not cheap. This was about $1,400 for the photos and the video. Um, let's look at the video. Here is a reel that they published for me. So the reel that they published was 200 bucks. And then I just downloaded that, threw it on all my socials every which way that I could. Um, super easy. Then they did their 3D walkthrough, which is the computer version of what you saw without the music. And then this is what I want to show you about the dollhouse view. Because what's cool about the dollhouse view is that people can actually see the house in a different way and they can see how all the rooms are connected. And as they are, you're seeing the dimensions of each room. Then you click into the room, it brings you inside the house and you see these donuts on the floor. What's cool about the donuts is that you can take yourself in every single room by clicking on the donut in that room and you can zoom in to see the labels on the couch to see who was the designer <laughs> if you wanted to. Um, and you can walk yourself through the house. 
buyers spend a ton of time using systems like this online, and this comes with their photos. So inside and out, all the way through the house, um, and you have complete control over it unless you use your mouse run like me just then. All right, so I wanna check out the bathroom. All right, so that's the 3D walkthrough portion of it. You also get a floor plan, all of your digital imagery, actually another 3D model of the property, and then all of the photos. And they put it together in this website along with a property flyer and a brochure. And I got all of it delivered to me. All I had to do was tell my sellers when not to be home for the photos to happen. They've got this cool location tab that shows where things are. Um, and they actually have all the major employers on there as well. Um, so details, photos, floor plans, walkthroughs, videos, all of that. So when I say get the right media and collateral, if we properly prepare the home for market, and this was a scenario where Miguel, thank you, actually went out there and power washed this entire driveway because it needed it. Um, there was mud on the street, the home house, there were some things that needed to be moved around in the house that had way too much furniture. And so by the time we had that put together, we had a photo ready house. And it went pending yesterday on market on two days and was in multiple offers. So that's the deal. Properly prepare the home for market. Um, they probably spent $1,400 on that particular property um, to prepare it for market because it was in, it was obviously in pretty good shape before I got there. And then Matterport photos. And then I did my normal thing, which is we're going to do a grand open house on Saturday and Sunday. And thank you for all of you that did the grand open house on Saturday and Sunday. There was a bunch of buyers that come through and I know some of you are still having communication with some of those people that saw it. So that's awesome. It helps you get more leads. And also hopefully you knocked on some of the neighbor's doors and had the conversation with, with a couple of them, because I hear one of the neighbors in that subdivision is very interested in listing their home and is in communication with one of the agents that did an open house. Um, and I have not in any way interfered with that because they did the hard work in getting in touch with them. So that is very, very cool. Attracting multiple offers is the offer is the goal, but it's not the goal really. It is to do everything expertly. And then if you've done it right, then buyers are so attracted to the house that they descend upon that one first. And then it gets you into a multiple offer situation. And again, the buyers are negotiating against each other instead of the seller, putting the seller in a very, very um, good place. The multiple offer situation, also the buyers are bidding against each other and they're bidding up. And at some point it bids up so high that I'm thinking to myself, this isn't going to appraise at this price. It's just not. No matter how nice the house is, there's a point in which it's not going to appraise. The lender is going to look at the house and say, well, it's not sufficient collateral for a loan. So we're not going to appraise it. So you're going to have to bring additional cash to the table or the seller is going to have to reduce the price. So during the multiple offer situation, we talked to all the parties and we say, look, um, our seller really loves this home and they're so happy that you love it too. Um, we understand that we're in a multiple offer situation. We have three offers on the table from these three firms with these three agents. And I disclose who the agents are. Some people are very shocked by that. But I remember every time, every step of my listing, I'm trying to remove objections. And I know that in the back of someone's mind, they're going to say, how do we know we're in multiple offer situations and this agent isn't lying and just trying to trick me into spending more? And maybe there's somebody at the office that submitted an offer. So no, 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 I'm not going to meaningfully bid on this. I'm just going to hold with my actual offer that I have. When I tell them who they're up against, if they want to pick up the phone or call each other, that's fine. They're not going to tell each other what they offered, but at least like, oh, are you up against, uh, are you, are we up against each other on this Parkview property? Yeah, I got an offer in. Got it. Okay. No, at least, and they're not going to do that. But the fact that I disclosed the firms and the names of the different agents, I mean, maybe if they know each other, they'll send each other a text or something, but it removes that block in the agent's mind of whether or not this is a multiple offer situation. And I send that email out to the buyers, to everyone. And I'm, I'm gonna show you what that email looks like here in a second. It's very, very, in fact, uh, our multiple offer and appraisal class, um, we send that, I show you more about that in the next class. I show you the email and exactly how I send the email out. 
I BCC everyone and I send it to myself because I don't want one of those people to reply all and say, oh, if we're in multiple offers, I'm out. And all of a sudden, it's come crashing down on a public conversation that's happening via email. No, 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 that's not what I'm doing. I BCC everyone, send it to myself, and then I send every single person a text message that says, hey, I just sent you an email with the with our multiple offer situation. Please confirm receipt. And in there is a picture of the house, a link to the virtual tour, and I thank them for showing it and all the time and energy that I that they put into getting the offers in, and that the sellers are respectfully asking for final and best by five o'clock today. Um, and please let me know if you're going to hold your offer or if you're going to amend it. And here are the agents that I have offers from currently. And I get calls from agents. Jack, I want to tell you that that was the most professionally done multiple offer situation. And that really helped my client a lot. Thank you. I'm going to do it this way from now on. And so there's a lot of people out there now that are kind of doing this multiple offer situation the same way that I do it. You can feel the difference in the tone if you do it right. And and in that moment, you can talk to them about the multiple offer situation and let them know, okay, my client is leaning towards your offer. Uh, although they're concerned it's not going to appraise, are you guys willing to uh, submit the uh, lender's appraisal addendum and talk to them about that and see if they're willing to bring money? Like my client is 100% um, invested uh, and uh, confident in the fact that it's going to praise at their list price, but you guys have, have gone over and, and we're not sure. So they don't, they don't want to take that risk. Um, are you guys willing to handle that on your side? And they usually will. Then how many of you have ever met an, an appraiser out in the field? So let's talk about this. We met with the seller, we prepared it, we got the right collateral, we did a really good job marketing it, we got into a multiple offer situation, we handled the multiple offer situation perfectly, which we have an entire class about that coming up. And then now we are under contract. And then, um, and by the way, we're gonna go through each 10 of these um, after a break between now and five o'clock. We're gonna meet the appraiser at the property, have a conversation with the appraiser, I want you to be very careful with meeting the appraiser because it's great to meet the appraiser as long as you have permission from your client because you could accidentally be working against your client. As the listing agent, I'm working for my client. I found out I'm going to be the very first one to know that the property is going to be appraised because the appraiser is going to call me and ask for entry of the property. I like to see it on Thursday because an appraiser has to make a site visit to the property. That's part of the rules. So they're going to call me to get in. So then I asked the appraiser, what MLSs do you have access to? Do you mind if I share with you my comps? Do you mind if I share you a list of upgrades so that I can get that to you? And then they say yes. And of course, I talk to my client. The, the appraiser's coming on the property on Thursday. Do you mind if I meet them there and provide them with information to make sure that the property appraises for as much as possible? We would love that. Great. Now I have authorization to do that. You have to have that same conversation with a buyer. Because it's opposite the buyer. If you're a buyer agent and you meet the appraiser, first of all, you don't know when the appraiser is coming. So if you want to meet the appraiser from the buyer agent side, you're going to have to call the listing agent and say, hey, when you hear from the appraiser, would you mind calling me, letting me know? Because I want to meet them there and give them my comps. And then it's going to be on me to make sure that I tell the buyer agent when the appraiser is coming. The appraiser, the buyer agent can call the lender and the lender can call the AMC and see if they can get the date that they're coming but sometimes the AMC never finds out when they're coming, that the only person in the whole transaction that ever finds out when they're coming is the listing agent because they had to get in the house. So if you're gonna meet the appraiser on the buyer side, like I said, call in the listing agent, letting them know that you'd like them to call you when they find out, then they make that call. You would better ask your buyer of whether or not they would allow you or wish for you to do that. Because if you are meeting the appraiser there, trying to get the home to appraise for more, Technically, it's actually working against your buyer. Now, I can argue that your client only has so much cash and they're only going to bring so much cash to the table. And if it doesn't appraise, it means that they're going to have to bring more money to the table. But they have another option. If it doesn't appraise, they can renegotiate the price with the seller. Now, most sellers aren't going to come down. That's the truth, but not always 100%. So we can't just take it on ourselves that we're going to go out there, meet with the appraiser and try to make the home appraise for as much as possible. 
so that our client doesn't have to bring additional money to the table because there is the option of renegotiating the contract in the event that it doesn't appraise. So I'm not saying that meeting the appraiser is bad for buyer agent by all means because I do it. You just have to make sure that you're working at the will of your client, not the will of yourself. And we're not making an assumption that your client would want you to do that, but rather call the buyer, explain the situation, get it in writing from them of what they want you to do. And then once you tell them that you're going to do it, you had better not get busy and then not show up because now you are required to do it because you know I told your clients to do it, but now that would be considered a client instruction. Okay, I saw a bunch of hands go up. So let's answer the questions before I send you on break. Ever, you're the first one up. I was just going to ask, um, with this is the marketing plan, and and I know through the this course you've uh, you've mentioned several times that when you're in a listing presentation, you you mention your marketing plan. Exactly, how much of this do you tell your client that you're going to do? And um, I'm I'm going to share with you guys verbatim the marketing plan verbatim and I even have the slides written down with the actual verbatim things that I share with them uh-huh and the marketing plan some of I think it was you right the the what pictures worth a thousand words scenario that we talked about last Monday in class um the, I'm gonna have my iPad they're gonna be able to see the marketing plan that I have the Matterport that I've done on prior property so they can see that so that when I tell them the level of marketing I'm gonna do they're gonna be able to see that and then I'm gonna to explain to them kind of what I told you guys the most important thing is first we properly prepare the home for the market then we get the absolute best collateral possible and then once we have that we saturate marketing uh saturate the market with advertising about your property and then we bring it on market strong and we give everyone at least five days notice about the open house so that way that people have enough time to be able to come. So those are the four highlights and I tell them those four things. But the details behind those four things are an entirely day separate class for you to actually implement. But to articulate to the client, it's those very simple four things. Properly prepare the home for market, get the absolute best collateral possible, Saturate the market with advertising to, uh, for the property and then come on market strong and give people at least a five day notice before the open house weekend. That's the setting the stage for it in all four of these things. I'm going to be showing them in my listing appointment. My listing appointments don't take more than 45 minutes. In fact, it used to take me longer to get the seller disclosure filled out than it was everything else in my listing because I would sit there with them and walk them through the seller's disclosure but now that i have seller shield and i send them a link for seller shield it's reduced my listing appointments by half i'm in and out in 45 minutes all right so let's talk about and knock i see your hand up um go ahead um go back to the uh buyers agents for meeting with the appraiser we'll get there yep Okay, so uh, do you want me to ask a question now or just sure. right into? No, you can, go ahead. So um, when it, I, I'm, I'm still kind of wrap my head around it. What happened if the buyers, um, why do you want to go? What, what kind of answer are we gonna give it to them? Because I'm still not quite clear the purpose of me going out as a buyer agent. Is that gonna be beneficial to the buyer? Yeah, so what happens if the home doesn't appraise? What does it really mean for the buyer knock? We have to renegotiate for a term. I mean, for either have, either sell have to lower the price uh -huh. or we have, to, yeah, either way we have to renegotiate for the. So it's not a guaranteed renegotiation because or it is a guaranteed renegotiation, but it's not a renegotiated um guarantee that the seller is going to come down because the seller is going to be looking at your buyer and saying you got option money that's not refundable i know you just paid 500 dollars for an inspection so you at least have a thousand dollars here on this transaction um, are you really going to terminate over the whatever the amount is if the amount is significant or not depends on if they're going to even um, have a conversation with you and they may have a backup offer on the property so you as an agent have to understand this is i'm going to go over this later so i'm not going to suck up too much time on this particular topic because it's a big expansive topic but during the dodd frank act in the foreclosure crisis 
appraisal management companies were born and that put distance between the lender and the appraiser. We used to have a $400 appraiser and the appraiser would go out and, and meet at the property. Uh, the Obama administration decided out of the foreclosure crisis that there was too much pressure being put by the loan officer to the appraiser to appraise a home because the buyer didn't have the money to make the work. And if it didn't appraise, they wouldn't use that anymore. And for fear of retribution or loss of income or business uh, impact, the appraisers were increasing the amounts of the appraisers to make to to keep the lenders happy or to keep the loan officer happy to get additional business in the future. So they said, look, let's just separate those two and create an appraisal management company. The lender has to call an appraisal management company and then the appraisal management company calls an appraiser at random. That appraiser goes and does the appraisal, sends it back to the appraisal management company. Appraisal management company sends it to the lender. If the lender has a problem with it, they can't call the appraiser. They have to call the AMC, which is the appraisal management company. And then they have to order um, a second opinion if they're going to even do one. And it's all a matter of uh, uh, the appraiser's opinion of value. And so once it's done, it's a matter of fact. But most of the time, there's no way to fix it unless there's a technical inaccuracy, like their square footage is wrong, number of storage is wrong, and there's a technical inaccuracy. I tell you this because the appraisal management companies ended up taking 75% of the appraiser's money. Where they used to make a full 400, then they they came in and they said, all right, well, we're going to take $300 and you're going to get 100. And we had 800 appraisers at the time, and we had 100 appraisers in Texas after that finished by the time 2010 had rolled around. And no new appraisers would come in because they're not willing to work an eight-hour day and pay for MLS services in all of the different metros. On top of that, drive out to the property and spend time there doing their field study for $100. It wasn't what they got into the business for. So we then saw appraisers go up, appraisals go up to 700, which was a lot of what the fee is today. So now they're making about 250 to $300 for an appraisal, but they have to pay for MLS separately and they don't get that paid for them. So a lot of appraisers are going to show up at your front door and they have the big MLS, but not the small ones. Maybe the you're ordered on a rush and someone from Dallas just came down from Austin and they don't have actress. They only have HAR and they're pulling comps out of HAR and their appraisal systems. So there's an awful lot of situations where they don't have all of the comps and the way that our MLS's work is not very fair for appraisers. The, the realtor associations should be giving the appraisers drastically discounted rates to help us, but they don't. It's actually the same cost that we pay. So I tell you that because if the property doesn't appraise, your buyer is most likely going to have to they're going to be in a, in a, in a crisis because the lender is going to say the home's not sufficient collateral. So you're going to have to bring more money to the table or the seller is going to come down or you're going to have to meet in the, in the middle. And some buyers are like, no, I don't want to bring any more money to the table. So I want, and I believe that this is fairly priced. So I don't want this to be a mistake. I don't want an appraiser to make a mistake on this house. Go meet them and give them the comp so that you appraiser at least has all of the data that they need in order to get the home appraised. Here are all of the comps that I can see in all of the different MLSs. Here's my CMA on top of it. Here's a copy of the contract in case you didn't get a copy of it. I mean, do you have any other questions or is there anything else you need from me? No? Great. All right. If you have any questions, let me know. And out you go. That is the value of a buyer agent meeting the appraiser as long as they have the buyer's permission. And do, do do we meet the same time with the listing agent? Nope. No, I, you know, Lisa and I both meet the appraisers all the time. Um, it's a it. Uh, there are few agents that actually do it. There's just not a lot of agents who give a flying flip. They just don't care enough. They just don't do it. So we have a conversation with our clients. We go out there meet the appraiser, and we make more friends that way. Clients are happy. Appraisers are happy, but just remember, you can't just go out there rogue and do it for your client. You have to get permission. All right, we'll talk more about that later um, in the next segment because we're going to dig even deeper there. So here is my quick little first contact, first greeting. We dug a little bit deep on a couple of other things, but first of all, if you're going to bring your phone into your listing appointment, put, your, put it on silent. Have your digital business card ready for them or a paper one. No gum, no sunglasses. Yes, I actually have to save that. And 
I like to leave my suit jacket on during my listing presentation, not take it off and make myself at home, you know, that kind of thing. And so I always have pins with me. By the way, do you have a pin? Is not what a top salesperson does when they enter the home. I've never walked into a client's house without having two blue V10 pins in my hand uh, in my file going out there. First impression is important. So when you meet them at the front door, there is an agent called Gay, uh, named Gay Puckett. Gay Puckett is someone that uh, Lisa and I very, know very well. She used to teach a listing class uh, and that I took once. And she was very adamant about, I like to stand at the front door, ring the doorbell, take a step backwards and reach out my hand and say, hello, I'm Gay Puckett. <laughs> and she's got a big presentation that she does when she gets them in the front door. She is a fantastic agent. I mean, 10 out of 10, by the way. And her listing presentation and her listing class is really, really good. And so what she says, you're at the door, shake their hand, smile, name them by name, um, and then let them invite you in. And then first question is, um, shoes off or on? Look down to see. There are people that... There are cultures that it's very disrespectful to have shoes on inside their home. So you'll see a pile of shoes either outside the front door, but in Texas, mostly inside the front door. And then people wear socks. Ladies, be cognizant that you might want to have booties in your in your purse because um, being barefoot is probably not the way to go. And um, stockings is also maybe not the way to go either. So if knowing that it's very, very common for people um, to not want you to wear shoes in their home, that you prepare for that. Guys, wear nice socks, not holy socks. Don't get caught in a situation where you had no idea that they were going to ask you to take your shoes off because I'm going to say one out of 10 listing appointments, your shoes are going to be by the front door. So wear new socks and ladies be prepared for that so you're not walking around their house barefooted on the cold or step on a piece of glass or step on a pin or something and cut yourself. So just be cognizant that all of these things can be going on. You've got your bag in your hand. You've probably got your folder and your folder has all your comps. They're, you're, they've just walked in, they've shut the door. And sometimes there's this awkward thing where they don't know what to do. And they're going to say, would you like to come in the living room? So you're going to lead them. You're going to, and I don't mean physically, I mean you're going to lead the meeting as a leader. First thing is, who would like to give me the tour? And I always ask that question. And then one of them gives me the tour of the house, and I see the entire house. I look at the different rooms, and I'm looking at different things and saying, nice. No matter what condition it's in, there's been houses where there has been cat poop in every room. And uh, in fact, I remember that house very well. There, You never know what you're going to come up with. You've got the hoarder houses. You've got the houses that are perfect. You've got the houses that are a nightmare situation, and no matter what it is, you're not looking at any of that. You're trying to figure out in your mind, what do I need to do to get this house sold, and how am I going to sell this house? And I'm all I'm a problem solver. There's not a problem too big that I can't solve. So I'm in problem solving mode as I'm going through it and thinking in my head, and I always point out the positive things in every single room, no matter if I have to stretch to find it. These closets are a really good size. Um, this is a really good floor plan. Uh, I think buyers are gonna really like this floor plan. It's actually a really good floor plan. Even if the carpets are dirty and the walls are dirty and everything's a mess, you look down and there's a flea on your sock, which has happened to me more than one occasion, and you just wanna get out of there as fast as possible, it's, you know, that's not in my brain. My brain is, what do we need to do to get this house whipped into shape? And then of course, there's the pendulum swing on the other side, where everything is perfect and you're just like, wow, this is a gorgeous house. I want to buy it myself, but I can. Uh, it's a $20 million home. Let's, let's, let's get this done. The way you conduct yourself from the time you walk into the door and you let them show your house and the list that is in your head, you've got two lists going. What did I see on the outside? Because we talked about that in depth and now we're talking about the inside. Now I find my way to the kitchen. I'm going to give you this piece of nugget. Do not have a listing presentation from their couch in their living room. That is not where listing, listing uh, consultations should be taken. You need a hard service. You need a kitchen table with chairs. There's been times that I've had people who wanted to list as a vacant house. So we were in the kitchen. We used the countertops and just stood up. That's fine but I'm not going to go into the kitchen and sit on their couch 
whether kids watching cartoons and me have a listing presentation, I am going to try to stop that as all possible. I would say, actually, I've got some stuff here. It would be really helpful if we had a hard surface. I can't tell you how many times I've been in a situation where their kitchen table had so much stuff on it that it wasn't possible to meet there. And so we had no place to actually go over stuff. And so it was awkward in how I had to find room. 85, 95% of the time, there's a kitchen table and a chair, even if they have to move things around. And then I want them either here and here to me, but I don't want them here and here. I don't want them on each end of the table and me sitting in the middle because it's too difficult for me to get the paperwork so I can show them the comps and explain to them at both time. So I would rather be having them on both sides and me sitting on the end or me sitting on one side and one person on the end on the one side and the other side so that when I slide a piece of paper in front of them, they can see it from both directions. When I took mediation training with the National Association of Realtors, we spent two hours on how you place the people on, around a table for a mediation. Um, it, and there's a whole science behind this, but I'm just going to tell you, if you can have both of them sitting in the same kind of direction where they can both read your paper at the same time, and you can set that up at your listing presentation, that is going to help you a lot. I pull out the comps and I have my paper and I always like to have the icebreaker and I always have that sitting there and there's a little bit of conversation going on. And then before I open it, I put my hand on my file and I look at my hand briefly and I'll say, okay, so I have all the comps and I have my recommended range, but I'm curious, what do you think your home is going to sell for in this market? And I smile at them and they almost always tell me. So I leave my packet closed and I let them talk and I hear them. And they usually tell me a number. And then like, I, and I told you that before, it's almost all the time. And I'm, I'm not trying to trick them or manipulate them, but I am trying to know if I am going to have to be more careful in my approach because they're not going to like my number. So I'm going to have to go about it differently. Or, and it's, again, it's not my number, it's the comps. Or if um, I think that they're going to be pleasantly surprised and I can go about the tone a little bit differently. Because I tell them, I think you guys are going to be pleasantly surprised then because I think we can do better than that. And then I go through my comps with them. I always start my conversation with, I have researched. It's the very first thing out of my mouth. I have researched. I've researched the homes that sold in the neighborhood for the last six months. And according to the MLS and the tax records, your home is 2,200 square feet. Is that right? And I, the first document I pull out of my list is their MLS records for all the prior times they purchased the home. And it looks like you purchased your home back on August 1st, 2017. Or if I sold it to them, I will say, and you bought it August 7, August 1st, 2017. And, and, and they remember, oh, I guess he remembers. For 345000 And they'll be like, that sounds about right. Okay. And then I talk to them about their current payoff. And I'll say, it looks like you owe about one forty five. Is that right on your, on your mortgage? Is that about right? And then sometimes they'll, they will tell me, I've already told you guys how I calculated it. I already have it ready. I'm telling them what they purchased it for. Um, I've told them I've done the research and I'm getting facts just because I want to make sure that all of the numbers that I have, that's correct. But I'm also having them say yes to me. I'm asking them yes or no questions and I'm asking them questions that should be yes. And if they say, well, I'm not sure, I'd say, okay, so where I got that is here on this MLS sheet. And I just wanted to make sure it's accurate because no one knows your house better than you. Usually that's, yeah, that sounds right. Yep. Yep. And they're saying yes to me. The very next thing I do is pull out my comps and I put down my grid sheet view. I do my CMAs and I do my listing appointments the same way every single time. So I actually had to close my eyes and I had to walk myself through a listing appointment and put down all my notes to show you guys exactly what I do because I don't teach what I think sounds good. I teach what I actually do and then you guys make it your own. So you're going to hear exactly what it is I do. So you heard my icebreaker. You heard how I, I, I how I get to the front door and how I who's going to show me uh, who'd like to give me the tour. What I say when I'm every in every single room. We get to the living room kitchen and they're pointing in one direction or other. I'm saying it would be really great if we had a hard surface because um, I've got some stuff to go over. 
I try to arrange the seating so they're on the other side of me. I find myself in a seat. I put my hand in the file, and the very first thing I say is, like, "I've got. I've done all the research. I've got everything here." But I'm curious, what do you think your home would sell for in this market? I'm curious what your thoughts are, and then I want to hear it. And they're often, usually, especially how you ask that question, they're they're very forward, much more forward than I think they would have been had I wondered if I asked that question what they would say because they always tell me. And then again, I'd say, okay, well, let's see, let's, let's go through the numbers together. Or I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised. First thing I do, grab the MLS sheets. Again, I've researched the homes that have sold in your neighborhood in the past six months. And according to the MLS and the tax records, your home is 2,210 square feet. Is that right? You purchased on August 1st. Here's the purchase price. And I talked to them about their payoff. And then very next thing I do is I pull out the grid sheet, which is all of the comps. And what I love about the grid sheet view is it has the active, the pending, and the sold. And I flip it upside down and I point it to them and then I explain it to them really quick. The grid sheet view, I'm going to open it up just so th those of you who are a little foggy on what that is, you'll be less foggy when you see this. This is the grid sheet view, okay? When you click and you select all of these and you click print, it says agent single line, hit preview, and this goes to the printer along with the criteria. So this piece of paper is turned upside down facing them and I take my pen and I, and I there are no, there are no um, painting comps in this particular example, but I will draw a line around these and say, these are your active competition. These are the homes that have not yet sold in your market. And then these are the, and these are the sold comps. And I'm very careful to make sure that I explain to them the difference, because just like I'm careful to explain the difference to you guys in this class, I know that they're not going to understand. So the first thing I say is, these are comps that are most relevant to your property. And I tell them what criteria that I used. Homes that are single story in Round Rock Ranch that are between 1,900 and 2,550 square feet that have sold in the past six months. And where do I get that information? I show them at the bottom of this. And I show them what the criteria was that derived this so that there's no confusion on how I got these. These were not cherry picked by me, but here's the criteria. And I started with the square footage because that's the most important. And then I referenced their subdivision. So in my notes here, it's... These are the homes that are most relevant to your property. I tell them what right criteria I used. Again, homes that are single story in Round Rock Ranch that are between this amount of square footage and this amount of square foot that have sold in the past six months. And then I tell them how many there are. There are six comps that I have found that are most relevant, uh, which is what I believe an appraiser would use. And these are what we're trying to accomplish is to figure out what an appraiser is gonna do. Then I grab the MLS packet, because again, I'm showing them my grid sheet view and I'm explaining to the, the active, the pending, and the sold, and how many are each packet, and which that these are the most relevant comps and the ones that the appraisers are going to use. And then I grab my MLS sheets for each one, and they're in order of it is on my grid sheet view. And I grab the first one, and on each one, I probably spend about 10 minutes in the office taking a highlighter, and I highlight on the one page. And for those of you, when I'm talking about the one page, I'm talking about this, which is the uh, MLS one page view. And I will have printed this out and I highlight the address. I highlight their square footage. I highlight their active price. And then I go to the bottom and is this one sold? I want to show you a sold one because that's more important Two right here. I get to the bottom and I highlight the close price, the close date, the closed price per square foot and the active days on market. And then I will, there's a buyer's closing cost field that I also highlight. Those are the five things I'm gonna take them through and tell them the story. So on every single one of my MLS packets, which is the MLS sheet on top, and then all of the photos behind it, I'm taking them through each one that's on the grid sheet view. So I will point to the grid sheet view and I will pull out the MLS sheet. I'll put it in front of them and they know now we're talking about this one. You turn the page and there are the photos and I've highlighted all of the things that I want them to specifically be able to quickly find so that it's not confusing because you're going to have to agree with me that there is a lot of data on the MLS sheet. 
and that they're going to have a really hard time finding anything because most agents have a hard time finding something if you're not really familiar with those reports. So I've highlighted the things that I'm going to pop out to them. Then I go over the comp and I say, the first one was listed for $399,750 and I point to the list price, which is highlighted. And then I uh, turn the page and I show them where it was listed, the list date, listed on August 1st and was on the market for eight days. And I point to the on market date and closed on 9-1 and I point to the close date for their asking price. And that property was 1,950 square foot. So it was a bit smaller than yours. So I explain the differences and the positive and so that they can see it. And then I show them the photos and then we talk about the differences in the photos. And after I've gone through all the comps like that, they will put one, and I will sometimes say, and this is the one that I think is the most relevant, the closest comp to your property, and I will put that one aside for a moment. Once I've gone through all the comps like this, and I've looked through all of the photos and pointed out all the differences in the flooring, the appliances, the large ticket items that I know is going to impact either a buyer's interest in a property, um, things that it's going to create a larger buyer emotional connection, like outdoor kitchens, those types of things. Then I go back to my quick CMA and I go over it again. I do that same thing with the pending comps. I go over them with the same data points, address, list price, sold price, sold date, square footage. But then I let them know that I spoke to each listing agent. So I spoke to this agent and here are the notes and I, and I go over the notes that I've learned and I go through each one. And then I let them know because I will ask the, the, the listing agent also, when are you going to be into the closing table, do you think? And then they'll tell me what their ish closing date is. And then I will be letting them know if I think that's going to be their best comp. If they sold for more, if they sold for less, what information they shared with me. And then more importantly, I have a conversation with them about that being their best comp and how that the active is their competition. The pending is not quite competition. It's trending with the market is right now. And that's going to be very valuable information for us because it most likely will sell before we get an appraisal done, which means this number is going to become the most important number that we have. And we don't even know what it is yet. The highest comps, and I, then once we're done, we have the quick CMA. Everybody remember what the quick CMA looks like? Okay, so we select all of the comps that we, I'm going to unselect these. I'm going to grab my actual sold comps. We're only seeing your slide. Okay, I've been trying to, uh, thank you for letting me know. I thought I'd change my screen, but I didn't. All right, so then I'm going to have my grid sheet view here and select the sold comps. And then we have the quick CMA button, this button here. Again, this is not a CMA by any means, but that's what they've called it. But it is certainly helpful in deriving some really important information. So whatever comps I have in my grid sheet view, I will have this for my sold comps already here. And then I looking at this and I will say, we have an average between 188 and 210. Really in the median and average is a difference between 188 and 190. And so that's the, the actual difference in, in terms of the value. And so after looking at the comps and looking at the photos, I will tell them, I think you're somewhere closer to the max. So your value is gonna be somewhere between the median and the max. And then I give them that range. And then we discuss that after, then we take a look at what the active is and try to figure out how we can uh, take that price and market it on market against what's currently being active and how long those actives have been on the market and how they're going to influence, influence us. So there maybe there was one that had upgraded hardwood flooring, and I'll print to that uh, MLS sheet. The lowest comp sold for 189 per square foot, and then I point to it, and the, av uh, and the average is 195. Your max is 205. At the lowest is 189 and the average is 195. So I'm telling them a story of kind of where the price per square footage is. Now, the value of your property based on all the comps is not quite as high as 205 because of the one that had hardwood floors because yours doesn't. So they have improvements that you don't, but certainly not as low as the low. So you're somewhere between this median price. So my recommendation, based on all that I can see, somewhere between 195 and 205 a square foot, that works out somewhere in the 430 to 450 range. Now let's go and look to see what our active competition is. And then I grab the active. So I circle that and I say, I think that's what's, what's going to show up in an appraisal. However, we have to look to see what our active competition is. 
because the competition in the neighborhood, we've got nine homes on the market. So we have to look at that to see what's going on there. Then I pull out the active comps. I go over it with them the same data points that I just did, except obviously there's no sold information here. So it's address, list price, the square footage price, and the price per square foot, um, and I take them through those actives. And then I tell them, based on the sold comps and taking into consideration now the active competition, my recommended list price would be for $35,990, and I'll explain to my rationale. And then I, if I can get you into multiple offers, that puts you in a very powerful position because you're no longer negotiating with the buyers. You're negotiating against the buyers, against negotiating against each other, and that puts you in a very powerful position. And in that scenario, whoever is actually bidding over asking price, we can ask them to waive their appraisal contingency. Well, do you think that multiple offers is likely in this marketplace? Well, let's discuss that because that's a good question. Let's talk about the likelihood about me getting you in a multiple offer situation because we have a very specific listing plan that's all dedicated around that very thing, selling your home for as much as possible. My job is to help you with all kinds of tips and tricks to get your home prepared for market so it's show ready. Then me get the absolute best collateral, best money you can buy, the photos and videos in the property, and then saturate market with advertising with that listing so that everyone sees it. Once we have the marketing saturated, then we're, that whole marketing plan is all designed to attract uh, and invite people to come to an open house, grand open house weekend. And then I start talking to my marketing plan. So let's talk about my marketing plan. The marketing plan, by the way, is the most important thing that you're going to be able to share with them. And this is what um, you guys had asked me about, especially ever. Now, I owe you a break. This marketing plan is going to be what I want you guys to be paying very close attention to. So when we get back from break, I want you guys to have some coffee and some energy because I really want you guys to hear this. This marketing plan will change your listing strategy forever. It will help you make sure that you annihilate your competition and that you get every single listing. So if you get this right, it will change your career 100%. It will turn you into a listing agent. Not knowing what to say and knowing what not to say at a listing appointment is just both as important. It's 345. Let's come back at 355 after 10 minutes. And I'm going to stick around and ask a couple of questions on break. Hey, Jack. Hey, Sean. These, the slides uh, were emailed to us, right? They're, they, I know before they were over the, uh, in the mega, right before, over the mega link, but they were emailed to us, right? Yes. Okay, I'll find them. Thank you so much. Welcome back. Welcome back, everyone. No, there's a few of you who are still making your way back to your computer. How are we doing so far? Is everyone able to follow me so far? Or is there anybody lost? Anybody want to comment on what you've heard so far today? This is Michelle. Uh, I definitely have refresher. There's no question about it. And one of my favorite thing is, obviously, it's not because English is my second language, but I just love, love, love the verbiage you use. And I always take notes and, you know, and include it in my vocabulary. Thank you, Michelle. Because you make it simple. You know what I'm saying? Straight to the point, simple. And for a yellow personality like me, who would go in a tangent, not as much because now I got older, smarter, wiser, but it allowed me to go straight to the point and allow me to ask questions versus telling. And that's what you need, the verbiage you bring to the conversation. It really isn't complicated. 
It really is simple. But what I've always learned is the more you understand something, the better you understand something, the simpler you can make it. So the more we absorb this, the more we understand what our job is, what our role is, what the seller is looking for, how you market a home, how you bring a property to market, the, the better you understand the process, the easier you can break it down, the simpler you can make it, the more confident that you'll be, the more that you can focus on trying to figure out how you can use inclusive language, powerful language, language that that is clear and concise, but also elevates your professionalism to the client. Because to be professional, you have to look like professional, act like a professional, and sound like a professional. And you do all that, you're going to be known for being a professional. Jamara. Sorry. So, Jack, what's the typical time between the, um, I forget the first appointment, not the listing appointment, but the first appointment when they just want to meet you and then they decide they want to list with you? How, how typically how long is the time frame between the two meetings? Well, so if someone calls me out of the blue and says, I want to, I want to list with you, or I would like to have an interview with you and talk about listing my home. I want to get over there within three days of getting that call. And then in that call, I'm trying to figure out what their timeline is. And I want to get my listing agreement signed immediately while I'm out there. All right. So we're going to come on market next month. No problem. Let's get the paperwork out of the way and let me start getting my team engaged. So my team can be pre prepared and already be doing, doing pre-marketing to make sure we build up as much hype and momentum as we can to bring the market, bring the property to market when we go live. So my listing agreement is going, I'm not walking out there without a sign. And then if they have a question, I will tiptoe around why aren't you signing my agreement? I don't understand. And using inclusive language um, and talk with them and say, um, well, this allows me to start doing research and start building my marketing plan. And so by pushing this out and not signing this, all we're doing is limiting the amount of time that I can work on it. And this preparation time between now and when we go live the more time I have, the better. I've got one shot to bring your property to market and advertise and expose it to the market in its best light. So the more time I have to do that, the better. I don't want to shorten that time. And they're like, ah, I get it. All right. How long a listing agreement do you try to get? You know, I always fill it out. I've never had anybody call me on my listing agreement dates and I'm not consistent about it. Sometimes I put a year, sometimes I put six months. Um, but I really don't ever need more than three months. I mean, by God, three months. Now I'm gonna tell you a story about a situation I had where my client, um, we came on market, came off market, went on market, went off market. It was a property on Desux in Georgetown. And we had an issue uh, with a assumable loan that the lender sent us in writing that they would allow to be assumed we brought in a buyer to assume the loan. The buyer was qualified. They sent the buyer all the way through underwriting. We're 10 days away from closing. And the lender came back to us and said, we've decided we're not going to allow this loan to be assumed. So I had to extend the listing point, listing agreement because my, in that case, my it was on the market for six months. But um, yeah, I would say absolutely no shorter than six months. There is no reason for you to take a listing for six months. And if you're having a conversation about that being a problem, there's a bigger question going on than the, the time period. There's something else going on. You need to find out what the real objection is. Um, could be something that you don't even realize, like, well, we're going to be long foreclosed by then. And they haven't told you that yet. So, I mean, we have to figure out what really is the, what, what their issue is, but six months. I saw a couple of hands go up. I think Sean, maybe was hands was up, maybe stuff then. Stephen's hand. Yeah, my hand was up. <clears throat> Quick question, Jack. If there was ever a time in your career that you may have done this, and I wouldn't put it past you, have you ever called, I guess cold called, I'm sure you, I know you've door knocked, but cold called uh, people to see if they have a need to, I guess, list their house for sale? And if so, no. You didn't. Never. I will never call cold call people 
that's just not what we do. I mean, I've never had to cold call people. I've always had my pipelines filled calling the people I already know and getting the referrals that they have. If I've got two hours to spend, it's going to be calling the people I already know from a long time ago and figuring out well, who else do you know that might be the benefits might for services. And if I run out of those people, I'm going to start calling attorneys around town, the divorce attorneys and finding out who's your preferred agent. And when I run out of divorce attorneys to call, I'm going to start calling other professionals on my painters and I'll call, go through the phone book and find every phone book. There's not a, such a thing. And go through um, um, Yelp and find every power washer in town and say, hey, every time you go out and do a power washing, um, talk to the seller. And uh, if they agree to meet with me, I will give you a, I, I will pay for half of the, uh, half of the power wash, which means you're just going to you're you're gonna uh, get an extra two hundred dollars, and talk to the seller about that because a lot of them are gonna be having out trying to get their home ready for market and haven't met anyone yet. Then a lot of times power washers know about this stuff. So I'm not gonna just call people out of the blue. I'm gonna really spend my time strategizing about how I can get my name and my presence in front of actual people who I think you could benefit. That makes sense. Thank you, Jack. Yeah. Who else got their hand up? Okay. This is an important, we've got an hour to get through this, 50 minutes actually. So we're going to power through this because I need every bit of time for this. First of all, a lot of study went into this because we've got some consumer studies information and we're going to be talking with you about some of the consumer reports. Um, if you go to the National Association of Realtors page right now, and they are home buyer and seller report. I'm going to share my screen. I'd like all of your eyes on this. Where is it? Bye. There it is. Okay. If I wanted to buy this report and I quickly added it to my... I've already logged in there, you know who I am, so this isn't going to be fair. Um, it's $250 for the buyer and seller report from the National Association of Realtors. Um, the total price, $369. However, you can get it for $199. And because I'm an instructor, I can get it for $19.15. But it's not possible to buy this report for less than $149. Now, I have gone through this report inside up one side down the other, and it says nothing about not being able to reproduce it. And in fact, I've even spoken to our state association as well. So guess what I did? I reproduced it. I didn't reproduce it. I shared it. If you go to the bottom of our website and you click on annual reports and guides under our consumer report section, every single report that NAR has ever published is on our website. I think we're probably the only person to actually do this because this goes back to when they started. I have the Code of Ethics, the NAR in International Trends, the Home Staging Trends, the ANSI Trends, the Landlord and Tenant Guide Trends is how it's changed, as well as the National Home Buyer and Seller Report for Texas and NAR, as well as the Luxury Report. And so we have them all. All of the reports are here. And I read them and I study them. And I study them because, I don't know, if the report can tell me what buyers are looking for right now and what marketing is working, do you think that we'd want to know that? Uh, whether I'm a brokerage owner or an agent, I've been re reading these as an agent and I would tailor my marketing about what the market shift said that the buyer demands are and what they're looking for in an agent. And I would make sure that I included that language in my marketing to make sure that I'm talking the consumer's language. So one of the things that I learned in two of the reports that I read was that the Report that comes from Realtor.com shows that the majority of their traffic is happening between 11 p.m. and 2 a.m. in the morning on Monday and Tuesday. And that blew my mind because that's not what I would think. I would think Saturday. I would think Friday. I would think days that are, you know, different. So when I reached out to um, Lisa Jackson at NAR and asked her the question, why, where is this report coming from? She sent me a phone number 
to realtor.com. I had a long conversation with realtor.com. And then within three days of that conversation, I am now one of realtor.com's four ambassadors in the United States. And now I'm in their ambassador program and they're inviting us to California to learn more about where this report is because no one's ever asked them where they got their data before. And so I actually got to learn where they got their data and this whole journey that I went on about their traffic patterns and why and the analytics behind it and in their research, this is what they found. And it's gonna blow your mind. Most of the buyers, more than 60% have kids. In those 60%, weekends, they're busy. They've got kids, they're going crazy. They're dealing with family stuff, grocery shopping, having dinner, families, dinner, more family dinners are happening on the weekends, taking them to sports stuff, taking them out for family outings. And mom and dad are exhausted, right? Weekends are supposed to be resting, but they're not. They're going out with the kids and doing all this stuff. And then their rest time is Monday, they go to work, they come back from after work, have dinner, kids go to bed, and they're not preparing for a crazy weekend ahead. It's the first day after the weekend or the very first time they literally collapse on the couch. They've got nothing going on tomorrow, so they've just got to go, go to work tomorrow morning. It's not like a hectic weekend that they have planned, which you would think would be exactly the opposite. And they grab the iPad and they spend time searching the web. Monday night and Tuesday night. They played all day, Saturday and Sunday-ish, dreaming about different things. And now they're back into life and they're dreaming about what just happened. And they're talking about quality of life and things that they like and family and swimming pools and all of these things. And next thing you know, from midnight until four in the morning on Monday and Tuesday is when they're looking online. And they're picking more open houses on Monday and Tuesday night than in any other time of the week. And so... There's confusion by the consumers because what do you think the consumer is seeing when they're looking at open houses on Monday and Tuesday? What do you think they actually see? And I want you guys hearing this because this is important because if you understand this, then it's going to be better for you to explain it. The home are already under contract. The home, they look at it. Are the open houses that they're seeing from, are, are they next weekend or last weekend? Last, last weekend. weekend. <laughs> That's right. And they're confused about that because they don't understand on any why, how come there's no open houses this coming weekend? I guess there isn't any. Yeah. And then they look and all the open houses that are offered are still there from the night before Sunday. And they see the open houses and now they're reaching out to people, but they don't want to click a button to talk with a real estate agent. They're not ready yet but they would go see a property and there are some properties they want to see, but they don't want to push that button because they don't want to feel like they owe a real estate agent or indebted to them or feel pressure or they don't want services for free. They don't want someone coming after them. Like they just stepped foot on a car dealership and people are chasing them around saying, you know, here, want to go take a test drive. want to see this house and call them for the rest of their lives. They don't want that. And they know what happens when they click the I'm interested button on realtor.com. So they're just not ready to do that. But they are, they are buyers. These are people that are thinking about buying a home and they have a home and they're looking around their home thinking, good God, we have to sell this house and move. That's not fun. I don't want to think about that right now. But they're still dreaming and they're seeing homes they like and they want to move, but they don't want to put themselves through that. Let's just look at that model for a moment. How many, what percentage of people is that? 70. 70. Mm -hmm. almost, th almost three quarters of your buyers, three quarters are wanting to move, but they don't want to talk to you. And more importantly, they want to go see a home in person. They want to go see a home. They're ready to do that. They're not ready to get married, but they want to go on a date. And they know when they push that button, someone's going to ask them to marry them until they don't, now they don't want to go on a date. So how can we facilitate that for them? How can we help them have less apprehension and give them exactly what they're looking for? Well, the answer would be to have our open house live Monday morning that has language all over it, grand open house Saturday and Sunday, all you have to do is come. Mm -hmm. So Monday night and Tuesday night, the highest traffic times, we need to have our listing live on the market so that they can see it so that they can come to the open house. 
But two problems happen. One is clear, cooper clear cooperation policy statement 8.0, which is an MLS rule that says if you're going to do outward marketing to the public, you have to have it in the MLS one business day. And we can't get it on Realtor.com and Zillow and all the websites without it being in the MLS at all. And if you put it in the MLS, you're going to start getting calls from buyer agents begging you and yelling at you, telling you that the, the only buyer for this house that will ever buy it is theirs, and they're only in town today. And if they don't see it today, your house is never going to sell, and that you're being stupid by not letting them see it, and that they're going to call your seller and get go around you if you don't let them see it. Those types of conversations actually occur. So how do we handle all of this and navigate all of these landmines and all of the pressure that you're going to get from the agents and facilitate the requirements under the MLS rules and be able to get your listing on the websites at a time that's going to be best for your seller. Well, that's the plan that I put together. And it's funny that my plan has, no matter what change in MLS rule, it has um, stayed the test of time. First, we put it in an MLS that's not our market MLS. So for HAR, I don't put it in HAR. If my property is in Austin, I don't put it in Austin. If I'm in San Antonio, I don't put it in San Antonio first. I will put it in those websites. In fact, in my local MLS, I will always put it in the MLS at the exact right time, which is at 2 o'clock on Friday. And I'll explain why I put it at 2 o'clock on Friday. But I put it in another MLS first. Because it says you have to have it in a MLS, an a MLS and I don't want it in my local MLS because I know that there's a lot of buyer agents who have clients in a buyer portal. And it's exactly those people who I don't want to know about it yet because I know that they're going to come out really fast and come out swinging. Who I'm trying to, who I'm marketing to first is the 70%. I want to market to the 70% first. It's not that I don't want to market to the 30%. I am going to market to the 30% because as soon as I put it into the MLS, it panders and it caters to the 30%. It is dedicated to them. And it almost, the MLS rules and the entire platform, if there was a conspiracy going on out there, it would be to hide the listing from the public and give it to the real estate, real estate realtors, yeah, that's correct, realtors before the public sees it so that they can sell it cooperatively uh, and that's how the MLS has always worked. We know that the people on 70% of buyers who are on Zillow and Realtor.com, Homes.com, House.com, all those websites, even Redfin, all of them, they're slower to respond and there's no portal. So when you put something there, they may not see it. So they're going to just come across it when they're ready or they do have a portal, but we have to get it to them first. So Monday morning, when I'm on my listing agreement with my seller and I'm talking about my photos, I'm trying to figure out, okay, when is the first Sunday that I can reasonably get it in live in the MLS and I'm reversing it from there? Because Monday morning, I'm going to put it in the MLS. What is the first Monday I can go live? Because I need to properly prepare. I need to get my listings back and I need to get my photos back and have all my videos back. So when can I get all that back based on what I'm recommending they do? Because I have a map with me, a calendar of the month. And I'm trying to fact, here's today's date. And I'm trying to figure out when is the next Monday I can go live because I'm going to go live and I've picked and built CTX MLS for this purpose. I was the chairman for CTX MLS for a really long time. And now I'm still a board of governors. And we made sure that when we created this MLS that we designed it for one purpose to be the strongest listing syndication engine MLS in the country. And it is. It's a powerful listing syndication engine. It doesn't have a lot of buyer agents in there. That's not what we use it for. We built it for the strength of marketing your listing everywhere. And I don't want a lot of buyer agents in there because I don't want a bunch of buyer agents calling me demanding that they get in because that's not what I'm doing right now. If I'm going to try to throw a party, an open house, and I want the largest audience possible to show up, I can't advertise it one day ahead. That's not enough time for a, a reasonable amount of people to show up. Now, if I do that, I know the 30% will show up and they do show up. Agents come showing with their clients. People who are very interested in the throes of their purchase process will come see it, probably throw in an offer. If you've properly prepared it, properly priced it, got good photos, people will show up. You'll get three, five showings over the weekend, and one of them will submit an offer. Maybe you'll get asking price, but that's not what I'm looking for. I'm, I'm not going to just 
market it to 30% of the market. I'm going to market it to the 70%. They're slower to respond. I'm going to give it to them five days ahead. So I'm going to put it in CTX MLS on Monday. And I put in showing time, no showings until Friday, because we're still doing our make ready. And that's perfectly okay with the rules. So in showing time, I put it live active. Monday before noon. I connect it to showing time and I literally block out the showing days so they can't schedule an appointment. And I block it out to 145 is the last appointment that I block out is 145 on Friday, meaning that the very first appointment available to schedule is two o'clock on Friday. And in the MLS agent notes, I put um, showings begin on Friday. We're doing a grand open house on Saturday and Sunday. And that's it. Now it's syndicating out to all the engines, all of the consumers Monday night and on Tuesday night, they see the listing there and they're propagating Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I've been able to get them to see it. We're running Facebook ads. When you guys go to virtual, when you go to twist tours, um, which is statewide now, and you use them and they build and they give and you spend a little bit extra, the $200 for the real and you give us that reel, we will run that reel for you. We will spend company dollars on our Facebook account and our ads because we've become an ad expert at running Facebook ads, and we will run your reel, and we will pay for it. And that will generate even more traffic to your open house on that Saturday and Sunday because we're, we're experts at exposing it to the 70% because we understand what it is that we're trying to accomplish with that. And all of our marketing is wrapped around getting everyone to come Saturday and Sunday from two to four. Now that benefits the seller because if everyone's coming to the open house on Saturday and Sunday, that means they're not doing a bunch of separate appointments all throughout the week. And they have to get the home ready and leave and get the home ready and leave and get the home ready and leave. None of that. In fact, all the way to the open house on Saturday, they haven't had a showing yet. But they can see it on Friday too. So I tell them, look, there's a very good chance on Friday afternoon, you're going to get some agents that are going to want private showings. And so after two, I can't tell you how many, but I'm guessing between two and five o'clock on Friday, actually it's two and 7.30 on Friday, you're going to have some showings, I would bet. At two o'clock on Friday, I then put it live in Actress or your local MLS. If you're in Houston, you go live in Houston. If you're in San Antonio, you go live in San Antonio. If you're in Austin, you go live in Austin. If you're in Dallas, you go live in Dallas. But all of you have access to CTX MLS, which is the most powerful syndication engine website in the United States today. Hands down, period. We built it for that one purpose. So now you've given it to the 70% a week ahead of time, almost. At the peak times for them to come and see it, inviting them to the common house. Then you've given it to the 30% on Friday, like you always do at two o'clock. And those people show up over the weekend. And so now you have sped up the online consumers by giving it to them a week ahead and really um, allowing you to um, come on market strong by pushing that information out there and hitting the market strong and letting that propagate and build and then the 30% show up so that the 70% and the 30% both descend upon the property at the same time, both Saturday and Sunday from two to four. If you can get the 70% and the 30% to descend upon the property at the same time, it gives you the highest propensity that the property is going to sell in a multiple offer situation. This is partly why my, my whole process came together. In about 2013, 2012, I was listing properties and I was using social media and there was this delayed reaction. I was putting it in the MLS on a Thursday or a Friday. I was coming through my open house weekend. On Monday or Tuesday, I would be under contract. And on Wednesday and Thursday, I was getting calls from people. I'd like to come and see it. I'm like, but we had an open house last weekend. How come you didn't see it? I don't understand. How come I keep getting these people calling me after I go pending? Where were you a week ago? I would really love to have you a week ago. Where were you? And that kept happening over and over and over again. And I read the report from NAR. I read the report or spoke directly to um, Realtor.com and understood their, their data. And I was seeing it firsthand. And I put it all together. And I realized I need to give it to the online people a week ahead of time and give it to the agents. If I do it this way, just specifically, put it in an obscure MLS to get it on Realtor.com and Zillow, no showings till Friday, 
point everything to the open house and then put it in the put it in the MLS on Friday in my local MLS for showings, then I will have given it to the online people who are sitting at home on the on the couch that don't want to talk to a real estate agent yet. I gave it to them five days ahead, effectively. And it's going to allow me to get them to the property sooner because if I give it to them sooner, that delayed reaction gets pushed back and then they land at the open house weekend that I need them to. Because if 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 Friday is pushing them to Wednesday of next week, if I can push them back to Monday, it's going to push them on the weekend and it worked. And so far, I've never had a situation now of people calling me after the multiple offer situation saying, we didn't know about it. Everybody knows about it. So that's the nuts and bolts of it. That's how it works. It's very effective. But now we have to communicate it to the seller so that the seller can understand it. So according to the National Association of Realtors, 30% of buyers in your marketplace have hired an agent. While 70% of the buyers, they want to buy. They kind of think they're ready or they don't think they're ready, but they want to buy. And they're the largest percentage of home buyers. And then when we put something in the MLS, it's being syndicated out to the agents and their clients but the people on Realtor.com and Zillow, they're only looking a couple times a week, if not one. And in fact, the numbers are Monday night, Tuesday night. We have to give the property information to them first. We have to figure out how. So this script is the script that I recommend that you memorize and internalize because it's a verbatim script that you're going to use at your listing agreement. And it's perfectly worded. For them to get it and to get their lights to turn on. These are your Monday night. These are your ideal buyers. These are the ones that get you ending up in a multiple offer situation. If 70% of the buyers in the marketplace don't have an agent yet, then two questions come to mind. One, how do you engage them as a buyer agent? Um, and how do I market to them as a listing agent? You asking yourself that. How does the buyer agents market to them? You should be asking yourself, wait, if there's 70% of buyers out there, how can I market to them? Not just through listings, but guess what? When you get a listing, you're actually doing both. You're marketing to them as a buyer and you're marketing to them as a listing agent. The 70% will buy right now. They're going to be slower in the process and then probably six weeks out. But if they find something they like, they'll pull the trigger, which is how, you know, maybe 20 of them show up. Three of them fall in love with the house and now they're figuring it out. And now you're in a multiple offer situation with one of them and the rest of them you're still talking with because they didn't want to reach out to an agent, but you had a meaningful dialogue with them at your open house. And now all of a sudden, not only are you getting your property sold to multiple offers, but you're having more and more meaningful conversations with buyers. And what do I do as a broker? I never do my grand open houses. I give those to you guys. It's golden. And I spent my personal dollars in advertising and marketing for you guys to show up. And when I find out that no one has signed up for my grand open house, it's like, what are you guys doing? I paid for the photos. I paid for the marketing. Everything is ready for you to just show up. And all you have to do is show up and it's all been paved for you. And every single time there's success stories that come from those. 75% of buyers interviewed only one real estate agent during their home search. Repeat that. 75% of buyers interviewed at least one agent during their home. That's not what it says. I thought you said repeat what you said. Only one. <laughs> only one. I, I, only one. one. But that, that's not what it was said. It didn't say at least one. 75% of buyers interviewed only one real estate agent during their home search, which means they just, this, this idea that I keep telling you guys that buyers are not in the market to, to they haven't, they haven't spent a lifetime dreaming about hiring a realtor. They have spent a lifetime dreaming about buying a home and finding the agent along the way. In a strong seller's market, a lot of real estate agents don't see the value or even the importance of holding listings open, especially in the last 2021 debacle, whatever that was. They didn't think that it was important. And during the pandemic, they didn't want to do it. And we were doing open houses. We just had people standing outside and bringing them in one at a time. And that was even better for us. 
because we had one-on-one -on -one with every single person who came into the house instead of a flood of people coming in and not having an opportunity to talk to all of them. So we had a lender at the front door. The lender acted as gateway. Lender talked to them at the front door as the people came in and then cycled out. That's a practice you can still do. Oh, there's a there's a couple already in the house. They'll be they'll be done in a couple of minutes. How are you? Have you got in? Let your lender talk to people at the front door instead of having multiple sets of people coming into your open house. And people kind of get it. They're like, okay, I understand. And then they'll wait. Just make sure it's not like a 40 minute wait. And if it's where they're waiting too long, okay, you can go ahead, go in. Most listing agents and most listings that come on market come on market Thursday and Friday of each week. Now, the, remember what we said about the clear cooperation rules. It's not permitted to advertise a listing more than one business day ahead of any type of public marketing. It has to go in the MLS within 24 hours. So if most agents are submitting on Friday and by the time it's in the MLS and start syndicating to the third parties, Realtor.com, Zillow, and all the portals, it means the open house is only advertised for one day. If you're going to throw a party, how many days ahead are you going to advertise it for it to be effective? And you want this to be effective. By God, you're selling a house that's half a million or a million dollars, and you want to invite people to come and see it. I mean, estate sales give you more than one day, and you're just selling furniture inside a house. The house itself, you're going to give them one day notice, but in the estate sale, you're going to give them 10 days notice? It makes no sense. I lost my mind when NAR created that rule. I grabbed the mic in Chicago at NAR and said... This is not good for us. It is not good for the seller, and it's not good for our profession. And I told him a story about uh, uh, when's the last time you, when your kids are getting married, did you send out the invitations the day before the wedding? We're selling the largest, uh, we're selling the biggest investment these people have ever made in their lifetime, and we're we're giving them one day to 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 get it on to get it on market and invite people to come see it. This is crazy talk. They did it anyway because they don't listen to me. That's okay. We just find a way around the rules and make it work for our sellers. So all of this means that in, the, in whatever market that we're in, if agents submit a property to MLS for cooperation on a Friday and adds the open house dates on Saturday and Sunday and then track multiple offers and goes on under contract by Monday, the property really never was exposed to the market. And there's a thing about Fannie Mae and Freddie, Mark, Freddie uh, saying that the property has to be fully exposed to the market before it was actually sold for market value. And that takes more than one day. So as the 70% of people are looking online late in the evenings on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, after the homes have already gone pending from the week before, then everyone's missing each other. The, the our entire profession is working opposite the buyer continually over and over again. And it's just through a lack of training. It's a lack of agents kind of taking a look of what's really going on, looking at the buyer trends, reading the reports and putting it together, a marketing plan that actually works. And so if you articulate this correctly and I've got my scripts coming up, then you guys will now be geared with a listing presentation that's going to resonate with your seller because they themselves are probably looking at Realtor.com late at night during the week doing the same thing. Ironically, our entire Realtor engine is designed to cater to the 30% and completely alienate, if not outright ignore the 70% of real estate agents and buyers. Realtors hire a buyer, put them uh, in the client gateway for an MLS search. The Realtor tells their client there's no better place to search than the MLS portal. The agent sets up their client on a safe search, and the moment a new property is listed in, in the MLS, they get a listing alert. So it's almost like we're hiding it from them. There's no better place to search, Mr. Buyer, than the MLS. I'm going to put a portal search in here, and then we have to have it in the MLS within one day of marketing, and we're going to list them most on Friday. So then you're going to get ping. You're come out the next day, you buy the house, and great. We're really catering to cooperated cooperation between brokers. So not only are the 70% not getting listing alerts that, uh, during the heaviest search times for the with our group, which is Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday from 1145 to 245 in the morning, they were listed two to three days after this group was online last time even looking. If they're looking Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and we put it on the market Friday, they never saw it because you listed it after they were looking. And then if you did get it sold over the weekend on Monday, 
by the time they saw it Monday, it was already sold. So you, if you could try to hide it from them, there would not be any better way to hide it from 70% of the market than to list your properties that way. And it's most how real estate agents list their properties. And if it's how you've been listing properties, put in the MLS on Friday or Thursday, do an open house on Saturday and Sunday and have it sold by Monday or Tuesday. You could not have done a better job hiding it from the 70% of the market. Laura. Okay, maybe I'm ignorant about the uh, the MLS that's in dot me, but you're saying since I'm in Houston, I can basically put put it in the MLS. Can I can I can I enter in a property in the MLS that you created, like no. in Austin? So um, when you were onboarded with Realty Texas. Uh, my staff had a conversation with you about Central Texas Regional MLS, which is a cooperation MLS with seven boards in Texas. Our MLS Plus is not a part of this conversation at all. The MLS that I'm talking about is Central Texas Regional MLS, which is Victoria down by you. It's their MLS. It's Corpus Christi to your west, which is this MLS. It's Four Rivers to your north. It's Williamson County, Fort Hood, Temple Belton, Highland Lakes, and Waco. Highland Lakes is kind of coming in and so is Waco to Central Texas MLS. So we are talking about a matrix product, Central Texas MLS, which you can join through Corpus Christi or Victoria. Okay, so because I'm just so basically you so we join another MLS and to advertise to the 70% in addition to the Houston Association uh to HAR. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Okay. You put it in the Central Texas MLS on a Monday and you let that sit there and uh, it propagates to all of the online portals on a Monday night and it's sitting there Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Then you put it in HAR on Friday at two and do your grand open house Saturday and Sunday. It's just like you normally would. That is the process that we're teaching you. It's part of our seller guide and you've absolutely 100% got it. That's what I'm teaching you right now. Is everybody else kind of on 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 board with this? Understanding what Central Texas MLS is and where you find it, and your local realtor organization's MLS, which could be who knows what it is, Houston. Well, what is the fees to join that thing? We can get you in touch with one of my staff people who can help you with that. It's not very much. I don't know off the top of my head. $40 I've been a month, actually. It's only $40 a month. And you don't join it. You subscribe. It's an MLS. So just get your version. Because I don't want you to call one of those boards and say, I want to join, because they're going to think you want to join the board. So you need to only subscribe to that MLS. Okay, so we have to subscribe to the MLS. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's not part of your membership. It's just once you once you join a board and you have to join a board as a primary, once you join a board, then you can go to any MLS in the country and drive, join as a subscriber without joining the board. That's important because if you call them and you say join, they're going to they're going to send you a membership application to join their board as a secondary member. And that's not what you want to do. You want to subscribe to their MLS and you can subscribe to an, M an MLS as an MLS only without being a member of their board because you already have a primary membership with another board. Okay, and I can enter in Houston, Houston properties in, the, in those MLSs. Absolutely. Just like we enter Houston properties in Central Texas MLS, it's statewide. It has every county, all 254 counties um, in it, 100%. And in fact, um, William Diaz has been doing it for all of his listings since he did Mega back in Mega 9. Okay. Okay, Ever and Jamara. And just FYI, we are now not going to finish on time. And that's okay, but just know we are not going to finish on time today. Jamara. So just so that I'm I'm making sure that I understand this correctly. So if I join the Houston board, not join, excuse me, subscribe to the Houston board, that's going to be no. the... No, no, no. Okay. Jamar, you're up here, right? Yes. This has nothing to do with Houston. So just know Laura's, Laura is in Houston. That So she, her primary is Houston. So everyone should join Central Texas MLS as your secondary MLS and join 
I mean, subscribe to Central Texas MLS as your secondary MLS and join your primary wherever that is, whether it's Dallas, Austin, Houston, San Antonio, Waco, maybe even Fort Hood. Make sense? So we should all have two. The first one being the one that's in your marketplace. The second one being Central Texas MLS. 100%. Okay. Uh, Stephen, did you have your hand up? No. I never had his hand up. And yeah, then, I, was, I was just sneaking when you were explaining that. So maybe you, you, you answered it. But so the people from Central Texas, you, you're telling us that we don't have to subscribe to the, to the Houston MLS? Are you in Houston? I'm not in Houston. What? No, I'm not in Houston. I'm in Austin. Okay. So let me explain it this way. Whatever your local MLS is, is your primary MLS. My recommendation is the secondary MLS be Central Texas MLS. The only MLS I want to talk about is Central Texas MLS, because if I talk about all of your local MLSs, you're all going to get confused and thinking that I'm asking you to join some other agents MLS in their market. So Central Texas MLS, I would like all of you to be a subscriber to that if you're going to use this because it's going to be very powerful. Remember when I said that when I was president of the Williamson County Board, we had nine boards around us that all had their very own MLSs, and I was able to get them all come together and create the Central Texas MLS, and all of those boards became a shareholder for it. We also got Victoria and some other boards to also become shareholders from around the state. And we're adding more shareholders all the time because it is the most recent version of Matrix. And they're very um, cutting edge in terms of how they've built the MLS. It's a very powerful listing syndication MLS. It's really designed to syndicate listings. So for listing marketing, we want to give it to the 70% by putting it in Central Texas MLS, and you are not trying to give it to the buyer agents by putting it in Central Texas MLS. It has nothing to do with real estate agents at all. You're putting it in Central Texas MLS for the sole purpose to syndicate that listing to Realtor.com and Zillow and Homes.com because you can't put a listing on Realtor.com, Zillow, and Homes.com unless you put it in an MLS. And if you put it in your local MLS on a Monday, you're going to have agents calling you, asking you to show it all week long, and it's going to cause you all kinds of grief. But more than that, there's not another MLS in the state of Texas or the country that does a better job syndicating a listing. We go to 800 different websites. So on Monday, you put it in Central Texas MLS. It syndicates to all those websites, and you let it do its magic. And now it's on all kinds of websites all over the place. And buyers who are using whatever that website is, is their preferred website, is going to see it. They're going to see your open house and you'll have given it to them five days ahead. So they got plenty of time to plan. Then now we do want to give it to the agents so agents can see it. And whatever agents are going to see it are going to probably have membership to your local MLS, whatever that local MLS is. And then you put it in your local MLS. You click the save button and it's going to shoot out to all the portals that the other agents have saved for their clients and agents and their clients all over the state, all, all over your market are going to go ding, new listing alert, ding, new listing alert. And all those buyers who are represented by those agents are getting the listing alerts and they're going to come to your open house. So we gave it to the people who are going to take the longest to respond to people who don't have an agent an agent yet because they're on homes.com, realtor.com, Zillow, and all of the other portals. So we gave it to them a week ahead of time. And then we gave it to your local market exactly on time. And both groups to send upon the property at the same time, having the highest propensity to get everyone interested in your property to get you into multiple offers. Knock. Is there anybody that's not... 100% clear, I still have questions about that because it's clear. Okay, good. Thank you for, thank you everyone who asked questions because if there was confusion about this, then this entire day was wasted. Stephen. Okay, I, I just want to confirm what you're saying. All right, no. Um, on Monday, if, if we do the grand opening uh, for the grand week, then we need to post on Central Texas MLS on Monday, correct? Yes. And then by Friday, you want us to 
um, poses on any logo board that we join. Is that correct? Yes, your local MLS. Okay, I, I, I was confused a while ago, so I, I just want to confirm <laughs> what, what, what you're saying. Okay, good. Well, I'm glad that I saw lots of people shaking their head in affirmative that they're that, that they're getting it and the light bulb has come on. So that's good. Yeah. So so Monday, we put it in Central Texas MLS. We click the save button and we immediately put the grand open house date Saturday and Sunday in the MLS. So on every single one of those online portals, it's saying this is just a new listing and there's an open house on Saturday and Sunday. So people then just see it and then they come to the open house because the whole purpose is to, to get it out there and tell the world. You're really giving it to the consumers. How can I tell the consumers out there, the world, that my listing is coming? How can I saturate? How can I put it on billboards and get a plane and do skywriting? How can I get the world to know? We know that the world is now on ZillowRealTalkAHomes.com and all those other websites, but those websites don't take an individual listing unless you're a home seller and you're doing a for sale by owner. Only way you can get them there is by putting in an MLS. And we have an MLS that's designed specifically for getting your listing out there. This isn't about real estate agents with buyers right now. This is about buyers themselves on third-party websites doing their own home search. We're trying to attach to them and get them noticed. Not that they're going to be unrepresented buyers. Again, the 70% will eventually turn into the 30%, meaning that they will eventually find a property they like, and they will meet an agent as a, along the road of their home ownership. 75, what was that statistic? Because that was directly out of a book. 75% of buyers interviewed only one real estate agent during their home search. And still, there's an over 85%, I think it was 91% that it's sitting at right now, according to our ABR class that I teach, that people are choosing to have a real estate agent represent them. So it's not that the 70% will never have a real estate agent. It's that they don't have one yet, but they're viable buyers that are looking. They're just a little bit quicker. They just haven't met that real estate agent yet. And I want them to know this property is coming on market because it's 70% of the marketplace buyers. Okay, um, Jamara. So now knowing this, I'm questioning the whole 10, the first 10 days is the most important. If I don't put it on into ABOR until, until that Friday or sat, that Friday before open house, when does my 10 day start? When I put it in Central Texas or when yes, I put it in? Central Texas was your day one. Yep. And so those first, you were gaining momentum and saturating the market on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then you put it in the second MLS and that's your five days. And then five days after that is when you're doing your open houses and negotiating offers. Because there's there's a good chance that the 30% also, a lot of them are going to come across it on Zillow. And then they're going to call their agent and say, I see a property that I haven't seen in the MLS and I really like it. You will get calls from agents on time to time. They will call you and say, hey, my client called me about a property at 123 Main Street and I'm not finding it. Can you, are you, are you the listing agent for this property? Yes, I am. We'll be putting it in the MLS on uh, Friday at two and we'll be doing a grand open house on Saturday and Sunday, but we need to say it today. I, I understand. Don't worry. There's no concern about it selling uh, before the open house. We're not going to have any showings before the open house on Saturday and Sunday. So there will be an open house on Sunday from two, uh, Saturday and Sunday from two to four. Go ahead and send your people. If you want to show them uh, during the showing, we'll, we'll facilitate that during the open house. But you can actually make an appointment when we put it in the MLS on Friday as well, because showings begin Friday at two. That's it. And have that conversation over and over again. Lisa does it this way. Cindy Bell does it this way. And Cindy, did you, or Lisa, did you always do it this way? No. No, I didn't have a clue because I'm not a tech person and I had no idea how everything worked together out there in the cyber world. And when you explained it, my mind was blown away. And then when I applied it, I saw an immediate difference. And I just want you guys to know I've tracked it. So in my own neighborhood, I got to do listings for a builder in my neighborhood and I tracked every single one of the homes that they allowed some other agent to sell and are sold 65% faster and for more money because of the way that we market. And that's how I got the listings from the builder, by the way. So the question is, is how can you package this into a nice little package to get your seller ex 
explain because your minds are being blown. And so now once you have this really wrapped and packaged properly and you're able to explain it to them without sounding and making the situation sound a lot more confusing than it is, then you're going to hit a home run because all of a sudden you have a plan. You have a marketing plan and a very well concise, put together marketing plan. And no one has a marketing plan. But not only does this marketing plan work really, really well, but it's easy to articulate. And it's easy to actually continue doing over and over and over again. It's not magic. It's just you have to do everything in the right order, leverage multiple MLSs, understand the buying behavior of the buyers, where the buyers are looking and when they're looking, and make sure that you use all that data and all that analytics. And that's it. And we explain it to your clients. In a strong seller's market, many agents don't see... Oh, we already passed that one. Sorry. Okay. We are here. All right, so here's the plan. Typical realtor, Friday at two o'clock, they list in the MLS. Saturday, Sunday, a 12 to two or two to four. Monday, probably in a multiple offer situation or coming out the other side, determining whether or not they're gonna get it sold based on what their pricing is and how they prepared it for offer, prepared it for market. And if they did a good job and they did properly price it and they did properly advertise it, um, at least with the photos and the marketing, it's not, you know, iPhone photos taken a little bit crooked and the rooms are dark and um, no open house and expect the home to sell itself, then it's probably going to sell. We do have a lot of buyers in this market. It's not that there's none. If the if the market is, pro if the property is properly priced, it's going to sell. So the problem with this process, like I said, Friday listed in the MLS, Saturday and Sunday open house, Monday and Tuesday trying to figure out if it's going to be sold or not, then Monday rolls around. If they did get it sold successfully because they did all of the stuff in the right order, the 70% start seeing it about 11 o'clock after the whole thing happened. So all we do is move things around a little bit. Monday at 2 o'clock, the property goes active in CTX MLS. Monday from 11 p.m. to 2.45, the 70% saw it that night, immediately the next morning, you already have inquiries, you have buyers asking you about it because some of the 70% will reach out to you, but a lot of them won't. And then Tuesday rolls around, the listing is getting more exposure. Wednesday, the listing is getting more exposure. Thursday, the listing is getting more exposure. Friday at two o'clock, the property goes active in your primary MLS. Then Saturday, Sunday open house, Monday rolls that drown, and you have a much better likelihood of going into multiple offers because of all of this happened. A whole lot momentum, a whole lot more eyeballs on it versus just this, which is 90% of what's happening now. Here's how the Realty Texas Grand Open House Listing Program is so well thought out. So incredibly effective and the best unique value proposition in the marketplace in terms of a listing. If every one of you took the time to understand the Grand Open House Program, how it works, and why it's effective, you'd be able to articulate your value proposition and win every single one of your listing appointments. You're going to obliterate it, even when the wife says, no, I just, you know, they, they seem really good and I want to hire them. And the husband's like, nope, we already know who our real estate is. So I'm just going to placate and I'm let this person come in and talk to us, but we're not hiring them. By the time you're done, they're like, okay, we actually had decided to hire someone else, but we're going to hire you. I have had that conversation happen before, and you will too, because they're going to realize no one's going to list this house but you. No one is going to list my house but you, because I don't want anyone putting this thing on the MLS on Friday and having a one day, because they're going to ask the question, so are you going to do an open house? Yes. What day are you going to put it in the MLS? Well, we're going to put on the on the last Thursday. So I'm curious, what are you going to do to market to the public? I'm going to put it in the MLS. Yeah, I understand. What are you going to do to market to the public? Well, the MLS is marketing to the public. All right, so you're going to put an MLS Thursday and Friday and have an open house on Saturday. Is that enough time to talk to the people and, and get people to know to show up? Oh, I think so. This is the conversation the listing agent is now have, or the owner is having with another agent now at the listing appointment, and the agent's confused. Where's all this coming from? I don't understand. And they have no way or any any inkling of a clue of why they're asking all these questions because you just obliterated your competition, and that person just unhired themselves the more they talk. Thanks, Jack. I got to go back and mod and modify my UVP. 
appreciate it. <laughs> this is genius. Thank you, Laura. <sighs> Realty Texas understands to get 100% of the marketplace buyer's attention, the 70% and the 30%. For your listing, it requires that the online consumers have an opportunity to see the listing at a time when the vast majority of them are searching and with enough advance notice to react to it. But if the listing agent just follows the typical listing method, it is exposed to only the 30% and goes pending almost immediately. How can you get your listing in front of the 70% with enough time for them to see it online? The 30% gets a trigger from the portals and react quickly, the 70% casually looking at their own time. Your marketing should be targeted to the 70%, which is two times larger than the 30%. The listing needs to be visible at least five days before most agents go live on Friday. It should be put live on Monday, not Friday, so that when the 70% are searching Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night, the listing is available. But the clear cooperation policy statement says you can't advertise it until it's put in the MLS. So then that's why we put it in Central Texas MLS on Monday, because then it facilitates the rules. So then the next slides, we actually walk you through it again. And I even have this little quote that you can drop on the seller. Look, if I were to reach my hand in a jar and pull out 70% of the keys and throw it on the table, where is likely the key that's gonna fit the door? And that's the same thing with the buyers. If I reached into your multiple offer situation and randomly pulled out 70% of the offers, is it likely that your highest offer would be pulled out too? And, and they don't like thinking about that because they realize it is more likely, two times likely that they're not going to get the highest net for their house. This is where I usually put you guys in a breakout session and let you guys walk it through. We obviously don't have time for that now. We're gonna, I'm gonna do um, a video and I'm gonna send it out to you guys. On my, in my listing presentation, I have a blank calendar that I write on. And this is an example for you guys because you have to understand at what point you're gonna to need to get your photos taken so that you can figure out where you're gonna go live in CTX MLS. So let's say you had your listing agreement and it was signed on Sunday the 1st. Then you're gonna come out, you're gonna give them their stager recommendations, and then they're doing make ready maybe on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Let's just say they needed four full days of make ready because you had them declutter some stuff. Maybe they're gonna paint a room. Maybe they had the landscaper there for three days. You needed four full days of that. Then you pay the extra $40 to have the Matterport come out on Sunday because they will do that. And then you get your photos back by the end of the day and you go live on Monday. Then you're, you're propagating and you're building momentum Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You go live in your primary MLS to your grand open house on Saturday and Sunday. Offers, multiple offers pending. So this map makes it very clear for you to understand, but I draw this map out for my clients so that my clients can very clearly see what this is and we will write down the days that the photos are going to happen so that they can understand what's going on and they get it here is the listing appointment dialogue your homework assignment is going to read these three slides because this is your explanation to your client you're going to read this until you understand it and then i would like very much for you to video record yourself explaining this to either your kids or your spouse and post it into Teams. I want you to explain it in the bomb bomb so well that when I listen to it, it's a mic drop. So I know that you've got this well enough that when you sit down with your seller that you've got this so well that you can mic drop at your listing appointment when you explain your marketing plan to them. I've already explained earlier today how to properly prepare the home for market, some tips and tricks on the outside and the inside, and also how to position yourself at the kitchen table, what dialogue to have, how to go through the comps. On Monday's class, we talked about what you need and how to pull the comps, but today's class was how to present those comps and what dialogue, and I put those slides in there, so hopefully you're studying those slides and reading them very carefully and picturing yourself at the kitchen table and picturing yourself um, explaining this, how many of you ever played a board game? 
Okay, however you may have opened a board game and you have absolutely no idea how to play it. And then you have to grab the instructions and you read it and it makes no sense. And you keep reading it and you start playing the game and all of a sudden the little light bulb starts coming on and all of a sudden you totally get it. Well, this is your board game. I want you guys to picture yourself at the kitchen table, read my slides until you get it and that light bulb comes on until it's not confusing anymore and you get it because this is your business we're talking about. This is your business, how you're going to make money, how you're going to make a million dollars a year. And so this is worth the board game time of learning this and getting it wrapped up in your mind so that you understand it, so you can articulate it, so that you can explain it to somebody else. First, on how to explain and extrapolate the comps, which is in slides earlier today. And then these slides right here, these three slides, uh, learning these words so well that you can explain it to your kid or your husband or your neighbor and throw that in teams so that you've got it. If the light bulb is bright, you'll never forget it. You can understand it conceptually and you can also explain it. So when they ask you questions, you're not, well, I learned the words, but I don't understand the process that you can explain the why of exactly why you're doing what you're doing. And all of it is in the slides. I took an enormous amount of time to make sure that every single thing I taught today is in these slides. It's a book. It is a playbook for you to nail your listing presentation, but you have to read it and internalize it so that you can deliver it so that they can understand it. And then don't forget, we have our home buyer map and our home seller map. And I always like to leave the home seller map for the kids. So that is it for our day today. You guys got some homework. You guys got some self-study ahead of you. And then you're going to get me so excited about using you that you're going to list my house. That's the goal. And when I say you're hired on Facebook, I mean on Teams, it means you did a really good job. All right, I'm going to open up the questions. Uh, class is officially dismissed. I know you guys got tomorrow. It's a big day, mega mini, but you guys certainly got some homework ahead of you. All right, who wants to ask me questions before I break out? I have a question. So people ask me all the time when I'm on the MLS, like what homes have open house today? Is there a way I'm I'm almost starting at the function that I can look and see which how which homes on the MLS are up for open house? Are you in front of your computer? We literally have it on our website. You have it on your website. We literally made this happen. First of all, it's openhouse.vip. Uh you can, we, you, some of the agents have actually put that on. We own openhouse.vip, that domain, which will take you to the more and then open houses. And this is a page on our website that has every single open house in the state of Texas. And I was just talking to our team about this. But as you can see, there's over 6,000 open houses in the state of Texas. You look on this little dot on the left hand side and you will see the map as it's going out and out of all the dots we have every open house it's taking a second because i'm on teams but all of them are there so yes this is not all of the open houses for our company this is all of the open houses in the entire mls in the entire marketplace so send them to your website your website has the open houses thank you yep michelle uh, my question is about like Supra Box as well. Okay, my local primary is uh, Williamson, and I'm subscribed to CTX. And by the way, you know I'm a huge fan of the Grand Open. <laughs> I've done several, and they were always successful. And I also have a subscription. I'm gonna I'm gonna double check if I just have a subscription. Not that you mentioned it. I have a subscription with Abor, but I also have a. Uh, I'm sorry, a, a, a um, actress. Uh, but I also have Dallas, uh, Netress Dallas. Now my question to you is, if I only have a subscription with uh, uh, um, Dallas, obviously I have two different Supra box 
because one does not work with the other one. My question to you, like, and I, I will have to double check. My question to you is if I only have a subscription uh, with Dallas, does the Supra box gonna still working? Uh, so the MLS has nothing to do with the functionality of your key. And it's your oh. key that actually gets you in your lock boxes. So every different MLS has their own lock boxes. Yeah. And then different keys will allow you access to different boxes. I explained it to an agent the other day this way, because it's really confusing. Imagine mm -hmm. if you worked for a condo complex and you had a master key for every door. Okay. And then you took that master key to the complex next door. It doesn't work anymore. And so I want you to think about that in terms of the keys for MLS. One apartment building is CTX MLS and the other apartment building is Actress. It has nothing to do with the lock boxes. It has all to do with your key. And so your, your electronic key can have multiple keys in it. So you can have a key downloaded into your phone Supra box for yeah. CTX MLS and for Actress and for Natrix, they will allow you to have up to 999. I know I'm a nerd and I know this. You can have up to 999 co-op keys on one key box. There's only about 12 fully, fully, there's only 12 MLSs in Texas that use super lock boxes in the first place. So if you want to have access to CTX MLS, you have to subscribe to the MLS. And then buy their and, and co-op their key. You only have to buy the super key box from the, you only have to buy the key from one person. But once you subscribe to the key box, they can take the key that you've subscribed somewhere else and put your key, their key on your Supra so that your one key can open up their lock boxes as well. Okay. I have some I got it. Uh thank you. I also have somebody who were explaining something to me about uh the uh, syndicated engine. The what? The syndicated oh, engine. Uh -huh. yep. Okay. Syndication. Yeah, I know it's a fancy word for me. <laughs> it's like okay. The guy was telling me CTX has over 67 and Actress has only six. What did he mean by that? What did was he his mean? name was his name Joseph? <laughs> I don't know. It was somebody from real realtor.com. Okay. Well, so I can show you. It's easier for me to show you. Okay. Than to tell you. Okay, ABOR, Bryan College Station, CTX MLS, Netris, and um, Waco. Let's go to ABOR first, and then we're gonna CTX MLS. So I'm going to set this as my active company. Okay. And I'm gonna see that they have four in their publishing network. Century 21, Remax, Realty Executives, and International Property Network. Go ABOR, you're really outdoing yourselves. Now I'm going to change this and I'm going to pick Central Texas MLS, click set, set active company source. And now I see 75, but not only do they have 75, you start seeing that they have plus networks, which means homes and land has plus. You click the homes and land link, and then it will give you a link of all the extended networks that they have. And you extrapolate that out, and there are hundreds of websites that that this thing publishes to. So for there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's nine more websites that are part of that in, the, in, in what it's called its extended network. So what they're trying to tell you is that if you put your listing in Central Texas Regional MLS, it's going to have more exposure because it's going to go to more places. And by the way, List Hub is opt in, which means it's turned off by default. And 85% of brokers don't know that, and they never turned it on in the first place, and their listings don't go anywhere. Jeez. You got to be a super nerd to be a broker these days. Thank God we have one. <laughs> okay. Thank you. No problem, Michelle. Thank you. Does anybody else have any other questions before I film your exam and get that out to you?
Is there a way that we can go directly to uh, the RT uh, website from the .me? Yeah, at the bottom. I couldn't find it. Um, yeah, it, it, I, I'm pretty sure we put a link to it at the bottom in your footer. Um, oh, yes, I see it. I see it. Visit, okay, thank you. Visit my website. Yeah, it is. Uh, visit my website. Yep. All right, guys. Um, thank you for all the questions. Thank you for a really good day in class. I'm sure that you're all probably excited, confused, but I know you got some reading ahead to put this all together. I can't wait to hear more about it in your mega minis, and I will see you all on Friday. Thank you so much. All right. Good night. See you all tomorrow.